Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Honourable members, I respectfully acknowledge that we are sitting today on the land of Aboriginal people and pay my respects to Elders past and present. I thank them as First Australians for their careful custodianship of the land over countless generations. We are very fortunate in this country to have two of the world's oldest continuing living cultures in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples whose lands, winds and waters we all now share. Yeah. Are there any matters of privilege? Honourable Members, I wish to advise that we will be visited in the gallery this morning by students and teachers from St Anthony's School, Toowoomba, in the lecture of Toowoomba South. Yes. I call the Honourable the Premier. Uh, Mr Speaker, I move that this House desires to place on record its appreciation of the services rendered to this state by the late Hon. Sir Llewellyn Roy Edwards AC, a former Member of the Parliament of Queensland, Deputy Premier and Minister of the State. And two, that Mr Speaker be requested to convey to the family of the deceased gentleman the above resolution together with an expression of the sympathy and sorrow of the members of the Parliament of Queensland in the loss that they have sustained. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the Hon. Sir Lou Roy Edwards AC was born in Ipswich on the 2nd of August 1935 and was educated at Raceview and Silkstone State Schools and Ipswich Grammar School. After secondary school, Sir Lou followed in the family business and qualified as an electrical mechanic and fitter. In 1958, a work accident led to an extended stay in hospital, which then inspired Sir Lou to study med medicine. At Sir Lou's state funeral, we heard that it was also led to his first marriage to Leone, who was a nurse during his recovery one of the many lovely stories of that moving event. In 1965, he graduated from the University of Queensland with a Bachelor of Medicine and a Bachelor of Surgery. He began medical duties at, Gen at Ipswich General Hospital and from 1969, he took up general practice in the Ipswich suburb of Raceview. In 1972, Sir Lou was pre-selected by the Liberal Party to contest the seat of Ipswich, which he won and held for 11 and a half years. Mr Speaker, during his time in this place, Sir Lou served in numerous parliamentary, political party and executive government roles. In December 1974, he was appointed as Minister for Health. In October 1978, Sir Lou became leader of the Liberal Party and Deputy Premier. A few months later, he moved from Health to become Treasurer. Sir Lou delivered four state budgets and he was at the forefront of government until he decided not to contest the 1983 election. Mr Speaker, I had the great honour and privilege of speaking at Sir Lou's state funeral. I take this opportunity to reiterate he was a calm and reasonable figure in a tumultuous period in Queensland politics. He was firm but placid amid the noise and haste. Sir Lou was a dedicated member and leader of the Liberal Party, but his party loyalty was balanced with conscience and a genuine willingness to reach across the aisle when appropriate. Mr Speaker, although Sir Lou retired from Parliament in October 1983, his service to the people of Queensland and Australia continued for many, many years. In fact, in the minds of many hundreds of thousands of Queenslanders, the role he then took on as Chairman of Expo 88 was the most important of his many acts of service. And Mr Speaker, I know that both myself, the Treasurer and the Minister for Health also worked, I think, back then as um, <laughs> students at Expo, yeah. and we fondly remember seeing him walking around the grounds. Yeah. He was a dedicated medical practitioner and a hard-working local MP. Yes, he led our health system as minister and had the crucial responsibility for the state's budget as treasurer. But since Sir Lou's passing, when his extraordinary public service is discussed, it's the memory of Expo that light up people's faces and prompts those great <laughs> stories and memories. Stories about everything that Expo meant to us, from, from the fun of a great day out to the enduring economic and social legacy. From Expo passes and pavilion queues to the transformation of South Bank into an outstanding, beautiful and vibrant public space. 
Queensland will forever have Sulu to thank for that. Yeah. Mr yeah. Speaker, Sulu also served as chair or as a member of many company boards and government organisations. And I know he was especially proud of being Chancellor of the University of Queensland from 1993 to 2009. We heard how, he deep, how deeply he respected the personal aspects of that role, shaking hands with thousands and thousands of graduates over those years. No social distancing back then. In 1984, Sulu was awarded a Knight Bachelor. In 1988, he was named Queenslander of the Year. In 1989, he was awarded a Companion of the Order of Australia. In 2010, he was named a Queensland Great. He led a remarkable life. He was a person of great dignity who left a distinguished mark on Queensland and Australia. On a personal note, I will always appreciate the way Sir Lou took time to say hello and ask after my family when I happened to see him and Lady Jane having breakfast at Harvey's in New Farm. Sir Lou and Lady Jane's love and devotion for each other was the foundation of a wonderful marriage and a dynamic partnership. Their respective abilities, their outstanding personal attributes and their shared commitment to service came together in a relationship that was a blessing to their friends and their community, indeed to the whole state. They were, they were a welcome and familiar presence at so many events. Mr Speaker, the Honourable Sir Llewellyn Roy Edwards AC passed away on the 25th of May, aged 85, and a state funeral was held on the 3rd of June at St John's Cathedral in Brisbane. It was indeed a wonderful service. There was as much joy in the memory of his family and public life as there was sadness at his passing. The attendance of so many current and former political, academic, corporate and cultural leaders of this city and our state was a testament to our esteem for Sir Lou. I place on record the government's thanks for the years of service that Sir Lou gave to the institutions of our democracy and, of course, to the greater Queensland community. On behalf of the government, I extend my sympathy and that of this House to Lady Jane, his sons David and Mark and all of Sir Lou's family and friends and I warmly acknowledge their presence with us today. Yeah. I close by restating, even those who could claim to have matched the extent of Sir Lou's community service could rarely match the grace of it. A true servant of Queensland. Yeah. I call the Leader of the Opposition. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I join all members and the Premier today in acknowledging the contribution of Sir Lou Edwards to his community, the people of Queensland and this parliament. For over 11 years, Sir Lou served as member for Ipswich and he served as Minister for Health, as the Treasurer, the Deputy Premier and leader of the Liberal Party for nearly nine of those years. In 1972, he was elected as member for the newly created seat of Ipswich. He joined a class of Liberals who, in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, overcame traditional voting records of their electorate to win seats that had not traditionally been won by that side of politics. I instance the likes of Peter Dalamoff in Bowen, Rex Pilbeam in Rockhampton, Dr Norm Scott Young in Townsville, Gilbert Allison in Maryborough and Mervyn Anderson in Toowoomba and Toowoomba East. But Lou Edwards was the most successful of them all, a genuine son of Ipswich. His Welsh heritage and his religious convictions were central points in his life and mirrored the community from which he came. They also provided direction in his professional and political life and his post-political endeavours. Sir Lou, along with his late wife Leone, raised his family in Ipswich. Despite his medical achievements in later years, Sir Lou began his, wife, his life working as an apprentice electrician and he qualified as an electrical mechanic and fitter. That he graduated from the University of Queensland with a medical degree in his 30s in no way diminished the pride he felt in his initial qualifications. Upon graduation in 1965, he served at the Ipswich General Hospital and as a GP in Ipswich. It was as a family doctor that Sir Lou recognised the great contribution that could be made to local communities. In his maiden speech in this place in 1972, he spoke of the important role of the general practitioner and said, and I quote, it is often the family doctor who is the first to arrive uncalled, yet very welcome when a sudden, unexpected tragedy strikes the home of a patient. The general practitioner knows, therefore, the crisis in his patients' lives, as well as their problems, their aspirations and their disappointments. 
The family doctor who lives among his patients not only knows them and their families, but enables them to know him and to trust them. It was this ethos that drew Sir Lou into politics through the newly created seat of Ipswich in 1972. His belief in the importance of community service was a mainstay during his time in politics and says much about his success in being elected to Parliament on four separate occasions. Sir Lou's record of achievement in Parliament and government is well known. Appointed as Minister for Health at the relatively young age in those days of 39, elevated to Treasury in 78, and assuming the Deputy Premiership and leadership of the Liberal Party in the same year stand as a testament to his ability, his willingness to work hard and the high regard in which he was held. Sir Lou gained a reputation for courage, particularly in his efforts to maintain the integrity and direction of the government. Few would forget his opposition to the advocates of cancer quackery as he sought to protect the health of Queenslanders, relying on his unique perspective as a medical practitioner and minister for health. It was his belief in his professional experience that gave him the strength to tackle what many have regarded as an impossible political task. To his credit, Sir Lou stood his ground and ensured the interests of Queenslanders was protected. However, there is no doubt that in the 1970s and 80s, it was a time of great stress within the then coalition government and indeed within the Liberal Party. It was Sir Lou's role to steer a course that preserved the best features of both the government and the party, but acknowledged the need for change where circumstances called for a new approach until his retirement in 1983. It is to his credit that once again, in the face of changing circumstances, Sir Lou embarked on a new productive phase of his life. His achievements as head of Expo 88 are widely recognised. In that role, he did much to bring Brisbane, Queensland, Australia to the attention of the world and create an amazing legacy which we all enjoy. Sir Lou also served as Chancellor of the University of Queensland from 93 to 2009, as well as accepting directorships on the boards of some of Australia's most prominent public companies. Again, the key element to Sir Lou's post-political life was his willingness to contribute to his community. For this, he was recognised through the awarding of a knighthood in 1984 and the Companion of the Order of Australia in 1989. It is interesting to note that Sir Lou was elected to this House nearly half a century ago, and yet his legacy lives on across the river where thousands get to enjoy it every day. While it is obvious none of the members in this House serve with Sir Lou, there would be few of us who do not feel they know him in some way. We know him because of what he has achieved and what he has contributed. We know him because we have seen him at work. We know him because we are members of the community he served. We are honoured his great nephew, the member for Bonnie sits in this house. It is not lost on me how he too has developed a strong personal following amongst many in his local community who haven't traditionally supported this side of politics. I pay tribute to Sir Lou's wife, Lady Jane, a highly respected businesswoman one of the premier public relations operators in Brisbane and a woman of immense generosity and integrity. Let us all be thankful for the life and work of Sir Lou Edwards, and I extend my sympathy and that of the entire opposition to his family who join us today. Vale, Sir Lou. I call the member for Bonnie. Thank you, Speaker. It is an honour to rise today to speak to the condolence motion for one of Queensland's greatest Liberals, Sir Llewellyn Roy Edwards AC. It's fitting to have this condolence motion in Budget Week, given his many years of service as Queensland's Treasurer, and also as we see the installation of the Neville Bonner Bridge begin, opening up better access to his beloved South Bank. To me, he was my Uncle Lou, so it is a rare privilege to pay tribute to his life as a member of his family while serving in this place myself. I want to acknowledge Lou's wife, Lady Jane, in the gallery, and the members of our family who have come to remember Lou's service. I'll probably forget someone and hear about it later, but we have his sons, Mark and David, Mark's wife, Gail, some of their kids, India, Elsie, Hannah, and Eloise, and Eloise is turning 30 today, so I wanted to rub that in and, and get that on record. Uh, his beloved great-grandson, two-year-old Hunter, who's being very quiet up there in the gallery uh, and, and behaving himself, my auntie, Anne-Marie, my uncle, Gary, uh, cousin, Rob and Fiona, my mum, Suzanne, dad, Rodney, sister, Emily, and of course, my grandfather, Tom, Lou's brother. For my grandpa, this is a particularly sad time because he is the last of his extraordinary siblings left. They were close. He and Lou are just a couple of years apart. They went to school together at Ipswich Grammar 
and work together in the family business as Sparkies. I believe in the dark old days before members were allowed to have elected offices, Lou may have even been given a back room in the RT Edwards headquarters to work out of. Thank you to all of my family for coming to this place today to where Lou dedicated over a decade of his life in service. And that is what he did. He dedicated himself to the people of Queensland. Lou was a legend of our Edwards family, an ever-present figure whose extraordinary legacy was something we all knew about and looked up to. It took me a long time to actually grasp the extent of the role he played. We all got the stories of South Bank and Expo whenever we visited that part of Brisbane, but that was only the beginning of what he achieved. Even now, in the weeks following his death, I am hearing more and more stories that I had no idea about. Uncle Lou was a visionary who wanted to see the best outcomes for the people he represented in Ipswich and across our state. Lou had an incredible way with people. He was embracing of everyone. All people were the same to him, and he would give his time and attention equally to them. Although anyone who met him would have noticed this charming style, underneath was a tough, determined man with strong convictions and principles. I've asked members of our family why he chose the end of politics and, more importantly, why he chose the Liberal Party. With his background as a doctor, having delivered what we think is around 2,000 babies and tending to the illness and injuries of many more people, especially in the mines around Ipswich, Lou knew how underserviced the Ipswich health system was. My family has a proud Welsh background. They came to this country as coal miners, and that is what brought them to Ipswich, and it means they were very left-leaning. His dad, Roy, my great-grandfather, was in fact a local alderman and deputy mayor. I only found out this week that he was actually elected as an independent Labor member. That came as a bit of a shock because I, I have one of his How to Vote cards displayed in my office, so I, <laughs> I, probably, I probably should have read it more carefully before getting it mounted and framed. Um, many of Lou's relatives were in fact drawn to the left of politics because back then they saw it as essential to maintaining their work, their rights at work as miners. Some were, in fact, openly communists, including his grandfather, Benjamin Thomas. Lou even had a second cousin who would regularly run against him in elections as a socialist candidate. <laughs> but he believed his beloved Ipswich area was neglected. It had been poorly serviced, and he wanted to fix that, so he ran for parliament. Lou believed in the freedom of the individual. He wanted to do everything he could to make sure government helped those with aspiration to succeed. Running for Ipswich as a Liberal was best described as brave. This was a strong Labor area. The local federal member was, in fact, Bill Hayden, and when this seat was re-established in a redistribution, it was certain in everyone's minds to be a Labor electorate. But in 1972, Lou won the seat of Ipswich against Kev DeWire by 282 votes, a 1.2 per cent margin. Having won my first election with a similar margin of just 1.7 per cent, I can certainly understand his desire to not take the opportunity he was given to serve in this place for granted and to work as hard as he could as a local MP. It paid off, and in 1974, he had a massive 17.9 per cent swing towards him. He turned a marginal seat with a high Labor vote into a safe Liberal seat because of his dedication to his community and the people he represented. In my first speech, I included part of his own maiden, in which he said that we must legislate to provide an equal opportunity for all, to acquire the knowledge to enable him or her to improve his or her station in life and, as a result, benefit the community in general. He was a Liberal because he could not stand the thought of being bound to a faction or a particular way of voting. He wanted to represent his electorate to get the best outcomes. Even amongst his own side, this approach didn't always win him friends. There was often tremendous pressure on Lou from those he governed with. Uncle Lou was known to go to every possible event he could as a local member. He was rarely home. Even when he was working in Brisbane, he would often travel back to Ipswich and go to community events at night, and Saturdays were full of school fates and sporting activities. He took it as his supreme duty and privilege to represent his area, and he knew the Ipswich community deeply. A few months after his election, the devastating box flat mining disaster happened, a massive explosion which smashed windows kilometres away and tragically killed 17 people that night. He felt his house in race you shake, and the mine's owner, John McQueen, lived just a few houses up from Lou. As a doctor who had worked around the mine for years, Lou knew what this explosion meant, so he rushed to the mine and provided immediate medical care for those survivors. 
In those days, miners would often take their sons down the shaft for a day at times, and sadly, one family lost a father and a son. Lou had an uncle and other family members of ours die or be seriously injured in mining accidents, so he understood the depth of this loss for his community. He kept in touch with the widows and families for years to come and offered whatever support he could. And that was how he operated throughout his life. His family knew that you'd never be able to take a quick trip down the street with Lou because it would take an hour to get through one block with all the people he knew who would stop and have a chat with him. Even his wife Jane has experienced people calling the house decades after Lou had stopped practicing medicine and asking for medical advice from Dr. Edwards. I think my own grandpa even may have tried this himself in recent years in an attempt to get his driver's license back. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and by that point, I think Lou had been in Portofino for a couple of years himself, so uh, that, that thankfully was unsuccessful. He was the kind of doctor that, back when fathers were nowhere near the delivery suite, would drop past their workplace on the way home to let them know the news and then take them to the pub to celebrate. I do always also want to pay tribute to Lou's two long-serving electorate office staff, Faye Thomas and Delma Boyd. We all know how important our staff are in helping us serve our communities and these two ladies did a wonderful job over many years. What most Queenslanders would know Lou as is Mr Expo, and I'm proudly wearing an original Expo 88 tie today in his honour. It's not a family heirloom, I got it off eBay for $15. <laughs> <laughs> this, celebration, this celebration of Expo was uh, the birth of what we know as Brisbane today. It was as successful as it was unexpected. Many were opposed given the cost and the relative flops of previous Expo, but Lou saw what Expo, Expo could be. And he, with his Welsh stubbornness, took on the challenge and delivered an event that all of Queensland is rightly proud of. His efforts to promote and organise Expo 88 involved making 5,200 speeches about the event, going on 35 trips overseas, 147 interstate trips and 31 intrastate trips to lock in participants, and attending what is estimated to be around 11,600 meetings and deputations on behalf of Expo. He also drove his vision for Southbank to remain a space for everyone to enjoy. Southbank was what some have called a cesspit of a site prior to Expo, with the best government offices facing the city rather than the river because of how bad it looked. Uh, and Lou's office, in fact, as Deputy Premier, looked over the old site, uh, whereas Joe's on the other side enjoyed city views. Uh, and that's partly what made him so aware of how much potential the southern bank of the Brisbane River had. Lou believed the spirit of Expo should shape the area and fought hard to keep the site for the people and have it protected as parklands as a legacy for generations to come. It's hard to think of what Brisbane would be like without South Bank. We'll soon have the Neville Bonner Bridge connecting it better with the CBD and we can all be thankful for Lou's vision in driving it through. Like my grandfather, for many years, Lou was a teetotaler. He hadn't drunk a drop of alcohol. Uh, in my research for this speech, I found what I believe was the first time he might have experienced alcohol, uh, and that was probably on an official visit to Tokyo. He was given a century egg, a preserved egg, where the egg white has turned green and the yolk is black. It's held underground for a century, apparently, given the name, uh, with a very strong flavor due to the, the hydrogen sulfide and ammonia. He was presented with this egg and had to eat it. If he didn't, it would cause great offence to his hosts. So he gave it his best, and after several attempts, he managed to get most of it down. After that, he needed something to wash it down with, so he grabbed what, thought was a what he thought was a glass of water next to him. Turns out it was sake, uh, which must have been uh, quite an introduction uh, for him. Ipswich defined Lou in both his character and Lou's proudest achievements include getting the much needed upgrade for the Ipswich Hospital, in introducing school dental clinics and better maternity services. He backed Medibank, even though some saw it as the socialisation as health. Lou persuaded the Premier to accept the federal Whitlam government's significant Medibank funding and he used it to embark on a massive program of hospital building and upgrades. These were some of the services that drove him to run originally. He saw the inequity of health accessibility and he wanted to make it available for all. He went toe to toe with Sir Joe on many occasions, most of which I suspect will never be publicly known. One of his wins was holding firm and refusing to budge on an 18 month argument with Joe to bring the fraudulent doctor, Dr. Milan Brick, to Queensland. He refused to register him as a doctor here and years later was proven to be entirely right. 
Given everything he achieved, what he has nurtured in our family is admirable. He had Sundays at home, Leone making sure he kept strictly to that with the rest of his schedule so full. The family would head to his dad Roy's church, Raceview Congregational, with all the cousins and relatives, and then Roy and Agnes would have everyone over for lunch to follow, showing amazing hospitality, even though she was known as a terrible cook and it wasn't safe to eat anything unless it came from a tin. <laughs> there, there is another story involving that family house in Raceview, which has become a bit of a family legend. Russ Hins was visiting Lou, and they were having a cup of tea on the back veranda. The surveyor's pegs were marked out for the new section of the Cunningham Highway. Russ noticed that it wasn't too far away from the back of the house and asked Lou if he would like to have this major piece of infrastructure move further away to have less of an impact on the lovely Edwards family home. I'm not sure how serious that offer was, but I'm proud to say that Lou politely declined and the Cunningham Highway is just behind that area now. Lou was known to only take one week off a year between Christmas and New Year's. That was the holiday at Labrador on the Gold Coast, now in my electorate of Bonnie. It's partially to Lou that I attribute my lifelong love of this part of the world to. In the 1950s, Lou and my grandpa Tom bought a beach house on Marine Parade, and since then, six generations of the Edwards family have holidayed there. They transported and donated the original house on the site to a missionary organisation at Tambourine and built a two-storey house called Deeside with separate units for each family. It became our second home. When I moved to the Gold Coast after finishing university, there was no one else, nowhere else I wanted to live, and I moved into a unit just a few hundred metres away from Deeside. Every school holidays, there would be around 20 cousins with a 15-year age range running between, uh, going between them, running around like crazy there. This chaos probably would explain why Lou only stayed there for one week a year. But it was incredibly, an incredibly special time which brought our extended family together, and for that week that he would be there, playing cricket in the yard, fishing, and getting to the beach and enjoying all the Gold Coast had to offer. I wasn't there when Lou was, but my memories of this place are what built my connection to Labrador and bigger waters, and I'm thankful for his and my papa's part in creating that space for us. Lou has been lucky to have been deeply loved twice. Leone was his nurse in the Ipswich Hospital. He spent many months there after falling off a ladder, on a job as a sparky in the family business and breaking his back. Tragically, she died suddenly in 1988 of an asthma attack in the early hours of the morning. She was just 55 years of age. Her death traumatised Lou. With all of his kids having left the family home, he couldn't comprehend living there on his own. This was just six weeks before Expo was to open as well. So within a few days of her death, he moved to an apartment in Brisbane. After more than half a century of living in Ipswich, the place which had formulated his values, his character and his sense of community, Lou would never return. He found love again with Jane, and their relationship was something he cherished and which brought him many more decades of joy. Lou achieved so many things in the years he lived in Brisbane, and he was most proud of his role as Chancellor of the University of Queensland. Like many of us who have lost family members, my biggest regret is not spending more time getting to know Lou and gaining from his wisdom and experience. I loved having him here for lunch with my papa a few years back just after I was elected, and even though his dementia had taken hold then, he loved being back and chatting to everyone as he made his way through the corridors again. I brought him into this chamber for the first time since he left as a member in 1983, and he absolutely lit up with memories excitedly pointing around the room. It was quite strange for me, though, because he was on that side of the chamber, which is, is not something I've experienced, and that's all he got to do, uh, which was very lucky. Uh, I have valued the last few weeks spending time with my family, remembering Lou and learning more about his extraordinary legacy. I'd like to table this article as I think it shows Lou well. It's from the day after he lost the Liberal leadership, holding his first grandchild proudly, my cousin Nick, clearly beaming with joy. It is the definition of leaving politics for family reasons. Lou served our state with everything he had. I only hope that I can serve my electorate in Queensland with his same level of commitment and vision. It is an honour to be part of Lou's family, and I know we've all been touched by the number of people who have reached out during this time. So on behalf of the Edwards family, I would like to conclude by saying thank you to all members for your contribution to this motion. And Vale Sir Lou. I call the member for Bundamba. <coughs> Mr Speaker, on May 26 we lost a Queensland great with the passing of Sir Llewellyn Roy Edwards, a man renowned for his warm, generous and courteous nature 
Sir Lou was elected to Queensland Parliament as the member for Ipswich in 1972. He joined this place as a Liberal member and would go on to lead the party from October 1978 to August 1983. It was his commitment to Ipswich's working class community that played a major role in his popularity and success as a community representative. Sir Lou's son, Mark, fondly remembers how our local, local working class heartland embraced his father, a former Ipswich electrician who went on to become a GP. I want to personally thank Mark for sharing his memories of his father. And in Mark's words, he recalls, it all started out when dad was a medical practitioner and he had a very large mining and railway practice. Back in those days, they were the two biggest industries in Ipswich, so he got to know all those families very well. Dad himself came from a mining family, and his grandfather was a miner, and his un great uncles were miners, and he w lost one of his great, great uncles to a mining accident in 1920. When Dad first ran for Parliament, he stood against a union official, and the mining community voted for Dad because they knew him as their doctor. I remember miners handing out uh, how to vote cards and saying to me, we vote for Bill Hayden federally and Lou in the state. Speaker, Sir Lou remained as the doctor for many of the widows left behind after the terrible tragedy in our local Bundamba community of the Box Flat mining disaster on July 31, 1972. 17 men lost their lives that day and another died in 1974 as a result of his injuries. Sir Lou served the city of Ipswich until his retirement from politics in 1983. Sir Lou loved Ipswich and Ipswich loved Sir Lou. Following his retirement from politics, he was appointed by the state and federal governments as executive chairman of our Transfer transformative World Expo 88, an undeniable coming of age for Brisbane and Queensland, and indeed, like so many of us, uh, myself who had the chance to attend that wonderful event. Following his tenure as Expo Chairman, in 1993, Sir Lou was elected the 12th Chancellor of the University of Queensland, where a building at the St Lucia campus is named in his honour. He remained in that role until 2009, chairing more than 100 meetings of UQ Senate and presiding over 300 graduation ceremonies and congratulating almost 90,000 graduates. Speaker, Sir Lou rose from working class Ipswich to become one of our state's most influential figures and was officially named a Queensland great in 2010. I was thankful for the opportunity to pay uh, my and my community's respects at his state funeral and pay tribute to his dedication and commitment to helping our local community. Queensland continues to be a better place for his many contributions, and his legacy will be forever felt at nearby at South Bank, the site of Expo 88. I offer my and the Bundamba community's deepest respects and condolences to Sir Lou's family, to Lady Jane Edwards, children David and Mark, his grandchildren, and of course, to his great nephew, the state member for Bonnie. Vale, Sir Lou Edwards. I call the member for Tuba South. Uh, Mr Speaker, let me start by offering my deepest condolences to Sir Lou's wife, Lady Jane, sons Mark and David, brother Tom, his grandchildren and all the family here today. And Sam, you honour Sir Lou's legacy with your service and that contribution. Sir Lou's life was one that touched generations of Queenslanders for so many different reasons. To some, he was their local GP. To others, he was their local MP. And then here in this place, Minister for Health, Treasurer and Deputy Premier. He was a corporate leader, serving some of our most significant companies. To others again, he was univers the University of Queensland's Chancellor, attending every graduation, shaking every hand, 90,000 in total, I'm told. But to me, my family, and indeed the people of the Darling Downs, he was the man who brought the world to Queensland. Expo 88, pavilions, and I still reckon there's people waiting outside wanting to get into the Switzerland pavilion today. 
Eh. Bien, bien. I'll go to the German beer for what are the Munich the Munich beer house. Um, the monorail, the sky needle, lasers, fireworks. Even John English was here. It was quite the experience for a young country boy on his first visits to the big smoke of Brisbane. Salou delivered that to us. He knew that Queensland could be part of something bigger and he made it happen. As so many speakers do when preparing for condolence motions, I turn to Sir Lou's maiden speech for guidance as to his political philosophy. And I was stunned by its beauty and intellectual clarity. His exposition of classical liberalism could have been penned by J.S. Mill himself. I fully believe in the individual's role in a free society, which is so designed as to permit the fullest expression of an individual's conscience and his personality and the complete achievement of well-being in the society in which he lives. And speaking of the Liberal Party's platform, to encourage the development of the individual as well as the development of the community, promoting advanced efficiencies and technological developments with the minimum of restrictive regulation consistent with the common good. Mr Speaker, may we in this House today aspire to such lofty ideals, ideals not just spoken into Hansard for posterity, but lived every day in every way by this truly great Queenslander. Vale Salou. Mr Speaker. I call the member for Nanango. Mr Speaker, it is indeed an honour to stand in this House and contribute to the condolence motion for Salou Edwards. I would like to acknowledge Lady Jane Edwards, who is here in the chamber today, and Salou's sons, Mark and David, and the extended Edwards family who are here today with us. And of course, I would also like to acknowledge my great mate, the member for Bonnie, Sam O'Connor. It's been just such a privilege meeting Salou several times in my life. And in fact, I would state that you couldn't go to school in Ipswich for high school and not know either Salou or his legacy to that great town. And his imprint on Ipswich remains. Salou was a champion for Ipswich. Now, as speakers before me have mentioned, Salou's career um, started as an electrician. He had, in fact, matriculated to medicine, but his father, Roy, who had lived through hard times, told Lou he had seen doctors during the Depression who couldn't find work. So he insisted Lou complete an electrical apprenticeship with the family company R.T. Edwards in Ipswich. Now, Salou apparently claimed he was never a very good electrician, and in his final year he had an accident which resulted in serious inju injuries and a four-month hospital stay. And that is where he met his first wife, Leone. But far from near tragedy, he saw a new direction and decided to finally pursue his dream of studying medicine. While still working for R.T. Edwards on weekends and holidays, he graduated with a Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery from the University of Queensland in 1965 and worked as a doctor in Ipswich until 1972. It was in 1972 that he was asked to run for the Liberal Party for the seat of Ipswich. So Gordon Chalk, the then member for Lockyer, Treasurer and Leader of the Liberal Party, had visited Salou's doctor's surgery to ask him to run. Now, it was not an easy decision for Salou, who loved being a doctor. He told Sir Chalk he wouldn't have the time to campaign, but in the end he decided to run, winning the seat by just those few hundred votes. When he got to State Parliament and saw what was going on, it was reported he thought, how can I get out of this? Uh, <laughs> Nothing's changed. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing has changed. I think, though, it was the story about when one of the members of parliament was actually uh, found ill uh, or had collapsed, and Salou was called upon, like all good doctors in this house, uh, to look after that member. And I think the other members that were around the member that was down actually said, hang on, um, we haven't found someone else for that seat yet, <laughs> something like that. They were, <laughs> yeah, they were worried about the by-election. Uh, so, in any case, at the next election in 1974, 
Sulu won the seat by a large majority. And as other members have stated, Sulu held the positions in this House as Minister for Health, Treasurer, Deputy Premier and Leader of the Liberal Party. Sulu remained the member for Ipswich until October 1983, when he used his cast casting vote against himself in a challenge for the position of Leader of the Liberal Party, and he retired from politics. But it wasn't long before opportunity knocked again, and the then Prime Minister Bob Hawke rang to offer him the position of Chairman and Chief Executive of World Expo 88. Apparently Bob's words were, mate, what are you doing with yourself now? Do you know anything about Expo? You're the only man in Australia that can work with Joe up there in Queensland. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just a part-time job, just a couple of days a week. <laughs> so Lou said he'd think about it, <clears throat> but woke the next morning to read in the paper that the Prime Minister had announced him <laughs> as the chair. <laughs> so Lou became the face of World Expo 88, Mr Expo the event which is credited for making Brisbane and bringing more than 18 million people to this city. He helped transform the 40 hectares of land in the heart of the city and he brought the whole world here to Brisbane. Now everyone in this house who is old enough to remember the brilliance that was Expo 88, and I do note the member for Bonnie wasn't even born, um, but as it was my last year in high school, I was fortunate <laughs> I was fortunate enough to have a season pass, which I've still got that, that little laminated pass. And with my schoolmates, one of which is sitting up here, Anne-Marie Anne -Marie Savage, um, we were able to catch the train in almost every weekend and the world opened up before my eyes. So I thank Sir Lou for the excuse that so many seniors of 88 had as to why their, their exam results were not quite so stellar. Um, but the upside of this was that those seniors of ADA were able to experience the tastes, the sounds and the visions of so many other countries, and not just Germany. Um, all with, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> all without leaving Queensland. Uh, <laughs> Salou also served as Chancellor of the University of Queensland. He had a genuine interest and connection with the student population, and I hear he was often in trouble for taking too much time with individuals during those graduation ceremonies. In all of these roles, Salou demonstrated his ability as a true leader. His niece, Anne-Marie Savage, interviewed Salou whilst writing a book about the history of the family company, R.T. Edwards. She, she shared with me some insights into what Salou thought was the secret to good leadership. He, these included, have good people around you, trust the people around you, expect the best but detect the worst, don't tolerate murmuring, debate or secrets behind your back, always be upfront, communicate, stay humble, work as a team and make all feel important. I was fortunate to get to know the Edwards family when I attended Ipswich Girls Grammar and was in the same year as Anne-Marie. My brother Matt Ross is a good schoolmate of Salou's son Dave from Boys Grammar. In fact, Salou's extended family are firmly connected to my old school with his sisters Gwen and Marilyn attending, his daughter Louise, granddaughters Hannah, Gabrielle and Eloise, and happy birthday Eloise, nieces Anne-Marie and of course Sam's mum Suzanne all attending there. Anne-Marie said the entire family is immensely proud of Salou and all that he achieved and contributed to Queensland and beyond. One of Anne-Marie's earliest memories, um, she was saying, was handing out flyers, supporting Uncle Lou at a local Raceview State School, proudly wearing Ipswich Needs Lou t-shirt. Anne-Marie also reflected that he always had some awesome travel advice. He could recommend fantastic places to eat, that only the locals knew about, and they were, they were the ones that he loved best. He would often share fascinating stories of his life. She recalls him telling how he managed to get an audience with the Pope, which in itself was a challenge for a non-Catholic. The Vatican treasures were considered priceless and they had never before left Rome. But somehow, Salou convinced the Pope to allow them to come to Brisbane for Expo 88. He said the next challenge was how to get those priceless treasures here. No one wanted to carry them or insure them. 
He managed to get hold of the boss of Qantas, who chartered a private plane to get the treasures safely to Brisbane. He recounted the story with a smile, no airs or graces, he was always humble. Now, no one could ever accuse Sir Lou of having a brush with the law. However, Anne-Marie had just come back um, to London from backpacking around Turkey and Egypt and thought it was a wonderful opportunity to send some of her loot and souvenirs home. She gave Sir Lou, who was at London, in London at the time, a huge bag of stuff she had collected and asked him to take it home to Queensland. The next time Anne-Marie saw Sir Lou, he said, you could have told me about the kebab skewers. I had a slight problem in customs. I probably should have declared them. He had been detained uh, for the set of 40 centimetre kebab skewers that were basically lethally sharp blades, complete with belly dancers and Alibaba on the top. Bearing in mind, this was just after September 11. So thank you, Anne-Marie, for providing us with an insight into <laughs> Salu and the man behind the public face. To Lady Jane, thank you for your service. Thank you for your kindness to me, your advice and your gu guidance. The last time I saw Salu was with Lady Jane at the hairdressers, and that was a couple of years ago, where Salu would sit patiently reading The Australian and he would ask me about the state of Queensland politics and what was going on in this house. Salou was the, a gentleman, always interested and always generous with his time. So to Lady Jane, to Salou's sons, David and Mark, and to his extended family, I offer my sincerest condolences. A humble servant of this state, a leader, a family man, a community champion. He truly was a Queensland great. Rest in peace, Salou. I call the member for Ipswich. Mr Speaker, I rise to contribute to the condolence motion for Salou Edwards AC, who was born in Ipswich on the 2nd of August 1935 and who died aged 85 on the 25th of May 2021. Salou was a third generation Ipswichian, with, the, with his great grandfather Thomas Benjamin Llewellyn moving to Ipswich from Wales in the United Kingdom. He has three children, Mark, David and Louise, who is sadly deceased. It's lovely to see Mark and David and their families in the gallery today. And I also pay tribute to Lady Jane Salou's widow. And amongst her many achievements, I know one of the things that she did uh, do incredibly well was bring a lot of joy to Salou's life. I also want to acknowledge Salou's brother and local Ipswich great, Tom Edwards, and his family who are here today, including uh, Sam O'Connor over here. And thank you for your contribution. As you can see, Mr Speaker, Sir Lou came from a very well-known and respected Ipswich family. His son Mark, along with his wife Gail, and two of their four children still live in Ipswich, and Mark is a much-loved and respected pastor at Ipswich's largest church, City Hope Church. His other son, David, is chair of the Ipswich Grammar School Board and doing an excellent job guiding the school that his dad himself and many in their family also attended. The school is indeed fortunate to have him, and it was an honour to see student leaders and the headmaster of Ipswich Grammar School, Richard Morrison, in attendance at Salou State Funeral uh, a week ago. And as we've heard from previous speakers in this house this morning, so Lou led a life well lived. He attended Raceview and Silkstone State Schools and later Ipswich Grammar School. He left high school to become an apprentice electrician, but following an accident in 1955 and many months in hospital recovering, so Lou pursued a different career and after completing a degree in medicine at the University of Queensland in 1965, became a doctor in Ipswich. So Lou made good use of all of his time, and particularly the time that he was in hospital, by not only determining a new career for himself, but by falling in love with and marrying the mother of his three children, Nurse Leonie Sylvia Burley in 1958. In 1972, Sir Lou became the member for Ipswich, where he gained a reputation for being hardworking and effective. In fact, his years as an MP lent dignity and stability to a government that was often fraught with controversy and colourful characters. Sir Lou later became Health Minister, Deputy Premier, Leader of the Liberal Party and Treasurer in his time in Parliament. My friend and to someone who I owe so much, the Honourable Dr David Hamill AM, became the Labor member for Ipswich in 1983 after Sir Lou retired. And he said, uh, there can be no doubt that it was the esteem in which he was held by his constituents that secured his victories and what would otherwise be considered a marginal Labor electorate. David has asked me to extend his and his wife Pat's sincere condolences to Lady Jane and his sons David and Mark and their families. 
David went on to hold him, the seat himself until 2001 when he himself retired and as is the case with Sir Lou, David led a distinguished career in Parliament and is held in high esteem in the Ipswich community today. Um, so, uh, sorry. <laughs> So Lou went on to make a significant contribution as the 12th Chancellor at the University of Queensland, at which there is now a building at, named in his honour. In 1984, he was made a Knight Bachelor. In 1989, received a Companion of the Order of Australia. And it's not news to anyone who knew him that Sir Lou's time as Chair of the World Expo 88 was the highlight of his career. And without doubt, World Expo put Brisbane on the map. And beautiful South Bank is a lasting legacy of that achievement. In 2010, Sir Lou was named Queensland Great by then Premier Anna Bly with the citation, an outstanding Queenslander who's made exceptional contributions to many fields. No matter his occupation, Sir Lou has always maintained his goodwill, his sense of humility, as he helped transform Queensland into the great state it is today. What an incredible life Sir Lou led and what an incredible legacy he leaves. His life's achievements are many and varied. He's been a role model to all who knew him. When attempting to summarise a life like Salou's, we could be mistaken for thinking his life was easy, privileged. While it was indeed a fortunate life, he would undoubtedly have experienced challenges and struggles along the way. Leadership can often be a lonely place, and for some, achievements like his may have made them arrogant or entitled, but Salou was the exact opposite. His son, Mark, told me that his earliest and most enduring memories of his dad is that he'd give the same deference to a coal miner he'd meet in the street in Ipswich as he gave to the Queen when he met her at Expo. People mattered to Sir Lou, and so did equality and fairness. And that's one of the reasons his life and his passing mean so much to so many in Ipswich. Another example of this, Mark regaled me with this story, uh, as a seven or eight year old, he, Mark referred to one of the children of New Australians at his school as a wog, which so many of us did in those days, to our shame. His dad immediately corrected him. He drove him to his good friend's cafe, one of our Greek cafes of the time, and they sat and talked for what seemed like ages. The lesson being for Mark that everyone was equal and our friends, regardless of where they came from, what they ate or the colour of their skin. As a parent, there is no greater legacy to leave your children than an understanding of equality, fairness and love for our fellow travellers. Those traits are evident in Sulu's children and grandchildren, and I know he was extremely proud of them all. On behalf of the entire Ipswich community, I thank Sir Lou Edwards for his enormous contribution to Ipswich and to Queensland, and I extend my sincere condolences to all who loved him. Mr Speaker. I call the member for Mogul. Mr Speaker, as the uh, Liberal National Party state member for Mogul and as a former president of the Australian Medical Association of Queensland, uh, it is a privilege to rise in support of this motion and honour the life, service and sacrifice of a true servant of the people of Queensland. Mr Speaker, on the 26th of May 2021, the Honourable Sir Llewellyn Roy Edwards, AC, passed away at the age of 85 years. Mr Speaker, with the passing of Sir Lou, our state has lost not only a Queensland great, but we have lost a true gentleman whose service in so many different and varied capacities has left a legacy which has benefited generations of Queenslanders. It is a profound loss, Mr Speaker, that has been felt right across Queensland, and particularly by all of those who are fortunate enough to know Sir Lou through his significant contributions to our state, be it through his tenure in the Queensland Parliament, his roles as Deputy Premier of Queensland, Treasurer and State Leader of the Liberal Party, his service to higher education, or via his leadership as Chair of World Expo 88. However, today, Mr Speaker, in addressing this condolence motion, I want to particularly acknowledge and pay tribute to the public service made by Sir Lou Edwards to healthcare and the medical profession in Queensland. Born on 2 August 1935 in Ipswich, Sir Lou attended school at Raceview and Silkstone State Schools before then attending the Ipswich Grammar School. As is well known, Mr Speaker, following his high school education, Sir Lou entered his family business, R.T. Edwards, as an apprentice electrician. It was a vocation that was not his first choice, as Sir Lou had instead wanted to study medicine, but he began as an electrician, given that his family insisted he should not consider progressing to a higher tertiary education qualification until first completing a four-year apprenticeship. It can be said, uh, Mr Speaker, that Sir Lou's transition to medicine literally came about by an accident, when in his third year as an apprentice he fell off a ladder and cracked three of his vertebrae. As Sir Lou later recalled, that accident had, and I quote, reinforced the notion that I'd better get on and do medicine, end quote. In 1958, Sir Lou commenced his tertiary education at the University of Queensland, 
graduating with his medical degree in 1965 at the age of 27, with a Bachelor of Medicine and a Bachelor of Surgery. Following his graduation, Mr Speaker, Salou then commenced his professional service of improving the health and wellbeing of Queenslanders. From 1965 to 1967, Salou served as a resident medical officer at the Ipswich General Hospital, and in 1968 he then served as a surgical registrar at the Ipswich General Hospital. Throughout this time, Mr Speaker, and for more than 10 years following his graduation, Salou also worked as a general practitioner and helped to deliver thousands of new Queenslanders. As fate would have it, Mr Speaker, Salou's foray into Queensland state politics came via his medical practice, when none other than the former leader of the Liberal Party and 30th Premier of Queensland, Sir Gordon Shaw, came to see Salou at his Ipswich medical practice to convince him that he should consider running for state parliament. As all doctors who serve and have served as elected uh, representatives in this place can attest to, there is certainly a diverse range of political views offered by patients, and I'm sure Salou's decision may have surprised many in his then medical practice. Mr Speaker, in May of 1972, Salou was sworn in as the state member for Ipswich in the Queensland Parliament, and in doing so, uh, became the first non-Labor state member representing the city of Ipswich in nearly 50 years. Mr Speaker, Salou is widely remembered for his contribution and service to the Queensland Parliament, where as the Minister for Health from 1974 to 1978, he helped lay the foundation for ensuring Queenslanders had access to a modern and accessible health system. This is evident even in Salou's maiden speech, which best encapsulates his core belief in the prosperity of this great state being enjoyed by each and every Queenslander, as well as the associated importance of ensuring that the health and welfare of each individual is a priority. As Salou said, and I quote, the greatest gift a person can acquire is that of good health, and the wherewithal to develop and maintain a healthy body and a healthy mind, as well as the ability to enjoy such facilities to the best of one's capabilities in order to give the full meaning of life. Salou continued, I believe that the benefits that can be derived from the prosperity of this state and nation should be enjoyed by all. I therefore wish to pay a great deal of attention and devote a great deal of time to research, study and consideration of all aspects of health and welfare services to ensure that the best facilities are available to all sections of the community so that the people of this state, of which we are justly proud, may enjoy their lives to the optimum." End quote. <clears throat> Mr Speaker, notwithstanding his service to the Queensland Parliament, World Expo 88 and also as Chancellor of the University of Queensland, Salou was also an eminently qualified individual, a fellow of the Royal Australasian College of Medical Administrators, a fellow of the Australian Institute of Management, not to men mention having an honorary doctorate from Griffith University as well as an honorary doctorate from the Queensland University of Technology. Mr Speaker, I'm also a fellow of the Royal Australasian College of Medical Administrators, which is the Australian Health Practitioner Regulation uh, agency recognised specialist medical college that provides education, training, knowledge and advice in medical management in order for fellows of RACMAR to fulfil key roles and positions in various government bureaucracies, public and private hospitals, not-for-profit organisations and other health agencies. Mr Speaker, the broader membership of the Royal Australasian College of Medical Administrators is certainly feeling the profound professional loss of a colleague who gave so much to health and medical research. Mr Speaker, it also speaks volumes about the genuine nature and character of Sir Lou Edwards that in a profile in 1992, when reflecting on his then 30 years of service to Queensland, Sir Lou chose his time as a general practitioner to remember most fondly and, as he termed it, the noblest profession of all. And I know, Mr Speaker, that both the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners and the Australian College of Rural and Remote Medicine also recognise Sir Lou's immense contribution to primary care and community medicine. Mr Speaker, I was fortunate to meet Salou on many occasions, and his mentorship and leadership, along with a generation of conservative medical practitioners, including former Senator, the late Dr John Heron, AO, and the late Professor Tess Crammond, AO, OBE, is something I'll always cherish and be forever grateful. Mr Speaker, on the 3rd of June 2021, I, along with many elected representatives in this place, attended the state funeral service and celebration of life of Salou Edwards, which was held at the Cathedral Church of St John the Evangelist. Mr Speaker, the eulogy and tributes on the day were a testament to a life well lived. Mr Speaker, modern Queensland would not be what it is today without the dedication and service of Sir Lou Edwards, and I wish to place on record my formal condolences to his wife, uh, Lady Jane Edwards, and to his surviving children, Mark and David, as well as the member for Bonnie and the entire extended family of the late Sir Edwards. Mr Speaker, ballet, Dr Lou Edwards. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. I call the member for scenic room. Oh. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And uh, on behalf of the community I represent, which includes part of Ipswich City and the Festivern area, can I express my condolences to Lady Jane, to David, Mark, and uh, also brother uh, Tom Edwards uh, on the death of Sir Lou Edwards. 
The entire family should be very proud of uh, Sir Lou's contribution made to Queensland, to Australia, and in particular to the Ipswich community. Sir Lou is a great example of Liberal values and why we stand to be a member of this place to represent our community. Uh, he was a hard-working gentleman who left school early to work as an electrician, as we have heard, but then took the initiative to further himself to study medicine while also raising a young family, which we heard about at the state funeral recently. He was adaptable and in tune with his community and compassionate. And when he left this place in 1983, I think it's not drawing too long ago to say that the steady hand of Sir Lou was irreplaceable within the coalition. In my community around the Fassifern area, it's been said that he was a great friend of the Fassifern region. I was talking to a number of people who have uh, I've run into in the weeks since Sir Lou's passing, and they've commented about his terrific contribution, not only to Ipswich and to Queensland and Australia, but to our region as well. And I, in particular, draw attention to the fact that Boona Hospital uh, was uh, replaced in 1977, uh, which still stands to this day as a testament to the investment made by Sir Lou when he was the Minister for Health. Um, the, the former ma uh, Mayor of Boona Shire, uh, John Brent, uh, and also Mayor of Sydney Crim, commented that there was no greater friend of the Fassifern in terms of the investment brought to our health services and other services in that region uh, during the time of Sir Lou's uh, service as a member for Ipswich, Deputy Premier, Treasurer and Minister for Health. Another commented that not only did Sir Lou replace the hospital, but he had the uh, connection to community that he came back 10 years later after having left politics to actually celebrate the 10th anniversary of the construction of that place. He was committed to the communities that he had served even after leaving politics. There were other significant investments as well. And in the, uh, I, I must say, the Fassifern Guardian and Tribune has uh, put in place a wonderful obituary for Sir Lou Edwards, which I will table. And it quoted in there the former Ipswich Mayor, John Nugent, uh, as saying, Lou Edwards to me was a, what a politician should be. He had a strong feeling for the people and their welfare, and in that, he was a great example for all of us. We acknowledge his service, his contribution to our community, and can I express my condolences to all of his family on the passing of Sir Lou. May he rest in peace. I call the member for Clayfield. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, Sir Lou Edwards, a giant of the Liberal Party and a stalwart of Queensland political, business and community life, and a well-known figure in the Clayfield of electorate, passed away peacefully on the 26th of May this year. A state funeral for Salou was held on the 3rd of June, and like many in this place, I was honoured to attend and to join the hundreds of others at St John's Cathedral to celebrate Sir Lou's achievements and to mourn his passing. At that service, Sir Lou's friends and family spoke, spoke warmly and fondly of his love for that family, of his engagement with his friends, and indeed his love for all Queensland. And in particular, David's words were heartfelt and gave a deep insight into Sir Lou's life and times and his achievements. Many thousands of words have been written about Sir Lou's life and contributions. No doubt more will be written and said about his career and public achievements. The Ipswich grammar boy who trained as an electrician. And from what I've heard about his equity on ladders, probably the electrician's loss has been the medical profession's gain. He went on to get a medical degree, who became a much-loved local GP, convinced by another great Liberal leader, Sir Gordon Chalk, to run for the seat of Ipswich, elected to this place in 1972, who was quickly recognised as a man of intellect and talent and promoted to Health Minister in very short order, who was seen as a potential leader of his party early on and was elevated to that position in 1977, and who went on to secure outstanding results leading the Liberal Party in the subsequent two elections, seeing the rise to their highest numbers in this place uh, in the coalition. Who, as both a health minister and treasurer, went on to secure huge reforms for the people of Queensland, including finalising a Medibank deal that saw 40 new hospitals built, all hospitals rebuilt, and who saw in the value of home ownership the aspirations of all Queensland and introduced stamp duty concessions for young people buying their first home who was a cooling and moderating influence in a cabinet that, as has been said, had strong voices and strong personalities and perhaps not a few hotheads. 
who knew when his time came how to retire from the battlefield of politics with his honour and reputation intact, and who, having retired and returned to private medical practice, then again answered the call to serve when asked to chair the World Expo 88 organisation, and who subsequently went about that task with his usual charm, diligence and efficiency. And his legacy for those years changed the face of Brisbane forever. And more importantly, he changed the way we thought about ourselves and our state. He made us confident about who we were, no longer playing second fiddle. And that, perhaps, is one of the greatest legacies that Lou left behind. The confidence of a successful expo imbued has never, ever left us. And those who were there in those heady days will never forget. Perhaps the entirety, they, they won't forget, but a few nights they might be a bit hazy. I still have my six-month expo pass, a gift from my then girlfriend, now wife, in fact of 28 years today, I might add. <laughs> 16 years of them doing budgets, I might add, so there you go. Uh, and even after those achievements, he contributed even more as a company director uh, and University of Queensland Chancellor. And these are indeed mighty achievement, achievements. They are achievements unlikely to be matched any time soon, and of course honours and accolades follow, as well as the numerous parks, roads and buildings that are littered throughout the state named after Sir Lou. But I also want to talk about the Lou I knew and saw in my electorate. And when I listened to the speeches at the service, and as I've listened to them here today, and as I've spoken to his family and friends, it only reinforced my experiences with Sir Lou. And yes, he was honoured and respected for his public achievements, as he should be, but it was the simple kindnesses and the humanity of Lou that stood out most to most people. It was never a surprise to see Lou and Jane out walking the beloved schnauzers, shopping at the local Syrianis IGA, or indeed, as the Premier has mentioned, as part of the Harvey's Breakfast Club down at Newstead. And just as much as it was and just as much, it was never a surprise to see them in deep conversation with any and all who came across their path. And one such event was when I was shopping with my daughter Kate a few years ago at the Siriani IGA. And I was walking through the car park with Kate and Lou and Jane had just been inside and were coming out and we stopped to have a few words and I introduced Kate and without any hesitation at all, Lou started chatting away to her, a 15 year old, as if he was someone he'd known for years. And he did it in that way that Lou had, of never talking down to someone, but in listening up to them. And that conversation continued for some minutes until the dangers of the Range Rovers and Mercedes in the car park became a little too great <laughs> and we had to move on. Lou also handed out for me at the 2012 election, faithfully manning the election booth at Brothers at Albion for a few hours. And while I did have some qualms and felt it might have been a bit of an impost for him at that stage, I did make sure that he was at a booth with a reliably high LMP vote and where there was a good chance he would at least know most of the voters and I think the vote improved as a result of Lou's efforts there for me. Now in recent years Lou's health had declined and the steady march of, de of dementia saw him increasingly under care. And it was during that time that the support and love of his family and friends was so important. I know David was frequently with him. And without doubt, Lady Jane was the rock of his last years and months. And while he was unable to live the life he and Jane so much enjoyed, travelling, dining, the company of friends, he and Jane were still very much a partnership. So I joined with not only members in this place, not only his friends and colleagues, but the hundreds of thousands of Queenslanders whose lives he touched and made so much better in extending my condolences and sympathy to Jane, to David, to Mark, to the entire family. And while the carnival is over, the music plays on and the memories will remain. Honourable members, I wish to make a couple of brief comments of my own. Um, there have been many words said about this gentleman and his giant contribution to public life, which I wholeheartedly endorse. We share the honour of being uh, both treasurers of Queensland. 
However, the member for Bonnie gave us a great insight into his personal life. It is as a father, a grandfather, a husband and uncle where he has made one of his most significant marks. Through my great friendship with David Edwards, I saw how much Sir Lou meant to his family and to how much his family meant to him. I was honoured, like many others, to attend his state funeral and to see the impact he'd had on the lives of so many Queenslanders. But it will be his family where Sir Lou will be missed the most. Honourable members, will you please indicate your agreement with the motion by standing in silence for one minute. Thank you, Honourable Members. Honourable Members, question time will uh, commence today at 11.26am. Are there any appointments to be announced? Are there any ministerial papers? Sorry. Mr Speaker, if I can just clarify, I understand question time would start in half an hour, not an hour. I'm now advised that question time will commence at 11.16am. Uh, I'm now advised that it will be 11.06am. <laughs> Any more offers? <laughs> Are there any ministerial statements? I call the Honourable the Premier. Do you want to check? They just. We've got another offer. All right, I'll start. We've got and another come offer. Back. Uh, Mr Speaker, in terms of our daily COVID update, I can confirm that we have no cases of community transfer. We have three new, ca new cases, all overseas acquired in hotel quarantine, so we have 29 active cases. I can advise that we've had 6,941 tests in the past 24 hours. And another record, Minister for Health, 14,397 vaccines have been given in the past 24 hours. Uh, Mr Speaker, yesterday we uh, heard of new advice from the Federal Government in relation to the AstraZeneca vaccine. The Federal Government has advised that AstraZeneca is restricted to those aged uh, 59 – sorry, Astra AstraZeneca is restricted to those aged 60 and over, while the Pfizer vaccine is available to those aged 59 and under. As a consequence, our community hubs will now offer Pfizer to those aged 40 to 59. Um, Mr Speaker, I would also advise people that it is very important that people book their vaccine. Yeah. Book in their vaccine. Mr Speaker, Queensland's economy is roaring back just as we said it would. Yeah, yeah. New yeah. data released by the Australian Bureau of Statistics yesterday proves our COVID-19 economic recovery plan is working. Unemployment is now lower than it was before the pandemic at 5.5%. Yeah. Queensland's 0.7 per cent reduction in unemployment is the biggest drop in the nation. And Queensland now has 84,900 more jobs than we did before COVID, the highest jobs growth in Australia. Yeah. In fact, Queensland recorded growth of more than 1,000 jobs each day throughout May. The state budget delivered by the Treasurer this week will create even more jobs for Queenslanders. To date, we're investing more than $14.2 billion in economic recovery initiatives. This includes our flagship $3.34 billion Queensland Jobs Fund to support industry and turbocharge job creation. 
and our $52 billion, more than $52 billion infrastructure investment will support 45,000 jobs a year to deliver major projects like Cross River Rail and billions of dollars worth of upgrades to roads and, ra and rail right across our state. Yeah. Mr yeah. Speaker, I've said it before and I'll say it again, you can't keep a Queenslander down. We'll continue to invest in infrastructure and services to create jobs and rebuild our economy. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, under our government, we are recruiting more police to keep Queenslanders safe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the election, I committed to deliver the biggest boost to policing in 30 years, to recruit an extra 2,025 police officers by 2025 to keep Queenslanders safe. Mr Speaker, together with the Police Minister Mark Ryan and Commissioner Katerina Carroll, I can confidently say we're delivering on that commitment. Yeah, yeah. I'm proud to announce that today 96 police recruits will graduate from the Queensland Police Academy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well done, Minister. Excellent work. Yeah, yeah. This is the largest graduating class for a number of years. Yeah, yeah. And earlier this week, another 120 police recruits entered the academy to begin their intensive training. Yeah. Mr Speaker, those graduating today are aged anywhere from 21 to 50. They have had previous occupations such as uh, cinema managers, carpenters, landscapers, soldiers. But, Mr Speaker, they all share one common trait. They want to serve the people of our great state. In total, more than 300 recruits will start training or graduate at our Townsville and Oxley Academies this month. I'm proud to confirm that Queensland Corrective Services is actively recruiting more officers and more staff as well. Almost 100 recruits will graduate from the Corrective Services Academy in my electorate of Anala later this month. They will be followed by nearly 100 additional graduates next month. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, I have spoken a lot about gender equality in this House, um, and my government has been working hard for a long time championing change throughout the community. We set gender equity targets for Queensland government bodies, and we smashed them. 54 per cent of Queensland government board positions are now occupied by women. Yeah. At the time of setting these targets in 2015, that figure was only 31 per cent. We have also supported women to thrive as leaders in business through the Mentoring for Growth Program, Advancing Women in Business Initiative and the Advanced Queensland Female Founders Program. We have inspired women to pursue excellence and leadership in a range of fields such as women in STEM, women in media, women in music and women in mining and resources. Yeah, yeah. We also recognise through the campaigning of nine-year-old Marlia Knox that not enough monuments and memorials were of women, so we are changing that too. The recent roar of women's voices across the nation has shown we still have a long way to go on gender e equality. It is not acceptable that women make up half of our population but do not share equal representation in leadership roles. Less than 33 per cent of the ASX 200 company board positions are occupied by women. Two of these, two of these boards have no female representation whatsoever. And while women make up half of the private sector workforce, only 18.3 per cent of women are CEOs and 32.5 per cent hold key management positions in the sector. Mr Speaker, wherever decisions about our business industry and community are being made, women must be at the table, because the more women are at the table, the more you change the conversation. That is why today I'm proud to announce that our government will be hosting three women in leadership events across the state later this year, in the north of our state, in the west and southeast Queensland. These events will provide an important platform for a robust discussion about gender parity on boards and in leadership across male-dominated industries and sectors. The events will also encourage community and corporate organisations and non-government boards to set their own targets for gender parity and broader diversity in leadership. Mr Speaker, we'll provide more details when these events are finalised, but this is another great step towards gender equality in our state. I call the Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. We got some fantastic news in the latest Labor Force data released yesterday. The unemployment rate in Queensland posted the largest fall in the nation, falling to 5.4 per cent. Last month in Queensland, more than 1,000 jobs were created each and every day. And at the same time, the participation rate increased to 66.6 per cent, almost half a per cent above the national average. This data demonstrates how our economic recovery plan is working and creating jobs for Queenslanders. Mr Speaker, we are lucky to live in a state that is home to some of the best tourist attractions in the world. From the Great Barrier Reef to Whitehaven Beach to Lake Mackenzie, people have flocked from all over to experience what makes Queensland a great tourism destination. But there's another gem that lies deep within the state, far from the coast. I'm talking about the famed Min Min Lights of Booyah. Over the years, 
Travellers have witnessed the mysterious lights, described as floating balls of colour glowing in the outback night. The government wants the rest of the nation and, when international travel opens up again, the world to experience this phenomenon. I am pleased to advise the House that the government will contribute $477,000 from our Building Acceleration Fund to renovate the iconic Min Min Encounter building. Bulya Shire Council will also contribute the remaining $52,000 to the total project cost of $529,000. The funding will allow renovations to the facade of the tourist attraction's heritage building, including essential disability access upgrades. Not only will the upgrades have a significant impact on the quality of Bulya's tourism offering and economic recovery and the region's tourism, but it will also support 19 local jobs. Owned and operated by Bulya Shire Council since 2009, the encounter is a unique animatronics and theatrical experience based around the famed Min Min Light ph phenomenon. Preliminary works to upgrade the technology and facade are already underway. I look forward to updating the House further on how this government is creating jobs in regional Queensland as we unite and recover for Queensland jobs. I call the Treasurer and Minister for Investment. Speaker, there can be no better endorsement of our job-creating budget and our government's economic settings than the latest ABS Labor Force data released just after question time yesterday. That data showed that Queensland's economic recovery plan is working and our budget continues that good work. Yesterday, Speaker, we found out unemployment, the unemployment rate in Queensland had fallen to 5.4 per cent. That 0.7 per cent drop was the biggest improvement in the nation. Speaker, the last time the unemployment rate the last time the unemployment rate was 5.4 per cent was in April 2012, and everybody knows what happened right after that. Speaker, the 84,900 jobs our government has created since March last year is the biggest labour force growth in the nation. Our labour market performance takes the number of jobs created under the Palaszczuk Labor government to 337,400. Speaker, that is 12 times. 12 times more jobs created under the Palaszczuk Labor government than under the Newman LNP government. Yeah. Speaker, what makes our current labor market performance even more remarkable is that unemployment has fallen while the participation rate has increased. The share of people in work or seeking work rose to 66.6 per cent in May, almost half a percentage point above the national average. The recovery in the Queensland labour market is attributable to the willingness of Queenslanders to stick with our health response, which has made us the envy of the world. Yeah. Speaker, and it is a reflection of the COVID-19 economic recovery plan, which is putting more Queenslanders in more jobs every single day. Yeah. I call the Minister for Health and Ambulance Services. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And as the Premier noted, yesterday the Commonwealth Government announced they had accepted the ATAGI advice to change the eligibility criteria for the Pfizer vaccine. Due to the growing body of evidence, ATAGI has recommended that the administration of the AstraZeneca vaccine be restricted to members of the community as 60 years of age and over. That means that the cohort of people eligible to receive the Pfizer vaccine has been expanded to include the 50 to 59 year old cohort. The estimated population of 50 to 59 year olds in Queensland is more than 620,000 people. Of that number, the data available to us suggests that around 458,000 are yet to get their first dose of the vaccine and will be eligible to receive a dose of Pfizer at a Queensland vaccination hub. This means that Queensland is now administering the Pfizer vaccine to Queenslanders between the ages of 40 to 59 years old and the 1A and 1B workers of any age. Clearly, an increase in the number of people we are responsible for vaccinating will have an impact on Queensland's component of the vaccine rollout. As we have seen through our vaccine numbers in recent days, our vaccine capacity has significantly expanded as we have brought community-based vaccine hubs online. While we will continue to bring additional hubs online in coming weeks, our capacity to administer the Pfizer vaccine is constrained by the available supply of the vaccine from the Commonwealth. Once again, I would encourage all eligible Queenslanders to book an appointment before coming to our vaccine clinics. I ask that people remain patient and respect the amazing work of the staff at our vaccine hubs as demand for our hubs continues to grow. Mr Speaker, could I also acknowledge the tremendous take-up of our new Queensland Travel Declaration, only announced yesterday morning. 
As of 6.30 a.m. today, we have had more than 22,000 people complete their travel declaration on the Queensland Government website. This is an amazing take-up. Uh, I'll take that interjection. They do all want to come to Queensland. The new travel declaration comes into a force from 1 a.m. tomorrow morning, uh, Saturday morning. We are already aware that tomorrow alone we'll see over 10,000 people arrive in Queensland. I thank the many travellers for embracing our efforts to keep Queensland safe. I'd also like to clarify that it is our intention that this declaration system will only operate for the duration of the declared public health emergency and will not be a permanent feature of interstate travel. This is just another way that the Palaszczuk government is keeping Queensland COVID safe. In fact, we have been asked that, Mr Speaker, so I thought it important to clarify. Mr Speaker, lastly, can I say, um, can I pass on a public thank you from Jeannie Matheson, a member of the Mango Hill Progress Association, who asked the member for Bancroft if we could give a thank you to our Auslan people who perform sign language at our press conferences. Yeah. Mr Speaker, on behalf of Jeannie, the Palaszczuk Government and all Queenslanders, can I say a huge thank you for our Auslan interpreters for their very important service. Yeah. Honourable Members, I uh, just wish to advise a, a, a further update. We will be commencing question time <laughs> at 11.11am. 11 I call the Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, geographically, seven United Kingdoms could fit into our huge state of Queensland, and you could nearly fit one United Kingdom in between Cairns and the Torres Strait within the electorate of Cook, so well represented by our member for Cook. Uh, I'm proud to be the ministerial champion for Lockhart River and Cape York and to work with the member for Cook to benefit residents of the Lockhart River community. I once again uh, visited uh, uh, the Cape uh, in that role last week, touching down in Weeper before making my way across to Lockhart River along the Peninsula, De Peninsula Development Road that links the two communities. It has, uh, uh, has some of the most extraordinary landscapes uh, in the nation, and it was impressive to see the results uh, that's being delivered through the Palaszczuk Labor government's jointly funded $276 million upgrade program. The extensive sealing works are being done by a large First Nations workforce in a, in a partnership including Bama, uh, Bama Civil. Uh, and one of the outcomes of our leadership and investment uh, in, a, in a second five-year program in the Cape is helping build capacity in these local Indigenous companies. Uh, Lockhart River Mayor Wayne Butcher is excited to see uh, the road improvements every year to, to make the trip between his community and other Cape, Cape Towns safer and faster, as well as uh, local bridge, airport and, uh, uh, perform <coughs> excuse me, and performance space uh, upgrades uh, that are either complete or being upgraded. I also know the member for Cook wants to see tourism thrive in the region, and improving this road will help drive the region's tourism uh, market uh, as well as more visitors uh, explore this unique part of Australia. For those unfamiliar with the Cape, it's difficult to convey just how far it is between some remote communities in Cape York, the Gulf of Carpentaria and Torres Strait. It means many, in many cases flying is the only practical way for residents to get to essential services. That's why the Palaszczuk Labor Government is extending our local fares scheme. It's already provided discounts for, of up to $400 per flight uh, on return fares for almost 100,000 trips an investment of about $17 million into our Cape communities and far north communities. When COVID-19 hit last year, it was a tough time for Cape communities and for travel operators in our regions. Flights were cancelled, planes were grounded, and uh, bus services in regional cities across Queensland and towns saw patronage plunge. The Palaszczuk government listened to these uh, industry operators. We worked with them and we stepped in to help. The, the, the government delivered a $54.5 <coughs> million essential tra transport services package to keep these regional Queensland services going and Queenslanders in jobs. Here, here. But as the recent Melbourne lockdown and positive cases in recent days in Sydney shows, the pandemic isn't over. And that's why we're extending our support with a further $16.3 million to keep regional communities moving. And this, and this financial year, the Palaszczuk Labor government is delivering $2 billion for Queensland rail train services, $658 million for bus services throughout regional Queensland, $34 million for ferry services, $16.6 million for air services in remote parts of the state, and $206 million to assist parents in meeting the cost of students to attend schools that are far away from where they live. Speaker, with these commitments and a growing number of regional uh, members of parliament in the Palaszczuk Labor government, this government is committed to supporting and developing our regions. 
I call the Attorney General. <coughs> Mr Speaker, I am pleased to inform the House that consultation has now commenced on the development of shield laws for Queensland. The discussion paper, Shielding Confidential Sources, Balancing the Public's Right to Know and the Court's Need to Know, has been developed to guide this consultation. The discussion paper is available on the Department of Justice and Attorney General's website, and I table a copy. Speaker, our government committed to consult on shield laws, and we are delivering. The commitment is a significant step in strengthening our laws to further protect Queenslanders when they come forward with important information. The discussion paper sets out key issues for consideration in the development of shield laws, including the scope of the laws, the context for their application and the circumstances in which the shield may be set aside. Alongside public consultation, I am also undertaking targeted consultation with key stakeholders. Shield laws are not just important to the media. I encourage all stakeholders, the media, the legal profession and members of the public to have this say, have a say on this important issue. Feedback can be given as a written submission or via an online survey on the Get Involved website, which will take approximately five minutes for members of the public to complete. It's important that we as government hear from as many people as possible. A wide range of views is important to ensure we get the right approach for Queensland. We understand that shield laws have been introduced in other jurisdictions, but this is now about creating good laws that work for Queensland and better protect Queenslanders. Shield laws are complex. They must strike the right balance between a journalist's obligation to maintain the confidentiality of a source and the ability for a court to have access to all relevant information in the interests of justice. We have committed to consider shield laws in the context of recent Queensland case law and how shield laws are applied in other jurisdictions. This process, in combination with broad consultation, is crucial to developing new laws. I look forward to receiving feedback on the discussion paper and thank all stakeholders in advance for their time and participation in the consultation process to inform the development of these important laws for Queensland. Consultation on the development of shield laws for Queensland is open for the next few weeks and will close on the 13th of July 2021. The government will consider all feedback received during consultation and I look forward to introducing a bill on this vital legislative reform later this year. I call the Minister for Industrial Relations. Thank you, Speaker. Can I wish the member for Clayfield a very happy wedding anniversary? Yeah. This budget and his good wife, of course. <laughs> Speaker, this budget delivers for Queensland workers continuing our jobs generating economic recovery plan. It delivers jobs as part of an economic recovery plan that is delivering jobs throughout Queensland and it builds on our record of protecting Queensland workers because that's what Labor governments and Labor budgets deliver. This budget continues our $6 million four-year election commitment to boost our Labor Hire Licensing Compliance Unit with eight additional frontline audit and inspector positions. These frontline positions will build on the success of Australia's first labour hire licensing scheme, of which we are very proud, which we established three years ago to regulate an industry that was unregulated for far too long. This scheme is lifting the standard of the industry and plays a very important role in protecting vulnerable workers from exploitation as the licensee, licensees must abide by their regulatory um, requirements. As at the 17th of June 2021, there are 3,447 licensed labour hire providers in Queensland. And, Speaker, I think at the time that the legislation was passed, we estimated that there would have been around 2,000, but now 3,447 have provided themselves with the licence required to operate.
The Labor Hire Licensing Compliance Unit has taken compliance action against nearly 675 providers who have not met the required standards. And since the scheme started, there have been 15 successful prosecutions with the courts imposing fines totalling over $820,000. In addition to protecting vulnerable workers from exploitation, my department is continuing its focus on worker safety through a comprehensive review of the Electrical Safety Act, a five yearly review of the Industrial Relations Act headed up by Linda Lavarge and John Thompson, and developing codes of practice in the areas of sexual harassment, psychological health and silica in the construction industry, and we look forward to working with stakeholders across all their sectors, from employer organisations to unions, to develop these codes of practice that meet the standards and requirements of modern workplaces. The budget also funds our four-year commitment of $5 million for medical research into the terrible affliction that is dust lung diseases, particularly silicosis and coal workers pneumoconiosis. Speaker, this is a budget that continues to deliver for Queensland workers, including underpinning the highest job growth in the nation. And as the Treasurer just outlined, it really is an extraordinary feat to have an unemployment rate of 5.4 per cent while at the same time increasing our participation rate. Those two together to achieve that in leading Australia is really an outstanding effort, but that's what Labor budgets deliver. I call the Minister for Energy, Renewables and Hydrogen, and Minister for Public Works and Procurement. Thank you, Speaker. Well, I love nothing more than standing in this House and talking about Queensland's renewable energy future, and particularly the job opportunities uh, that it creates for Queensland. Uh, Queensland's renewables are a cornerstone of our economic recovery plan and, of course, our Queensland Jobs Fund announced just last week. And, and Speaker, with the uh, Palaszczuk government making the single largest energy investment in Queensland history with this week's budget, naturally, we've got plenty to talk about. We're not only talking about our $2 billion renewable energy and hydrogen jobs fund, driving, driving uh, Queensland to become a renewables, hydrogen and manufacturing superpower. We're not only talking about last week's construction commencement at Kidston Pumped Hydro. Uh, speaker, that, that project will deliver 2,000 megawatt hours of storage and 900 construction jobs for Queensland. Speaker, because when you deliver a $2.85 billion, that's right, a $2.85 billion energy budget this financial year alone, there's always going to be a lot more to talk about. There are two other significant investments I'd like to highlight from this Palaszczuk Labor government's 2021 budget that will supercharge our plan to deliver cheaper, cleaner energy to Queenslanders and, of course, in doing so, continue our strong record of delivering job-creating, nation-building infrastructure. I'm pleased to confirm, Speaker, for the House that publicly owned Stanwell Corporation has secured land west of Gladstone to build its three gigawatt renewable hydrogen facility, Mr yeah. Speaker, three gigawatts. Yeah a signature job-creating initiative and partnership with Japanese industrial heavyweight Iwatani Speaker. Now, Speaker, this 236-hectare site will house what will be the largest renewable hydrogen production facility in Queensland, and it will create 5,000 jobs in its construction program for regional Queenslanders. Speaker, that means that there's even better jobs news on the way for Queenslanders. And even better than that, Speaker, what it means is millions of tonnes of renewable hydrogen exported around the globe, stamped with Made in Queensland. And, if, if, and Speaker, if that wasn't enough, there's more. The budget delivered this week provides $22 million to progress pumped hydro at Barumba Dam. A one gigawatt, Speaker, a one gigawatt, 24-hour capacity 
That dam will be, that pumped hydro facility will be the first truly, the first truly large scale pumped hydroelectricity scheme in Queensland. It means as well 2,000 jobs in construction, Speaker, because that's what this side of the House is all about, Speaker. 84,900 Queensland jobs now more than pre-COVID in March uh, last year, the highest job creation levels in the nation. 337,400 jobs created by the Palaszczuk government since coming to office in 2015. And it is this budget, another terrific Labor budget, Speaker, that will continue our strong record, Labor's strong record on job creating and, gener and the delivery of generational infrastructure and investment. <laughs> I call the uh, Minister for Regional Development. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, water is the lifeblood of our regional communities. That's why this government has committed close to $1.9 billion to water infrastructure since 2015, supporting over 2,300 jobs. Last week, I was pleased to see firsthand one of these projects when I visited Sunwater's Mariba Dimbulo Efficiency Improvement Program on the Atherton Tablelands. 18 Queenslanders are already benefiting from the jobs on this $30.8 million project, which aims to improve operating and distribution efficiency and reduce water losses for the Mariba Dimbula irrigators. Some water is well on its way to completing uh, construction by the end of this year, installing 14 kilometres of new pipeline and 130 automated channel gates across 17,000 hectares of far north Queensland farmland. Mr Speaker, I advise that these works to modernise infrastructure and increase reliability of the system are expected uh, to deliver a savings of 8,000 megalitres of water per year. Uh, Deputy, Mr Speaker, th that's, that water can be made available to local growers to drive economic growth and to create jobs. Growers will have the ability to better service a variety of crops, including sugarcane, bananas, mangoes, avocados, coffee, tea trees and vegetables. This is clear commitment from Sunwater to deliver projects that benefit regional communities and their e economies and that create jobs vital to our recovery from the global COVID-19 pandemic. That's not all for North Queensland, Mr. De Mr Speaker. Irrigators have to look forward to from this government either. As you know, Speaker, we are investing $9 million for three regional water assessments right across the state. The Tablelands is one of these, scheduled to commence early next year. The goal of these assessments is to identify the infrastructure and non-infrastructure solutions that will set our food bowl regions up for economic growth, prosperity and success. Because this government is focused on filling the gaps in our water system to delivering the right solutions in the right places at the right time and at the right price to give our regional communities a roadmap for the future. That's our commitment to regional Queenslanders, Mr Speaker, and I look forward Never to continuing to update this House on our progress in delivering it. Member for Nanango. I'll take an injection. How's the Bradfield scheme going for you? Is there any other government business? I call the Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, I seek leave to move a motion without notice. Is leave granted? Uh, Mr Speaker, I leave, move... Leave is granted. Sorry. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I move that the House set its rising to adjourn until 9.30am on Tuesday, 31 August 2021. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Are there any personal explanations? Are there any reports to be tabled? I call the member for Tui. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As Chair of the Legal Affairs and Safety Committee, I lay upon the table report number five to the Queensland Legislative Assembly for 2020-21 from the Office of the Information Commission Commissioner titled Minimum Reporting Requirements, Personal Interests, Gifts and Benefits, Overseas Travel. The report outlines what information ministers, Queensland government departments and their executives, local governments and councillors must disclose about their personal interests, gifts and benefits and overseas travel. I table the report in accordance with the requirement in subsection 184 in brackets 5 of the Right to Information Act 2009. I commend the report to the House. Are there any notices of motion? Honourable members, uh, question time will conclude today <laughs> <laughs> at 11.44am, I promise. <laughs> I call the Leader of the Opposition for his first question.
Mr Speaker, a question to the Premier. I table a petition to bring back breach of bail signed by nearly 18,000 Queenslanders. They tell harrowing stories of home invasions, sexual assaults, armed robberies and citizens living in fear. Will the Premier now listen to Queenslanders and restore breach of bail for young offenders? I, thank I call the, the Premier. Uh, leader of um, the opposition for that. Um, we've said very clearly we're not. We're putting over $500 million in youth justice uh, initiatives, Mr Speaker. We've built more youth detention centres and we've passed through our tough new laws um, through this House. Simple change. I call the Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, a question to the Health Minister. The Australian Medical Association says the Queensland health system is, quote, is the worst it has ever been and people are dying in a system that just can't cope. Will the Minister listen to the warnings about Labor losing control of the health system? I call the Minister for Health. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And Mr Speaker, I have spoken at length in this House about the uh, work that is being undertaken by health across all of our hospital and health services and working with external stakeholders as well. Uh, what about, what about the Barrett Centre? Can you apologise for that? No I'll, I'll ask that all, all interjections on both sides cease so that the Minister for Health can answer the question. I call the Minister for Health. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I have spoken at length about uh, the immediate injection we were putting in of the $100 million to uh, help address the pressures we're seeing on our emergency departments and our bed capacities across the hospital. Uh, we have just had the budget handed down this uh, week, which is a $22.2 billion uh, budget for health. Uh, we will continue to... Member for Denango, I've already cautioned you today. You're warned under standing orders. Minister for Health has the call. We will continue to work with all stakeholders, the clinicians, the nurses, health workers, uh, the executive, the board members across the state and external stakeholders like the AMAQ uh, to find solutions to the extraordinary pressures we are seeing. <coughs> extraordinary pressures. You know, once in a generation, circumstances we are facing right now. There we go. There we go. Once again, hiding under the doona. No recognition whatsoever of what is being faced globally, nationally and here locally on our health system. Those on the opposite side are in complete denial. I think it's worse than denial. I think they're deliberately, deliberately downplaying the impacts of COVID on the health system to meet their political... That's why they're doing it. It's their political agenda to just pretend COVID doesn't exist. It's not having any impact whatsoever. They groan every time COVID's mentioned, like, oh, it's such an inconvenience. Millions of people have died globally. Thousands of health workers around the world have died caring for COVID patients. Leader of the opposition. There is a community transmission and there's restrictions on access to aged care and health care in our hospitals. There is delay in elective surgery. Then we continue to ramp up that elective surgery, but that creates Member for demand on our bed capacity. And we see significant trauma coming in the door. And I can't stop the trauma coming in the door. We would like to stop the amount of people getting injured on our roads. And the other trauma that we Minister's are... Minister's time has expired. Everyone. Minister's time has expired. I call the member for Lytton. Thank you, Speaker. My question is of the Premier and the Minister for Trade. Will the Premier please update the House on what the Palaszczuk Government is doing to grow our booming screen industry and the arts to create even more jobs for Queenslanders? I call the Premier. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I uh, thank the member very much for the question. I know how much she values um, the screen industry and the arts in her electorate, especially when we built those new Hemant Studios. Um, fantastic, Hollywood and Hemant. And uh, Mr Speaker, they used to be the old uh, cotton sheets, Mr Speaker, so it's a great adaptation 
to use them as permanent film studios, Mr Speaker. And I think I've said in this House before that when they were first built, we were a bit unsure about whether they get the continuous bookings, but now they're booked out, Mr Speaker. In fact, Universal Studios has more than, um, pumped more than $100 million into Queensland. They've got Young Rock has been filmed there, and now they're doing Joe Exotic. So I'm quite sure that'll be uh, a very interesting, uh, interesting uh, production when that comes to to hand, Mr. Speaker. And um, and Mr. Speaker, of course, we know that it's all the jobs that are involved as well. It's all the carpenters, it's the plumbers, the electricians, the caterers. Um, everybody who's involved in that film industry, and it's giving our young people the opportunity to actually uh, get jobs in this industry, Mr Speaker. And of course the budget brought down $71 million um, uh, in the budget, $53 million for production attraction, $4 million for screen finance for domestic film, television and games production. Mr Speaker, you'll be pleased, $4 million for the North Queensland Regional Program, which I know you're yeah. our wonderful ambassador up there to grow screen opportunities and, of course, $10 million for post-digital and visual effects. So we want to get more and more movies here, and it's uh, absolutely fantastic to see that's bringing a huge boost into the economy. So uh, we've also got Ticket to Paradise coming up soon. They're just finishing Baz Luhrmann's Elvis. We've had <laughs> Lost City of Gold. Look, so many things I could say about those opposite, but I won't. Um, but, Mr Speaker, we've also invested in the music industry as well. We know that uh, Minister Enoch and my Assistant Minister uh, have been uh, meeting with the music industry, especially those live music industry venues, and we're putting $7 million there to assist them. Uh, that's something very important. I hear there was some live music coming from those opposite last night, but I won't say anything more about that. Not, not good no, no, no. I heard it wasn't very good. I heard it wasn't very good. <laughs> oh! I didn't know it was true. You know, you're confirming it. There you go. I just heard a rumour. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. Um, so, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to back the screen industry and the arts and the live music, Mr. Speaker, because we know that it brings about jobs in our local community and we'll always back the arts sector as well. We also announced $6 million for additional blockbusters uh, for GOMA. The previous time has expired. Uh, DJ Mini Minikin will cease his interjections. Julie noted. I call the uh, Deputy Leader of the Opposition. <laughs> um, Mr Speaker, a question to the Health Minister. The Queensland College of Psychiatrists says mental health isn't a priority for Labor, who won't listen and have cancelled meetings for two years. Why won't the Minister listen to the experts' warnings about Labor losing control of mental health? I call the Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for his question and I take that interjection from the Premier. This, you know, this question's just come from the party that closed the Barrett Adolescent Centre. So um, for, for those to, to criticise... Um, Mr Speaker, in addressing, in addressing the, member, uh, the members opposite, uh, can I say that in 2021-22, the Royal Australian New Zealand Council of Psychiatrists Queensland branch in their pre-budget submission acknowledged that Queenslanders, like three out of four Australians, <laughs> mental health was impacted by COVID-19. Uh, Leader of the Opposition, uh, direct your comments through the chair. You'll be warned under standing orders. Uh, Minister for Health Mr. has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. They should have read a little bit further down the article that they're going to use as their, dick, uh, to their question today because it said the date that I'm meeting with them. So it's, uh, you know, but anyway, so I look forward to that meeting that's already scheduled. Uh, but okay. um, I'm not sure what the two years reference is. I've only been in this role for six months. But anyway, uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. But... Um, the pre-budget submission says to date there's been no increase in the rate of suicide mortality in Queensland since the pandemic started, but health experts warn suicide rates could rise if Centrelink aid, job keeper and job seeker is cut. Like, that's actually what they said in their pre-budget submission. 
they linked the risk of suicide rate going up to the cuts in job seeker and job keeper. But you don't hear those on the opposite side crying out for any change in that space. Uh, Mr Speaker, the mental health effects of the pandemic will likely extend over the next few years and ongoing funding is needed. That is why, Mr Speaker, we have provided an extra $46.5 million to support mental health and wellbeing of Queenslanders who have been impacted by COVID. This is an additional uh, $61.9 million allocated over four years in our 2029-2020 budget to establish suicide prevention crisis responses Pause and the clock. enhanced services. Pause the clock. Uh, Leader of the Opposition, you will cease your interjections, you are warned under standing orders. To the members gesticulating in the House, I need no assistance. I call the Minister for Health. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And as I said, we're providing an extra $46.5 million to support mental health and wellbeing uh, of Queenslanders who have been impacted by COVID. Uh, this is on top of our 61.9 over four years in the 2019 budget. We're also working with the federal government to develop a new national mental health and suicide prevention agreement by November 2021. So if those opposite want to see a further injection for mental health support in this state, then they should talk to their federal colleagues and make sure that that National Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Agreement has extra dollars in it to recognise the demand. I'll continue to work with stakeholders and I look forward to uh, meeting with the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatrists. I call the member for Moneyborough. Oh, sorry, my apologies. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is of the Deputy Premier and Minister for State Development, Infrastructure, Local Government and Planning. Can the Deputy Premier outline how the government will create more clean, cheap energy in Queensland and is he aware of any alternative approaches? I call the Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for his question. I know uh, he shares the Palisade government's uh, vision for uh, Queensland as a renewable energy jobs superpower. Uh, when we came to office in 2015, there were no large-scale renewable projects on the books or coming. Zero, Mr Speaker. And since then, since then, now all over the state, there are new solar farms, new wind farm projects and more and more coming, so much so that we're now in the fortunate position where the Energy Minister is announcing storage solutions for all of that extra renewable energy that we are generating so that it can be used and not wasted, Mr Speaker. That cheap renewable energy will lead to a jobs boom here in Queensland. A jobs boom not just in energy but also in manufacturing, processing our minerals here so that they can be exported at higher value, manufacturing uh, the elements of the renewables value chain like batteries and electrolyzers here so that we can use them here, but also so that we can export them to the world. And that's why last week we held uh, in Townsville the Renewable uh, the Energy Jobs Forum, uh, and why the uh, Energy Minister and the Premier and I announced that we would bolster our Renewable and Hydrogen Energy Jobs Fund to $2 billion to, to enable to enable that clean energy revolution that is already underway, Mr Speaker. And that forum uh, was very successful and the uh, response to that announcement has been very strong. The Queensland Community Alliance says it, said it was the missing piece for transforming our energy system in a way that cares for our planet, looks after workers and protects the most vulnerable from price rises. WWF brought together 25 Australian businesses to say thanks for that investment. They said Queensland is on the path to becoming a renewable energy exports superpower. The Queensland Resources Council, Ian McFarl Council's Ian McFarlane, those uh, well-known uh, socialists over there at the QRC, said the fund was an incredible opportunity for Queensland in respect to manufacturing and the demand for new energy minerals. The Queensland Exploration Council said it's great to see the Queensland Government supporting the resources sector from exploration right through to manufacturing, Mr Speaker. All of that, 
all of that to create jobs right across this state, Mr Speaker. Yeah. I call the member for Mudraba. Mr Speaker, a question to the Premier. It is reported today that the Premier raised concerns about AstraZeneca at National Cabinet in April. Why didn't the Premier tell Queenslanders about this concern and was this why she delayed her COVID jab? I call the Premier. Premier, you have the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I am not disclosing what conversations happen at National Cabinet. Order. Member for Kiwana. Member for Kiwana, you're warned on standing orders. Speaker. Where members are finished. I call the member for Keppel. Mr Speaker, my question is of the Treasurer and Minister for Investment. Will the Treasurer please update how the budget supports reducing landfill and improving recycling, and is the Treasurer aware of any other approaches to recycling in context of the budget? I call the Treasurer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank the member for Keppel for her question. And like all members of the government, uh, the member for Keppel uh, supports ongoing efforts to reduce landfill and improve recycling, as the budget paper shows. Budget paper two. Page 98. Growth in revenue from the waste levy is moderating. Speaker, treasurers usually don't like a fall in revenue, but I welcome this. I welcome this, Speaker, because it represents people reducing waste to landfill. It means that our levy is working. Uh, but we do know what the alternative is, Speaker, because uh, we can't forget 2012, when the LNP abolished the waste levy and turned our beautiful state into the nation's dumping ground. Truck after truck, speeding up the M1, waved through by the member for Broadwater to turn Queensland into the nation's dumping ground. And yesterday, yesterday we heard the big budget reply from the Leader of the Opposition. What a letdown. Speaker, he gets worse every year. Speaker, and I see that he sent out, I see the Leader of the Opposition sent out, sent out his, his, uh, his friend, uh, there he is, Deputy Whip up, handing the questions up out the back. Can't take the heat in the kitchen, Speaker. Happy to wave the truck, Stu, but can't take the comments. He sent out his stooge from City Hall, Adrian Schrinner, to attack the levy. Speaker, these councils keep carrying on about a levy that, 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 that the Speaker, a rebate that they've already got. Councils should be so lucky, Speaker. They should be so lucky taking credit for a rebate that the Labor government is giving to households by for them. I don't know. Maybe we should put it on the electricity bill. Do something like that so Queenslanders know who's looking after them, and that's the Labor government. But anyway, Speaker, we know the LNP don't like the waste levy, but we know the Legal Division is a big enthusiast for recycling. Why? Well, I know it's bin day up in Lakes Creek this, uh, this, uh, today. Uh, thanks for the member for Keppel. Hello to everyone watching. There is one policy area where the LNP has been doing their own dumpster diving, Speaker. Now, they had the big release yesterday, the big release of the Social Entrepreneurs Loan Scheme. It sounded familiar, Speaker. That's because it was recycled from the Newman government. Now, the LNP, the LNP's Social Enterprise Scheme is an idea from David Cameron. That's what the member for Toowoomba South was saying, Mr Speaker. It was a reheated policy from 2013. People, you've had eight years to get this right and you're recycling from things you did eight years ago. Speaker, Through the chair. what have you been doing? I know you are in the nightclub last night, dancing away. What are you doing? You're not doing the policy. The Treasurer expect. will direct his comments through the chair. Under the gov but no wonder it was under the government of the Leader of the Opposition's idol. His idol, Campbell Newman, dumpster diving, pulling out the policy. Oh, a quick conversation with a member of the Surface Paradise. Like your tie today. Really appreciate how you've done your hair, Speaker. Look, this is a recycled effort by a hopeless opposition leader who is a complete phony. Mr Speaker. Uh, I might just remind members that uh, whilst it's a uh, convention to not uh, comment on a member's uh, absence from the chamber, I think their movements in the chamber are also not necessarily uh, the appropriate way to go either. I call the member for South Brisbane. Mr Speaker, my question is for the Minister for Communities and Housing. From the $1 billion housing trust announcement, only $40 million per year will actually be spent on social housing. 
can the Minister explain to the 47,000 people waiting for social housing how 3,600 new homes will be built with only $160 million? I call the Minister for Housing. Uh, I, 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 thank the, I thank the member for the question. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I think in terms of the uh, fact that the member for South Brisbane, this is only her second ever budget, uh, you know, it can give a bit of leeway in terms of being able to understand how budgets work and how that happens. Um, and certainly uh, my office has reached out to ensure that the member for South Brisbane can be uh, fully briefed this afternoon on how to understand how this all works. However, what I think is a little bit harder to understand is why the Greens are on a unity ticket with the LNP on this matter. Peddling this idea, this idea about not understanding how an investment fund works. And we know that's why. We know that's why. We know that's why. No it's on a unity ticket is because they helped the member of South Brisbane get elected. Honestly, Mr. Speaker, the LNP, the LNP, and the Greens are so slow. They are so slow when it comes to this whole idea of an investment fund. If they were any slower, they would need to get watered once a week, Mr. Speaker. That's how slow they are. However, Mr. Speaker, can I just make it really clear? They don't understand how the fund works, and I'm sure this afternoon the uh, member for South Brisbane will uh, get that information and will hopefully be across it. Uh, this $1 billion housing investment fund is anticipated to generate annual cash returns. Now, this is part of a broader set of investment that this government is making. $2.9 billion, uh, the largest concentration of investment in social housing in this state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is not just about building, it's about spot purchasing, it's about head leasing, it's about partnering with the private sector, it's about uh, pri uh, partnering with the community housing sector to generate enough stock to see nearly 10,000 uh, new properties uh, uh, added to the stock over the life of our strategy. So it's, it's a whole a strategy, a whole action plan that's looking at uh, lots of innovative ways to build housing stock in this state. Now I see the member for South Brisbane continue to shake her head. It's looking very similar to what the LNP do very regularly when we talk about social housing. Uh, they continue to be on a unity ticket. It's a great shame, Mr Speaker, but this side of Parliament, this government, the Palaszczuk government, will continue to be very proud of the massive the investment we've South. made to social housing. This morning, the Treasurer and I were at the breakfast that was hosted by QCOS. Let me tell you, Mr Speaker, the sector is absolutely ecstatic with this announcement, this announcement and they absolutely fully understand how it works. Uh, we are South. proud of this announcement, we are proud of this investment in social housing, and the sector is absolutely ecstatic, Mr Speaker. Mr. Speaker. I call the member for Tui. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is of the Minister for Education, Minister for Industrial Relations, and Minister for Racing. Will the Minister update the House on how the budget supports the expansion of outside school hours care services, and is she aware of any alternative approaches? <laughs> I call the minister. I thank the member for Tui, and as a father of two young boys, I know that his family often would um, use and welcome the outside school hours care arrangements in his school. And our $15.3 billion investment in schools and early childhood education is delivering for Queensland families, no matter no matter where they live, as part of our economic recovery plan. And, Speaker, our economic recovery plan has delivered jobs, jobs, jobs in this state, and there are a beautiful set of figures that we've talked about here earlier on today when it comes to employment growth in this state. Can I say with numbers like this, we are continuing to support working families with the services they need to participate in the workforce. As many members in this House would know, the workday doesn't necessarily end when the school bell rings. For women in particular, who still carry the primary caregiving responsibility outside school hours care is crucial to their full participation in the workforce. That's why I'm delighted to advise that our record 2021-22 education budget allocates $11 million to expand or upgrade outside school hour care facilities at 48 schools across the state, from Parramatta State School in Cairns to Currumbin State School on the Gold Coast. And I'm very pleased to be working closely with the member for Keppel, 
the Assistant Minister for Education, who is overseeing the delivery of these outside school hours care commitments, which will give parents the assurance that care is available for their children if and when they need it, before and after school, and often during school holidays. Outside school hours care was one of the first issues that actually crossed my desk when I first became um, Minister for Education Speaker. And since 2018, we have seen well over 5,540 extra outside school hour places delivered and created in state schools right across the state. We plan for them now in new schools and the member for Caloundra, when we've opened up the new schools, Baringa, we know we plan for those and we just um, visited Caloundra South where outside school hours care is being planned in the building of those schools. And um, it is wonderful to see that we um, are delivering for working families because with many of them now entering the workforce, they need that support. But, Speaker, when it comes to alternative policies, unfortunately there aren't any from those opposite. We have scoured their website. We went back to the election commitments they made at the October election last year, and unfortunately there is not one skerrick of evidence of an education policy from those opposite. If you want to talk about bear cover, Minister's time has expired. I call the member for Ujuru. Mr Speaker, a question to the Premier. Will the Premier confirm the Eastern Busway and Cleveland Line duplication will be included in the 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games proposal so that the Redlands can have the public transport it needs to provide Games venues? I call the Premier. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. We are working with the Commonwealth on the uh, infrastructure that is needed. Um, well, we are working on that, and we have a funding envelope that has been agreed, and we'll be prioritising um, uh, within that envelope the projects that are needed to get people to the venues. And of course, the venues are spread out across Brisbane, um, the Gold Coast, uh, the Sunshine Coast, uh, Redlands, Ipswich, um, Logan. Logan. There's also going to be there's also going to be a regional participation as well, Mr. Speaker. Um, but what I am very pleased about is the fact that the Executive uh, Board of the Olympics has recommended that the full um, cohort of the uh, Olympic movement uh, consider. Brisbane, Queensland uh, in July, Mr Speaker, which is next month. So fingers crossed, but this would be a great boost to the Queensland economy. It would be decades of, uh, de decades of um, uh, jobs and infrastructure, but also to think now too about the young people who are being uh, selected. And can I congratulate those young people, especially the Queenslanders in the swimming team that have been selected to go over to Tokyo. Um, They've been trying, and sorry, yes, I'll take that in injection. 50% in the Paralympic swim team as well. Um, this is going to be absolutely incredible for uh, our state. And I think that we wish all of them very well uh, for next month because um, it's, it's going to give the, the people of the world hope and opportunity that we can come together during uh, such a, a devastating time that COVID has placed on um, families and individuals. Um, right across the world. Speaker. Speaker. I call the member for Cooper. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is of the uh, Minister for the Environment and the Great Barrier Reef and Minister for Science and Youth Affairs. Can the Minister update the House on how the Palaszczuk Government is delivering practical, sensible environmental measures that are also creating jobs as part of Queensland's economic recovery plan? Uh, Minister, you have one minute to respond. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for Cooper. I know she's a fierce advocate for protecting the environment and the jobs that it creates. I'm very proud in this budget to be uh, the part of a government that's investing $1.4 billion to protect our environment and create jobs. And one of the biggest highlights from the budget is, of course, our funding for the Great Barrier Reef. We know two of the largest threats to the Great Barrier Reef are things like climate change uh, and reef water quality, which is why we're investing significantly. But we also know there's been some fairly interesting views federally from 
uh, the Morrison government when it comes to climate change, Mr Speaker. And I table some interesting comments we've seen recently. Uh, Senator Gerard Rinnick denying climate change and taking offence now to the Palaszczuk government's increased investment in publicly owned renewable energy. And I table a copy of that for the House. We also have Matt Canavan, who's now questioning the science of climate change as well as COVID-19. We also have the Nationals now saying that they don't, uh, they don't support net zero emissions. So I'm very interested, uh, Speaker, very interest, interested to hear from the Leader of the Opposition who delivered his budget response Minister's time today. has expired. The period for question time has expired. I call the Minister for Communities, Housing, Minister for Digital Economy and Minister for the Arts. Mr Speaker, I present a bill to, uh, for an act Sorry. Mr Speaker, I present a bill for an act to amend the Residential Tenancies and Rooming Accommodation Act 2008, the Residential Tenancies and Rooming Accommodation COVID-19 Emergency Response Regulation 2020, the Residential Tenancies and Rooming Accommodation Regulation 2009 and the Retirement Villages Act 1999 for particular purposes. I tabled the bill, the explanatory notes and a statement of compatibility with the human rights. Uh, I nominate the Community Support and Services Committee to consider the bill. Mr. Speaker, today. Sorry, sorry Minister. Uh, members can please leave the chamber quietly. Minister is introducing a bill. I'd like to hear the details. Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, the Palaszczuk Government is delivering on our commitment to put in place renting reform for Queenslanders. In fact, the Housing Legislation Amendment Bill 2021 fulfils two commitments to, one, deliver stage one re rental law reforms and secondly, implement amendments to the Retirement Villages Act 1999 to exempt resident-operated freehold retirement villages from mandatory buyback provisions. The 10-year Queensland housing strategy 2017 to 2027 includes a commitment to modernise Queensland's housing legislation and improve the regulatory frameworks that apply to accommodation regulated by the Queensland Government. Earlier this week, we released the Queensland Housing and Homelessness Action Plan 2021 to 2025. The action plan is backed by an historic $2.9 billion investment. Through the action plan, we will drive closer integration between government and non-government services to deliver positive outcomes for Queenslanders, including a focus on preventing homelessness. Importantly, the action plan also supports the progression and implementation of reforms to modernise Queensland's housing legislation, protect tenant and lessor rights and increase consumer confidence. Speaker, renting is an important housing option for the increasing number of Queenslanders who rely on the private rental market for safe, secure and affordable housing. Around a third of Queensland households rent and many Queenslanders also invest in rental properties. With more Queenslanders renting and renting for longer, rental law reform is needed to keep up with the changing needs of tenants, lessors and real estate businesses. The rental law reforms provided for in this bill will adjust and create new rights, protections and responsibilities for parties to residential leases in Queensland and follow a national trend towards modernising rental laws to better protect tenants and lessors. While addressing the challenges facing many tenants uh, and particularly vulnerable people in our community, the Palaszczuk Government also recognises how important it is to protect the investments of the many property owners who contribute much-needed supply to the housing market. Despite what some, like the Greens political party, would have, a, have you believe, many of these are mum and dad investors, not big corporate interests. The changes implemented through these reforms strike an appropriate balance between lessor and tenants' rights and provide a strong framework for parties to negotiate and manage mutually beneficial uh, tenancy relationships. The bill delivers reform for priority renting issues identified through extensive consultation with Queenslanders in 2018 and 2019. It is, formed by, it is informed by consultation with key stakeholders and the learnings garnered from the implementation of key elements of the Queensland Government's COVID-19 response for residential tenancies. Speaker, certainty about how and when a tenancy can end benefits both tenants and owners. It helps tenants to plan for their future housing needs and owners to plan for how they manage their investment. We heard through consultation that many vulnerable renters are reluctant to enforce their tenancy rights because they fear their rent will increase. They will be asked to leave or they will not be offered a renewal when their current lease ends. 
Research conducted by the Productivity Commission in 2019 also found that vulnerable renters are more likely to incur severe consequences from adverse private rental market events, such as involuntary moves due to unexpected tenancy termination. Order members. As it can heighten the risks of financial hardship and homelessness and disrupt connections with education, community and services. This bill prevents lessors from ending a tenancy without grounds and requires lessors to only terminate a lease using approved grounds. The approved grounds for renters and lessors to end a tenancy are also expanded. We heard that it is important for lessors to have access to a range of grounds to end a tenancy and regain possession of their property, including if they need to occupy the property, intend to sell or re redevelop it, or on the expiry of a fixed term agreement. We also heard that some renters may need to end their lease if the rental property is not in good repair or because they received false or misleading information about the property or agreement before entering the tenancy arrangement. Importantly, the bill provides that protections for renters against retaliatory actions for enforcing their rights will be retained and enhanced, including protection from retaliatory termination or rent increases. These reforms provide greater transparency and accountability and will help give renters more confidence to enforce their rights. The use of additional grounds to end a tenancy will be monitored, including investigation and enforcement actions to inform evaluation of this reform and determine whether further change is needed in the future. Speaker, all Queenslanders deserve to live in homes that are safe, secure and functional. In its, nine, in its 2019 research report, the Productivity Commission found that the rental properties vulnerable renters live in are more likely to have greater repair needs or major structural problems. Households that rely on government payments have a person with, a dis with disability or long-term health condition or a single parent or are more likely to live in housing that needs essential repair. The, product, the Productivity Commission suggested it its, in its report that vulnerable renters may be less willing than others to request repairs and maintenance because they fear negative consequences. Speaker, this is unacceptable. As such, this bill provides for basic standards to ensure all residential rental properties in Queensland meet a minimum level of quality for renters to feel safe and secure in the knowledge that living in their home will not cause them harm. Some of these minimum housing standards include the requirement that a property be weatherproof and structurally sound, have fixtures and fittings that are in sound condition, good repair, and do not present a health hazard with normal use, be free from vermin, damp and mould, have adequate plumbing and drainage, and be connected to a supply of hot and cold water for drinking. Ensure the toilet is connected to a sewer, septic or other waste disposal system. These standards do not require lessers lessors to provide luxury or high-end fixtures, fittings and amenities, but generally clarify existing obligations for the rental property to be clean, in good repair and fit to live in. Frankly, no Queenslander should have to settle for less than this. Strengthened repair and maintenance provisions, including specific repair orders that can be made by QCAT, combined with the approved ground uh, for renters to uh, terminate their lease if their rental property does not comply with the minimum housing standards provided for in the bill will support renters to enforce their right to live in a home that is safe and secure. Speaker, everyone has the right to feel safe and live their life free of violence, abuse and intimidation. The Palaszczuk government is committed to preventing domestic and family violence and recognises the important role that safe and secure housing has in achieving this. We know that domestic and family violence increases vulnerability to homelessness as people who are forced to leave their homes often find it difficult to secure alternative accommodation. People experiencing domestic and family violence are often at their most vulnerable when they are attempting to leave. In 2020, the Palaszczuk government acted swiftly to ensure that people experiencing domestic and family violence during the COVID-19 pandemic were supported to leave the home quickly and safely and avoid getting caught up in lengthy administrative processes. The protections allow a tenant experiencing domestic and family violence to end their interest in a lease with seven days' notice. The tenant can leave the property immediately and their liability for end of tenancy costs would be capped to the seven day, to the seven day notice period. Uh, the tenant would also be able to apply to the Residential Tenancies Authority to access their portion of the rental bond. 
Tenants can substantiate that they have experienced domestic and family violence by providing evidence signed by an authorised professional such as a doctor, social worker, refuge or crisis worker, domestic and family violence support worker or case manager, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander medical service worker or solicitor. This allows the tenant to provide evidence without the need for a domestic violence order or apprehended violence order. Speaker, there is strong community support for these protections. Domestic and family violence stakeholders have com commented that these measures have greatly assisted their clients and should be continued. The Housing Legislation Amendment Bill will make these domestic and family violence provisions enduring. This will ensure tenants experiencing domestic and family violence continue to have access to options to improve their safety and security after the temporary COVID-19 regulatory re measures expire and will align Queensland with best practice approaches in other jurisdictions. Speaker, pets are an important part of life for many Queenslanders and are often viewed as part of the family. They provide companionship, safety and physical and mental health benefits. We saw during COVID-19, during the pandemic, uh, that many people sought stronger companionship at home and a greater connection to their communities and pets delivered this for many householders. However, only a small proportion, estimated to be 15%, of rental properties in Queensland are pet friendly. Consultation with Queenslanders about their rental experiences demonstrated this is a high unmet need for pet uh, friendly rental accommodation but that lessors hold significant concerns about the risks to their investment of allowing renters to keep pets at their rental property. Speaker, the bill provides for rental law reforms that encourage more pet-friendly rental properties in Queensland by introducing a framework to support renters who, who want to keep their pet. These reforms will allow tenants to keep a pet with the lessor's written consent, which may be subject to reasonable conditions agreed with the tenant. Lessors will retain their right to decide if a pet can be kept at their rental property, but can only refuse a renter's request on prescribed reasonable grounds if they cannot be addressed through the application of reasonable conditions, which does not include a rent increase or additional pet bond. Speaker, the pets reform uh, provided for in this bill will improve rental satisfaction and security, encourage responsible pet ownership and provide greater assurance for property owners. Speaker, the Palaszczuk Government has taken the time to ensure we get these reforms right. We have engaged extensively with the community and sector to make sure we understand the issues, that our response is proportionate, finds the balance between the rights and needs of rentals, renters and lessors, and provides certainty and stability in the rental market. I'd like to thank the thousands of Queenslanders who have had their say about renting laws and helped to inform these reforms. We received more than 135,000 responses to the Open Doors to Renting Reform consultation in 2018 and a further 15,200 responses to the Consultation Regulatory Impact Statement in 2019. Targeted consultation was also carried out with key stakeholders. This consultation has also identified a number of other issue, issues which will form the basis for a future second stage of rental law reform. Speaker, in developing these reforms, full consideration has been given to the potential costs and impacts. <clears throat> Rent markets across most regions in Queensland are experiencing tight vacancy rates. Over the last quarter, Queensland has experienced the greatest net interstate migration of any Australian state, which has contributed to an increase in rent and house prices and tight vacancy rates. Housing affordability is an ongoing and national issue. However, Current rental market conditions are also a reminder of why it is important to carefully consider all potential impacts of reform measures. The bill I present today takes a balanced approach and considers the needs of all stakeholders as well as broad sector and community impacts. It does not simply respond to current rental market conditions but will deliver long-term certainty and stability in the Queensland rental market. Independent economic analysis of the reforms has been undertaken, which found that at the aggregate level, impacts are expected to be negligible and the reforms are unlikely to significantly impact rents, supply or affordability. In addition, significant economic, social and health benefits will be derived from these important reforms. The staged implementation of these reforms will also mitigate any risks of significant impacts. 
while domestic and family violence provisions will commence immediately upon assent to provide continuity of protections established through COVID-19 re regulation, ending tenancies fairly and pets reforms will commence on proclamation, which is expected to be 12 months after the amendments are passed by the Queensland Parliament. Following the passage of this bill, minimum housing standards reforms will have a longer transition period to assist lessors to plan for and undertake any necessary repairs on their properties. Minimum housing standards will begin applying to rental properties when a new residential lease is entered into from 1 September 2023 and it will apply to all agreements, including existing agreements, by 1 September 2024. Speaker, I would now like to turn my attention to the amendments to the Retirement Villages Act 1999. Approximately 40,000 Queenslanders live in retirement villages, often investing a significant amount of capital to do so. Previously, when a resident moved out of a retirement village, they were required to wait until their unit was resold before their funds were returned to them. However, these funds are often needed to provide for a resident's next place of accommodation, such as aged care. In 2017, the Palaszczuk Government introduced amendments to the Retirement Villages Act 1999 requiring village operators to pay a resident their exit entitlement 18 months after a resident has permanently left the village. In 2019, these provisions were expanded. These amendments uh, protect elderly consumers by ensuring that they had a maximum wait of 18 months after permanently leaving a village before they received their funds. These reforms have resulted in millions of dollars being returned to, to former retirement village residents and their families. When the laws were introduced in 2017, a review of the payment timeframes by an independent panel was built into the amendments, and that review was undertaken in 2020. The terms of reference required the panel to specifically look at the impact on retirement villages where residents control the operations of the retirement village. Unlike other retirement villages, residents-operated villages do not have a commercial or not-for-profit operator with the revenue and assets to cover the mandatory purchase of a freehold unit. In its interim report, the independent review panel noted that there are fundamental differences between the arrangements for resident-operated retirement villages and other retirement villages, which justifies its recommendations for these villages to be granted an exemption from the mandatory buyback requirements. The amendments to the Retirement Villages Act 1999 in the bill create a regulation-making power to exempt resident-operated retirement villages where listed by regulation. These amendments establish clear criteria for when an exemption is appropriate. They also create appropriate investigation powers for the government and notification duties for exempt retirement villages to ensure an exemption remains appropriate if the circumstances of the villages change. We have engaged closely with stakeholders on the proposed amendments who reiterated their general support for amending the Retirement Villages Act 1999 to enable a regulation to be made to exempt resident-operated retirement villages from the mandatory buyback requirements. The proposed amendments will commence upon assent of the bill, after which a regulation will need to be made. Following this, my department will contact the villages that may be eligible to obtain an exemption, exemption and help them to seek that exemption if they wish. Speaker, to conclude, the Housing Legislation Amendment Bill 2021 delivers on the Palaszczuk Government's commitment to deliver a fair and contemporary housing system that meets the needs of Queenslanders. Tenants and lessors will benefit from more certainty and clearer assignment of risks that will, um, that will provide for a well-functioning and efficient private rental market. Speaker, I commend the bill to the House, and, this, and Speaker, I move that the bill be now read a first time. The question is that the bill be now read a first time. Those that opinion say aye. aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Housing legislation amendment bill. In accordance with Standing Order 131, the bill is now referred to the Community Support and uh, Services Committee. Before moving on, uh, I wanted to remind uh, those members that are on a warning, the members for Nanango, Broadwater and Kiwana, uh, I also wanted to remind members of the requirement to remain in your allocated seating. There were some issues uh, during the sitting uh, yesterday. Uh, these are important rules in relation to COVID and we have a responsibility to lead by example. Uh, further, uh, 
I wanted to issue a general warning to the House. Uh, there was some behaviour last night when speakers, temporary speakers were in the chair of people continuing to talk when the Speaker was taking a point of order. This behaviour will not be tolerated. Uh, uh, it, when, a, when a member is making a point of order, you need to give the courtesy to the member making the point of order and to the Speaker to deal with that point of order. If you have something to contribute, you may rise to your feet and take a point of order. Uh, this is a general warning. Uh, we will not be tolerating this behaviour today. I call the clerk to read the next order of the day. Government business order of the day number one, appropriation bill and appropriation parliament bill, resumption of second reading debate, cognate debate. Speaker. I call the member for Water Waterford. Thank you, Speaker. And before um, beginning my contribution to the debate, um, like so many others, I want to put on the record my heartfelt condolences to the family and friends of Duncan Pegg, um, and especially to his Stretton community. Duncan built and united his community in a way that was lauded by MPs from all political divides. He was a true champion of multicultural here in this state. Uh, rest in peace, Duncan. Our community of Waterford is set to grow because of the government's commitment to economic recovery. If we want to invest in our future, we must invest in our schools. And that's why it is so fantastic to see half a million dollars for the Logan Homes State School Outside School Hours Care. I know it is an incredibly um, busy um, service and they're thrilled to be able to expand that for so many families in our growing community. Almost five and a half million dollars in this budget for new classrooms and refurbishments at the Waterford West State School, another growing school struggling with ageing infrastructure like so many of our schools across Logan and it's wonderful that they'll be able to get new classrooms and refurbishments. There's also one and a half million dollars for planning for a new secondary school in Logan Reserve, something that I went out in the community, families talk to me about regularly. We're investing in additional classrooms, uh, fifteen and a half million dollars for Mabel Park State High School uh, and another six and a half million dollars for Marston State High School. It doesn't matter which school you go to in my electorate, there is construction underway and it's wonderful to see. Work on the M1 is continuing with a billion dollars invested in the Daisy Hill to Logan Home upgrade. There's $800,000 for a business case for upgrades to the busy Brisbane Bean Lee Road. More than $1 million for improvements to the Waterford Tambourine Road and Easterly Street intersection, which is uh, very welcome news, particularly for those families during pick up and drop off at Canterbury College. And it's fantastic to see more than $3.3 million to continue the work on the new fire and rescue station at Logan Lee, something that our local fireys uh, championed uh, for many years, and I'm very pleased that we're delivering that new station for them. Women's safety was a key priority for the Palaszczuk government in this budget, with an investment of more than $155 million in tackling violence against women in the next year. And I would like to take this opportunity to just correct the member for Whit Sunday in her contribution, who consistently stated that our government has only committed $7.5 million each year for the next four years. But I repeat again, in the next financial year, we are committing more than $155 million. The $7.5 million is a continuation of the COVID-19 money. And rather than simply extend that, and rather than simply extend Order that, member. We have now lifted the base funding for these services so they can employ additional staff for the next four years, which is great funding certainty. I acknowledge that this is a system under pressure. Um, I do note that the member for Sunday also welcomed the contribution from the federal government. And again, I say that came about because of huge lobbying, particularly from our Premier, who has placed this issue on the National Cabinet agenda. Order, now, member. <clears throat> looking at what the $155 million commitment includes, it is more than $138 million to respond to domestic and family violence and sexual violence, including counselling and crisis responses, perpetrator interventions, court support, shelters, mobile support, awareness and prevention and sexual assault support. $8.1 million to continue and enhance specialist domestic and family violence courts. I'm very proud that Queensland was the first state to introduce these specialist courts. $3.5 million um, to en enhance the capability of community justice groups in 18 discrete Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander communities um, to support them to work with our specialist courts and to continue to support families experiencing domestic violence, and $670,000 to continue the provision of legal advice and representation to sexual assault victims. 
Importantly, the budget also provides $160 million in the next financial year for housing and housing support services for vulnerable Queensland. Almost a quarter of all Queenslanders who reach out for housing support in this state are experiencing domestic and family violence, and that's why I welcome the contribution to housing in this year's budget. We also have almost $800,000 over three years to the Working Women's Service here in Queensland to continue to provide free advice on work-related issues, and we are investing in the economic recovery for Queensland women. $320 million over four years for the Skilling Queenslanders for Work program, coupled with $140 million over four years for the revitalised Back to Work program. There's $5 million for programs to support women in custody or involved with the justice system to transition to a safe environment, $65 million for women's health, breast cancer screening uh, and other services. And I'm also very proud of the commitment in this year's budget uh, to um, my justice portfolio. $1.4 billion on delivering frontline justice services. Importantly, $4.19 million over four years for the establishment of the second coronial registrar team in the coroner's court. They work incredibly hard. It's very difficult work. Uh, and I'm very pleased that we've committed this funding, including $1.4 million to support the coronial inquest into the very tragic death of Hannah Clark and her three children, which will begin later this year. Importantly, an additional $4 million over four years to Victims Assist Queensland. They can continue to provide advice and financial assistance to Queenslanders impacted by crime. And, and I know um, the president of QCAT was very pleased to hear $7 million additional uh, for QCAT, a very hard-working part of our justice system, um, $7 million over two years. Um, they had a huge backlog during COVID. They're working through it, and that will certainly help uh, uh, curb some of the demand pressures that QCAT have experienced. Speaker, um, the Speaker has reviewed and approved my budget speech for incorporation, and as such, I ask that the remainder is incorporated into the record of proceedings. Mr Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Glasshouse. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. This morning we reflected on the life of a true Queensland great, Sir Lou Edwards, the former Liberal member for Ipswich. Yes, you heard me right, Liberal member for Ipswich, Health Minister, Treasurer and Deputy Premier. We heard how he epitomised classic Liberal values and principles. We heard how he used those values, principles, his intellect and talent to deliver for his community of Ipswich and for Queensland and Australia, including as the chair of Expo 88. We heard how he stood up to those who opposed his values, how he debated the issues and even challenged others in his own government. When I joined this parliament over 12 years ago, I knew I was joining an LNP team that included men and women of Sir Lou's ilk. And I knew I was throwing myself against some great minds who while misguided, were the best representatives of what the ALP believed in. Individuals who endeavoured to live out the words of Ben Chifley when he said, we have a great objective, the light on the hill, which we aim to reach by working for the betterment of mankind, not only here, but anywhere we may give a helping hand. This, Mr Deputy Speaker, was the intellect that I thought I would face on entering Parliament. Unfortunately, what we have today in the Queensland ALP is such a shallow reflection of this great legacy. And while, I fiercely, and while I fiercely reject many of the policy positions of the Australian Labor Party, there is a legacy Order in members. the ALP that deserves better than what they are seeing. This budget shows that the current version of the Labor Party is such an anemic interpretation of true leadership and true vision that it leads to no other feeling than pity for those who still blindly believe the Labor mantra. Because, Mr Deputy Speaker, of one simple fact. The current Queensland Labor government have taken vision and turned it into one of the most pathetic and disgraceful stains on our democracy, political spin. They've not treated Queenslanders with enough respect to say, this is what we hope to do. Instead, they have used trickery and deceit Instead of being honest and laying out the truth, they have used bureaucratic gobbledygook. They've listened to the spin doctors, the quiet backroom boys, and they are endeavouring to completely hoodwink the people of Queensland. Mr Deputy Speaker, just over three weeks ago, I rose to speak to the so-called Debt Reduction and Savings Bill. I referred to it as a work of fiction, 
I spoke about how the Palaszczuk Labor government were trying to con the people of Queensland. Well, they're at it again with this budget, but on a far grander scale. A centre point of their budget is the bogus sale of the Lands Titles Office. When you sell your house in Queensland, it's the Land Titles Office that facilitates the transfer to the new owner. You pay a fee for that, a fee that goes into the state coffers. Several weeks ago, in the debt reduction bill, we were told the government were transferring ownership of the Lands Titles Office from themselves to themselves for an anticipated value of $4.1 billion. I spoke about how I wanted to get in touch with whoever had done that valuation, because when you compare it to the leasing of the New South Wales Title Office for $2.6 billion and in Victoria for $2.85 billion, offices that, based on far larger populations, would be considered far more valuable, $4.1 billion sounded like a jolly good deal. Plenty of my constituents would want to know who the Palaszczuk government's valuer was, because that could hardly be described as a conservative valuation. Overpriced was probably more apt. Little did we know, Mr Deputy Speaker, that, not content with $4.1 billion, the Treasurer went in search of a better offer, a better offer at which to sell the land's title office to himself. And lo and behold, he found it, a whopping $7.8 billion. No if it sounds too good to be true, it's probably because it is. By moving the Lands Title Office from one form of government ownership to another, at a price of $7.8 billion, all of a sudden the Treasurer, Treasurer's balance sheet looks healthier than it really is by supposedly wiping debt from the books. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, no money has Order actually members. changed hands. I say that again. No money has actually changed hands. It might meet modern accounting standards. Just. But to be honest, if a private corporation tried this trick, their directors would be in an awful lot of strife. But sadly, the political spin, the fiction, the trickery doesn't end there. Firstly, the sham sale was designed to reduce the government's debt figure, but it hasn't actually reduced the level of debt each Queenslander must repay. It simply moved the debt sideways, not down. Secondly, this $7.8 billion transfer was supposedly meant to free up a whole lot of capital to invest in a range of funds. There was the Hospitals Building Fund, a $2 billion fund intended to build the hospitals Queensland desperately needs. There is the Housing Investment Fund, $1 billion to build the social housing our working homeless and most disadvantaged are crying out for. The Carbon Reduction Investment Fund, with $500 million for land restoration. The Path to Treaty Fund, $300 million to finance the government's work on reconciliation. And the Renewable Energy and Hydrogen Jobs Fund, overall $2 billion to assist the government-owned energy corporations to increase their ownership of commercial renewable energy and hydrogen projects. I don't know about you, Mr Deputy Speaker, but when I hear the term fund, I think money. In business, the term fund refers to the pool of financial resources available for near-term use. The organisation's funds include cash on hand, of course, available for immediate use, but also other liquid assets that will become cash in the near term as needed. If you saw the word fund, you'd expect to see something in it, a dollar figure, or in the case of a budget over four years, an indication that money was going to come into it in the near term. Well, here's another sham. These funds are political spin, scams, shams, swindles, tricks, frauds and hoaxes. Over the next four years, how much will actually be in the hospitals building fund? Not the $2 billion promised, not $1 billion, not even $1 million. There'll be nothing. Zero. Nip. Nada. In the supposed $1 billion housing investment fund, nothing. In the carbon reduction investment fund, Again, nothing. In the Path to Treaty Fund, nothing. I'll be fair, Mr Deputy Speaker, the government did set aside $500 million for the Renewable Energy and Hydrogen Jobs Fund, and there was already $500 million in there, but that still leaves the sum of $1 billion outstanding. Queensland, do not be conned. 
This government is not going to build new hospitals from this fund. This government is not going to build new social housing from this fund. This government is not going to restore land from this fund. This budget is not what the Treasurer, the Premier, the government say it is. It will not end our ambulance ramping and health crisis. It won't stem the debt. It won't work, in the words of Ben Chifley, for the betterment of mankind. Mr Deputy Speaker, it won't even build the infrastructure we need in Glasshouse, let alone across the Moreton Bay and Sunshine Coast regions, indeed across the state. In fact, the government has cut $4 billion from infrastructure over the course of this budget. Now, $1 billion equates to about 10,000 infrastructure jobs. That's the equivalent of 40,000 jobs that have gone begging, or more likely, gone to New South Wales. And at a time we need to invest in transport and road infrastructure. We have a burgeoning population, and particularly in the region I represent, that is de desperate for a better, shorter, easier commute. And if we're to host the Olympics in 2032, we need to catch up and get ahead fast when it comes to infrastructure investment. But everything mentioned in this budget for the Glasshouse electorate is either already underway or nearly completed, or in some cases, even finished. Projects like the resurfacing and road widening on the Diagula Highway, projects like the traffic lights at Biwa State School, like the new Mullaney Fire and Emergency Services Complex, projects like the Bruce Highway upgrades, which, by the way, were 80 per cent funded by the federal government, thank you, Scott Morrison, projects like the widening of Steve Irwin Way, again with federal government investment, like the North Coast Rail duplication, again with federal government investment. All of these projects are needed, Mr Deputy Speaker, but all have been announced multiple times already. There is nothing planned, there is no vision, there is nothing new. The government has not even brought forward the funding for the much needed Kennel Mullaney Kenilworth Road upgrade at Cambroon. It's still not slated to commence until 2023, 2024. There's nothing for Mount Mee Road at Ocean View, for lights at the intersection of Campbell's Pocket Road and Diagula Highway at Whamuran, for Mullaney Kenilworth Road at Widda, nothing for the Mullaney Hydrotherapy Centre and no mention of a review of the school transport system, one sought by the parents of students from places like Ocean View, Mount Mee, Delaney's Creek, Peachester, and many other locations, not only around Glasshouse, but around the entire state. Mr Deputy Speaker, this budget demonstrates that terms such as light on the hill don't belong to those opposite anymore. They've not lived up to that promise. They've not lived up to that dream, to that vision. When they use words like X, Y, Z fund and don't actually fund the fund, they show Order they for Logan. Mr. Deputy Speaker, when they don't actually fund the fund, they show they have abandoned these ideals in the name of cronyism, in the name of trickery, personal ambition and political spin. By the way, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in Ben's Chifley's speech where he spoke about the light on the hill and vision, he followed with a warning and said if it were not for that, the Labor movement would not be worth fighting for. Well, it's clear, Mr Deputy Speaker, Chifley's warning has come to pass. In contrast, a Chrysophily LMP government will deliver transparency, it will deliver services, and Order, it will members. deliver a strong Order. economy and jobs. It will deliver on the true legacy of the great visionaries of our political past, something that this Labor government can't. Speaker. I call the member for Algester. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I rise in support of the 2021-2022 uh, appropriate, appropriate bill, which is a budget that will deliver great outcomes for the people of Queensland. As a Labor government, we believe that all Queenslanders deserve a safe place to call home. Unfortunately, the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and an increase in interstate migration have made that more difficult than ever, especially for the most vulnerable in our community. For that reason, this budget's $2.9 billion total housing investment is the largest concentrated investment in social housing in Queensland's history, and it will deliver more homes for vulnerable Queenslanders sooner. With a $1.9 billion investment over four years, we are increasing the supply of social and affordable housing by almost 10,000 homes over the life of our housing strategy, including 7,400 new bills over the next four years. This is a net increase of 4,323 new social and affordable homes 
than was originally committed under the Queensland Housing Strategy in 2017. And we will achieve this through our new Queensland Housing and Homelessness Action Plan 2021-25. Supporting this investment is the establishment of a new $1 billion housing investment fund. This fund is a first for Queensland and it will deliver returns that will support increased social housing across Queensland and provide the certainty that our industry partners and providers have been calling for. The fund will have its capital value maintained over time with returns on its investments generating a perpetual source of funding, initially up to $40 million per annum. This will support the commencement of 3,600 social homes by 30 June 2025 through partnerships with community housing providers, non-government organisations and the private sector. Later this year, we will go out to the market to seek partnerships that deliver real housing outcomes for Queenslanders. As a government, we're constructing new social housing to boost our supply of homes for people and families across the state. In fact, of the total state budget uh, funding for housing, $1.813 billion will be used to boost housing supply. Our four-year action plan puts people first and is focused on increasing housing supply across all parts of Queensland by bringing real investment to the regions as well as South East Queensland. By doing so, this action plan will help us deliver on our plan for Queensland's economic recovery through the creation of construction jobs as we build new homes. As I have travelled the state, I have met countless Queenslanders whose lives have been changed by having access to housing support. This investment really is about people. It's about providing the dignity of a safe, secure home to those who need it most. With an investment of $60 million over two years to quickly get more social and affordable housing available for tenants and to prepare a pipeline of construction work for future years, we're moving quickly to address immediate challenges. Through the action plan, we have also introduced the new Queensland Housing Investment Growth Initiative. This initiative will support a quick response to emergent housing needs in priority locations. Complementing the Housing Investment Fund, our new Quick Starts Queensland program will bring forward planned construction and maintenance projects through targeted capital investment. The Help to Home program will also source private rental properties for supported head leases to meet emergent housing needs. Speaker, importantly, we are also working in partnership with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and communities and the new Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Housing Queensland Peak Body to respond to the unique housing experiences and aspirations of First Nations peoples. On top of the boost to social housing supply and in addition to our annual investment to address homelessness, an extra $94.9 .9 million over four years has been allocated in this budget to support essential housing and homelessness support, support services. It includes specific service responses for people experiencing and at risk of homelessness and women and families experiencing domestic and family violence. Unfortunately, Speaker, what we've seen from the opposition's contribution to the budget is that they fully intend to return to the bad old days of the Newman government. Their plan was to get rid of 90% of Queensland's social housing stock we know that Logan Renewal was just going to be the start and Gold Coast was next on their hit list. The member for Everton was incorrect in his contribution when he said that I supported Logan Renewal back in 2015. I absolutely did not. What I support is strong investment in more social and affordable housing, not the wholesale giveaway of public assets. The Leader of the Opposition talks about the rate of increase in social housing. We have built more than 3,000 new social homes and started another 448. But let's remember the position we started from. We inherited a situation where under three years of the Newman government, the amount of social and community housing in Queensland decreased by 428 properties. So we had to build back all those properties and then continue to invest. Meanwhile, the leader, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Leader of the Opposition has put the same person who was responsible for that decrease back in the shadow house, housing portfolio. Mark my words, Speaker, the worst thing that could happen to social housing in Queensland is another LNP government. They cut, they sack and they sell, and that's all they know how to do. And we can see from past experiences and from their words in Parliament this week that they would cut social housing yet again. Speaker, the 
Deputy Speaker, has reviewed and approved my budget speech for incorporation, and as such, I ask that the remainder of my speech be incorpor is incorporated into the record of proceedings. Thank you, Member. I call the Member Deputy Tui. Speaker. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, I rise in support of the 2021 appropriation bills. I am deeply honoured to be able to stand here as a representative for the seat of Tui, where we are extremely fortunate to have a diverse, vibrant and active multicultural community. If you want to see multicultural diversity working, then I invite everyone to come and visit the amazing retailers and small business operators across my electorate. I would like to offer my congratulations to the Treasurer, Cameron Dick, for his outstanding effort and once again looking after the future of all Queenslanders. School programs which have been rolling out – sorry. The budget is another great outcome for Queensland and its direct contrast to the previous cut and burn actions of the LNP government. Our Labor government is leading the way by investing in jobs, supporting business and manufacturing and looking after workers and their families and those who are vulnerable and disadvantaged while strengthening the future of, Queen of Queensland. As a re direct result of this budget, my school communities will receive a total of over $8.285 million for upgrades, refurbs and maintenance. McGregor State School, McGregor State High, Maruka State School, Sunnybank Special School, Sunnybank State High School and the Warrigal Rose Warrigal Road School were receiving over $7.16 million, and the remaining $1.12 million has been set aside for maintenance and minor works across all schools, and this is a great outcome. The students and teachers at schools across TUI will also see the benefits of Cooler Cleaner Schools program, which has been rolling out across the schools. This $477 million program is on track to be completed across the state by mid-2022. Some of my schools were recording temperatures in the 40 degrees in classrooms, and this wasn't good for students and it wasn't good for teachers. But all this has changed thanks to the Palaszczuk government. The program is well supplemented by the $168 million advancing clean energy schools programs to install solar panels on school rooftops. This is over half a billion dollars invested in improving the learning environments for students. The PNC associations across the schools in my area are very, all very excited because not only do they no longer need to fundraise to bring air conditioning to their schools, but they are also pleased the costs for running the air conditioning will be offset by installing solar panels. Their fundraising can now be targeted to achieving other valuable outcomes for the students and their school communities. Support has been given to teachers and teachers' aides since 2015. The Palaszczuk government has employed over 6,000 new teachers and 1,500 teacher aides. Compared this to the previous LNP government who cut teacher numbers and slashed frontline workers at schools. What a difference this has made. Here in Queensland, we now have the lowest teacher to student ratio uh, in the country. One of my personal favourite programs amongst these of of offer through our world-class education system is the program supporting at-risk secondary students to engage them and lead them back into learning, training or work. I have two schools in my electorate offering support for young people and a, and a third one just being, getting underway. The Sunnybank State High School Sunny Futures program is a wonderful program to engage young people in finding work. It, it was only a few weeks ago that I was at the school for the launch of the Construct Intensive Care Unit and the launch of their Community Service Gateway to Industry project. The dedication shown by the school executive and the teachers is brilliant. Carmody Southside Education is supporting young and vulnerable teenage girls to get an education which will put them in, good, in a good position for their futures. The, the Busy School is establishing a campus in Salisbury. It was tremendously pleasing to learn this budget includes an investment of $320 million over four years and $80 million each year ongoing for the flagship Skilling Queenslanders for Work initiative. Up to 15,000 disadvantaged Queenslanders each year will benefit from the targeted Skilling Queensland for Works program designed to equip job seekers with the skills, qualifications 
and experience needed to enter and stay in the workforce. This builds on the $430 million invested by the Palaszczuk Government since 2015 in skilling Queenslanders for work. Everywhere I go across Tui, there are people who tell me how great the Skilling Queenslanders for Work program is. This is the program the LNP cut in 2000. They just don't get it. Since Labor brought back the program, over 35,000 disadvantaged Queenslanders have been helped into work. That's 35 Queenslanders who have been provided with dignity through work. They can put food on their family's table, a roof over their head. You can't put a price on someone's self-esteem and dignity. But you also can't explain these concepts to the LNP who sack workers and cut back on programs that were helping people find work. Deputy Speaker, um, my uh, contribution has been approved, reviewed and approved by, the, by my budget speech for incorporation and as such I ask um, the remainder of my speech is incorporated into the record of proceedings. Thank you, Member. I call the Member Mr. for Deputy Ujiru. Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, I rise to speak to the 2021-22 budget. Uh, having been in this place for 13 budgets, 10 of them Labor, uh, I can agree that this is a typical Labor budget. It is a budget in which they are losing control of law and order, housing, the health system and of the state government finances. In terms of the state finances, we typically see debt and deficit blowouts a long-range surplus projected but not worth the paper it's written on, living beyond our means, high taxing, new taxing, investment in infrastructure is light and delayed and recycled. Regarding debt in those 10 Labor budgets, I've seen state debt blow out year upon year via the Labor way, because the underlying attitude is that it's only government money. You can always get more, we'll increase taxes on the rich, or just keep going back to business. Uh, business, the cash cow, because they can afford it, like there is a government money tree. This laissez-faire attitude to government finances means our grandchildren will be saddled with the government debt in the range of $127 billion and rising. So it says, let future generations of Queenslanders pay for the financial ineptitude of long-term Labor governments. Some have described this Labor way as stealing from our grandchildren. Mr Deputy Speaker, next week I will become a grandfather for the first time. Poppy Robbo and Grandma Julie will be pouring out love and gifts on Junior. But the last thing we want to do is to burden our son and his wife and their first child with the debt of our generation. But that is what Labor are doing and have been doing in now two long-term Labor governments, the, Bly, the B.D. Bly Labor government of 14 years roughly duration, and now this Palaszczuk Labor government that will be 10 years by the time we get to the next election. This government has been racking up generational debt for a long time, long before COVID, long before the GFC. These are systemic issues, and when will Labor governments learn to live within their means over the long term? and balance their books like everyone else has to, every family, every business and every government. Mr Deputy Speaker, building job creating, uh, building job creating big ticket infrastructure uh, items and keeping them on budget and on time is critical. We see Labor's rail fail at another level in this budget when we consider the Cross River Rail. The government's $5.4 billion Cross River Rail project has blown out to 6.8 8 billion and rising, despite assurances that it would be delivered on time and on budget. Mr Deputy Speaker, as I've said in this House and just this week again, Queenslanders are carrying the Palaszczuk government's failures on the economy like a ball and chain around our ankles. Labor went broke in the Bly era in a mining boom before the GFC. They lost our AAA credit rating. They sold $15 billion of assets and spent it all without paying debt down. And all, with, and, and, and all with debt hurtling uh, toward $100 billion before COVID. As I've said, their policies have stifled the tourism industry recovery, and they want the, the Feds to solve the problem they have partly created. 
Shutdowns without notice nor communication, like the Stratty Camping Ground shut down at Easter, hurt small tourism operators and other small businesses that rely on those bookings, and they rely on the certainty. And the workers that rely on the work remain underemployed. Mr Deputy Speaker, international education is also doing it tough. ABS data says that Australia's onshore international education sector uh, was worth $40 billion prior to COVID. It has fallen since to approximately $31 billion as at April 2021 and heading further south. Queensland has had a good share of that industry, but this government has failed to position Queensland well for when the international borders open up and we can take students again and rebuild this job-creating industry. While I'm no fan of Labor in Victoria, Victoria has taken steps to position itself comparative to Queensland for when the doors reopen. One step was to put together a detailed proposal for a quarantine hub, one that addressed the issues that satisfied the, the federal government's requirements to keep us safe and other logistical areas. In contrast, despite repeated requests for the same detail, the Queensland government was unable to do so and so has failed to establish a plan for a hub. So states like Victoria will be prepared and able to take international students once they are vaccinated and through the quarantine hubs, which will give Victoria an advantage over Queensland education operators, all while the Queensland government dithers. This multi-billion dollar industry will go south unless corrective action is taken. And I call on the, the Palaszczuk government to do better and to do more in this preparation. But the budget does have a little good news for the Redlands Coast. The Redland Hospital upgrade finally may be happening, though the ICU may still be some years off. But there is no evidence, sadly, of an increase in palliative care funding, though I still hope to hear further about that, nor plan to soon end the, the ambulance ramping uh, in this upgrade. In terms of marine infrastructure, I've mentioned the Harold Walker uh, jetty to be restored. Um, the budget papers also reveal in terms of Wellington Point High, something I've been calling uh, out for for some time, which is an upgrade to uh, the uh, deteriorating hall. Uh, the government finally appears to have agreed to that by providing $800,000, and I'm assuming that it is to that particular building, uh, though not, not clear yet. Um, it's not enough that it will help, and more detail we need to see. In terms of the Mount Cotton Fire Station, well, that's an absolute farce. Um, the member for Springwood, Minister de Brenny, promised a new fire station in Mount Cotton, in Mount Cotton, before the election, and he named the road that it would be on in Mount Cotton. But the budget papers revealed is going somewhere else, not to Mount Cotton's in the Redlands, another broken election promise. Mr Deputy Speaker, this budget was a missed opportunity for many projects and services that I will keep fighting for, like the Wellington Point Breakwater Project, uh, facilities and air conditioning for all of the schools in the Ujuru electorate, and that's a program that's going along, but going along very slowly in my electorate for some reason, slower than the three Labor members in the, uh, 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 the Redlands. I'll let people come to their own conclusions on that. Police resources for community safety sustainable fishing, including artificial reefs. And I've mentioned things like regularly about koala protection measures, uh, water quality uh, in terms of runoff into southern Moreton Bay, turtle dugong and other marine and fisheries research, and tar more targeted funding to North Stradbroke Island with the economic tr uh, transition coming close to an end. In terms of jobs and businesses, Mr Deputy Speaker, small businesses and tourism operators are doing it tough in the Ridlands, as I've said. Tourism has been hammered. The government must work more effectively with the Chambers of Commerce uh, and all businesses so that uh, all can prosper on North Stradbroke Island and the mainland part of Redlands Coast. And I've spoken about this several times and I'll continue to call for that. Uh, the funding to be returned to the, new, the um, North Stradbroke Island Chamber of Commerce that was cut uh, so that they can continue to support and help grow the businesses again that Labor has deserted. In terms of transport and roads infrastructure, major uh, State arterial roads in Redlands Coast are choked and clogged with traffic. State Redlands roads have fallen behind in, and into disrepair over decades. They need hundreds of millions of dollars to catch up. The State Government is 
conducting very little road work on major arterial roads. The Cleveland Redland Bay uh, Road um, is, uh, it is disappointing that the government is working at a snail's pace on this particular upgrade, the only probably one of or the only major upgrade of road that we can see in the budget at this point, uh, with only $14.6 million allocated out of $110 million promised in this budget. We need to move at a faster pace than that. They have also cut out the Thornland section from this project, meaning it is only a partial duplication, not the full duplication. One other section of road where our pressure did get help and provide a result was in the Gateway Motorway on-ramp upgrade uh, at Old Cleveland Road. With respect to the Cleveland line duplication from Manly to Cleveland, I have raised this infrastructure project many times and I continue to call on the government to provide it. It has been promised before by Labor governments and costed at approximately $170 million going back in that, those earlier times, then cancelled by Labor. So it will now cost approximately $300 million or even more. For Redlands Coast to participate in the Olympics via sporting venues, uh, it need, this needs to be built and work starting sooner than later. Also for Cross River Rail to be any value to Redlands Coast commuters, the Cleveland line duplication is critical and, ha and should have been built concurrently with Cross River Rail or even before. While speaking of the Cross River Rail, I again repeat what transport experts say that the government's promise of 14 minutes time savings of the Cleveland line is contingent upon the line uh, duplication occurring when Cross River Rail opens. As I mentioned in my address and reply speech, the member for Capalaba promised at an election that when Cross River Rail is built, it will save 14 minutes from the train commute to the city. Uh, Labor has not since repeated uh, that election promise certainly not recently, and locals are wondering if it's still an active promise or is it a broken promise. So I call on Labor to tell us which one it is at the next opportunity. But I was glad to hear the member for Kapalaba finally join my call for the Eastern Busway to be built in time for the Olympics. In the lead-up to the budget, Labor members suddenly rediscovered the Eastern Busway in their language, uh, and locals read that as a possible budget announcement. Hopefully this Donny-come-lately attitude actually has some substance behind it, not just Labor words. In terms of the Olympics, the budget has pr proved a missed opportunity for Labor to show us the money, to provide proof that they are going to be inclusive of the Redlands Coast in the Olympics infrastructure commitments. The evidence of funding, even planning, design, refreshed business cases funding, etc., even in the forwards and beyond for the Eastern Busway, the Cleveland Line and state arterial road duplications in support of the Olympics in the future so that Redlands can provide supporting venues and to alleviate the current congestion as soon as possible. With this budget opportunity now gone, I called on the Premier in, the, in question time this morning to confirm that at least confirm that these key public transport infrastructure items are included in the Olympics bid, in the proposal to put it beyond doubt and, and to even provide us with costings and construction timelines on these projects so that we know we have been included in the Redlands Coast and that everyone from the Redlands Coast, the City Council, the businesses, families, commuters, others, can start planning around these developments and pipelines of work. Sadly, today the Premier refused to confirm the situation. Locals are watching with a heightened expectation of Labor delivering, delivering, and I'm sure if this state government lets them down, they will send them a clear message at the 2022 federal election and 2024 state elections. Mr Deputy Speaker, in terms of health, um, I spoke recently on a motion and, and there's various uh, aspects of, that, of health in that motion. I encourage people to read, so I'm not repetitive of all of that. Um, but uh, we have this health crisis and, and Red, that Redlands also is part of. While I, um, as I said, I don't want to repeat everything I've said in previous speeches, but Labor are losing control of health in Queensland and Redlands, whether it's um, emergency department uh, times, whether it's elective surgery, dental surgery, mental health incidences, ambulance ramping, uh, palliative care provision. Uh, on every metric at Redlands Hospital, sadly, it's, it's blowing out. The Redland Hospital ambulance ramping has, has become as high as 51 per cent, which is as bad as it has been in our area ever, to my understanding. And the long wait just to get a car park, and that will be paid parking at best, 
Um, the government needs to also confirm whether they're going to, uh, what that fee is going to be, and uh, the, uh, whether the current free parking will be uh, all continued or some of that taken out. Under this Premier, like under Anna Bly, Queensland Health is a basket case and getting worse. And that's despite the hard work of our overstretched doctors, nurses and allied health professionals. The government claims a record health budget will fix it, but we've heard the same thing year upon year. If you, are truly, if you truly care about people, it's not only about money, but our frontline services having access to the specific resources they need and Queenslanders having access to a world-class health system. Then there's the, the, if, if the government wanted to do something further, there's the Redland Residential Aged Care Centre, a state facility right on the Redlands Hospital precinct. If you want to do something about bed blockage yourselves, you could do something and expand that aged care centre. That would actually be a great help. You could expand palliative care as well. Order, Finally, members. Mr Deputy Speaker, in terms of this state budget, it is a typical Labor budget that does little to get Queensland through the difficult times that we are in and is full of broken promises Order, to members. the Redlands. It provides little relief for Redlanders and doesn't deliver our fair share of infrastructure and services. Redlanders can only hope that the desire to hold a successful Olympics will force the government to act on big ticket infrastructure Speaker. items. I call the member for Cooper. Thank you, Speaker. I rise to speak uh, in support of the Appropriation Bill 2021 and start by congratulating the Treasurer and his team. Uh, Speaker, there is a lot to celebrate in this budget. It is a traditional Labor budget with record spends and in investment in health, in education, infrastructure, in jobs and renewables. Yeah. This budget is about maintaining a strong public service and a traditional workforce while creating the policy setting and uh, investing in emerging industries. And as we've already heard from the Treasurer, Queensland is in an enviable fiscal position and leads the nation across a number of indexes. This year, Queensland's economy will grow by three and a quarter percent, more than double the national growth and 13 times faster than predicted. 200,000 jobs are now predicted to be created over the next four years. Over this same period, unemployment projected to be down by five percent. And I'm not sure about other members um, in here, Speaker, but as the Treasurer was speaking uh, earlier this week, I felt you know, a real sense of pride uh, for being part of a Palaszczuk Labor government that is delivering such an outstanding budget and really proud of the people in Queensland who, without their um, respect for what was going on globally and certainly here locally, we would not be in a position to be delivering a budget like this. And I, I just was really overwhelmed by that feeling as well as a real sense of hope for our future um, and the direction of this state. And, Speaker, it has been a little bit disappointing, um, and I know this is, you know, kind of my first budget proper and, you know, there might be some expectation management that needs to go on for me, but it's been a little bit disappointing to see some of the strategies that have been used uh, by those op opposite to destroy confidence in the government. The LNP have obviously taken a look at the budget and frustrated with how fantastic it is. I thought, how are we going to possibly destroy confidence in this. I know we'll come up with a one-liner. Well, well, let's go with don't trust Labor. Well, we can't do don't trust Labor because we've done that before. And unfortunately, that didn't work at the polls. They were returned with, uh, with an even stronger majority. So we won't do that. Let's go with smoke and mirrors. And perhaps smoke and mirrors will help to dampen the enthusiasm of people out there. They've also realised that perhaps they, they need some kind of gimmick uh, speaker to distract people. Uh, where would we get some kind of gimmick from? I don't know. We're all pretty sensible people in here. Well, don't fear. We've got the member for Kiwana who has something special just for this occasion, some kind of chook raffle swinging games thing. I've never seen anything like that before outside of uh, a bingo hall. Uh, don't know where it's come from. Arguably, presumably, probably the back seat of his car waiting for the perfect occasion and for him to use some of his scrapbooking techniques. They've hopped on social media, those who know how to use it. I've looked at photos of MPs at desks with budget paper stacked high looking forlorn or confused uh, about what's going on in this budget. I'm, I don't know. Unfortunately, despite their best attempts, Speaker, it hasn't worked. As we've heard from the Premier, the, the Deputy Premier this morning, there has been broad support. Speaker, broad support by QCOS, MICA, AGFOS, it goes on uh, for this budget. And I've been on the phone to people in my electorate, I can tell you that they are excited about what this budget offers uh, yeah. and what it will offer not only them locally, uh, across the Brisbane city area, but across this entire state. 
So not, um, not willing to give up easily. The LNP have obviously got on the phone and they've called up their friends, the Greens political party. And I took a look at, I took a look at the post um, from, from those opposite and I thought the, the member for Maywar, I thought, did a, did a reasonable job actually at trying to unpack um, the budget and what that meant for his electorate. You know, we didn't all get everything that we wanted and I thought he did a reasonable job. Uh, at, at particularising that. Um, I was disappointed to see the member for South Brisbane who had unfortunately drunk the Kool-Aid and she was picking up this uh, LNP smoke and mirrors message. She was initially happy speaker with the budget but unfortunately then changed track and went with smoke and mirrors. And, but speaker, it really shouldn't surprise us because the Greens political party would know about smoke and mirrors. They are the party, after all, who went to the election on the mantra that we don't accept corporate donations. However, only a few years ago accepted the largest single political donation made by a corporation in Australia at that time. But let's not tell, let's not uh, tell uh, voters, let's not tell voters that. Let's not get the Greens political party's entire campaign strategy is one of smoke and mirrors. They're right. It is politics done differently. It's done with less transparency, less accountability and less integrity. But, Speaker, I digress. Like I was saying, there's a lot to celebrate in this budget, including a $50 billion infrastructure guarantee, ensuring that vital infrastructure and job creating projects will go ahead. We're giving permanency to our skilling Queenslanders for work and back to work yeah. programs to help address the current labour shortages that I know are being faced right throughout the state, including in my electorate of Cooper. Two billion in commercial renewable energy and hydrogen projects to help provide cheaper, cleaner, reliable energy to Queenslanders while driving down carbon emissions. Some of the strongest environmental protections in the nation, including 500 million carbon reduction investment fund. The proceeds of this fund will provide certainty for land restoration projects now and into the future. 270 million over five years to maintain the Queensland reef water quality program and I had the, the benefit of hearing from the WWF um, last week about some of the impacts that they're seeing that program is having, uh, particularly with local farmers changing some of their practices. They're able to diversify and compete locally and globally. We're cleaning up the waters, we're cleaning up habitats, we're restoring ecosystems. It's a fantastic program. We're continuing to set aside funding for the management of native title compensation claims in Queensland, an essential measure as we move towards truth-telling. Continued support of people with a disability in Queensland, $22.7 million to support peak and advocacy services in the disability sector, which we know is really very vital. I've met with a number of, um, of advocates in the disability sector. I know they really do rely on that. <clears throat> Near record investment of six. 6.1 billion in discount, discounts, rebates, subsidies and concessions. Uh, it's about putting money back into the hip pockets of, of people. Continued focus on women's issues and safety, including 155 million to tackle domestic and family violence, including the continuation of the Women's Safety and Justice Task Force. Mm -hmm. Speaker, I'm particularly thrilled about our announcement um, to establish a $300 million path to treaty fund and have to acknowledge particularly the work of the Treaty Advancement Committee, Dr Jackie Huggins, who calls my electorate of Cooper her home, uh, Mick Gooder, Michael Labarch, Josephine Bourne and Sally Ann Atkinson. I, I got to spend a few moments uh, with the Minister and with Jackie after the Treasurer's announcement and she had tears in her eyes and said she hadn't uh, expected, expected that and I think all of us on this side are really thrilled with what that announcement has brought. Um, people in Cooper will benefit from a number of citywide projects. The Cross River Rail, a $6.8 billion project fully funded by the state government, will transform how we move around Brisbane. $2 billion hospital building fund creating an additional 174 beds in South East Queensland and the delivery of satellite hospitals in Bribie, Caboolture, Brisbane South, Pine Rivers, Ipswich and Redlands that will absolutely take the pressures off RBH. Uh, for us. 2.6 billion building future schools program delivering a further 10 schools again to ease the pressures off our inner city uh, schools. 2.9 billion total housing investment, the largest concentrated investment in social housing in Queensland's history. And I know this is something that people speak to me about and we're all very passionate about, uh, making sure that we're getting vulnerable people into Queensland homes sooner. We're continuing our investment in the arts, delivering 175 million new state-of-the-art theatre uh, for Brisbane, co-located with, with QPAC and contributing a further 7 million to extend our live music venue support. And a number of uh, venues in my electorate have, have benefited from that. I know how vital it is, particularly for the inner city suburbs. Um, <clears throat> continued investment 
in uh, stadiums, including the Ballymore Precinct, which will undergo a major redevelopment, transforming it into a home for the National Rugby Training Centre, Women's Rugby Pacific Pathways Program, Queensland Res and Queensland Rugby Union. And, Speaker, it's easy to imagine with this investment that a 10-year-old in my electorate playing now for Jeeps Rugby, rugby who um, has also benefited in this budget, um, could go on to represent Australia at the 2032 Olympics. It's such a, a phenomenal time to be a Queenslander. Um, <coughs> speaker, the Speaker has reviewed and approved my budget speech for incorporation, and as such, I ask that the remainder of my speech is incorporated into the record of proceedings. Thank you, Member. Uh, it being close to the uh, time for lunch, the House will now rise for lunch and resume at uh, 2 p.m. Madam Deputy Speaker. Call the member for Barron River. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The 2021-22 state budget delivers a solid plan to protect our health, create jobs and work together as Queenslanders to recover from the economic impact of COVID-19. We've seen our Queensland recovers economically faster than other states and countries around the world. This has only been possible due to the Palaszczuk government's sensible and stage approach to mitigating the pandemic's impact on Queenslanders and the efforts made by Queenslanders to contain the virus by following the health advice and supporting each other through the pandemic. I particularly want to acknowledge the efforts of uh, local government mayors who worked with us to ensure that there was not one single case of COVID-19 in a remote or discreet Indigenous community in Queensland. Yeah, yeah. This budget outlines the, contained, oh, sorry, the continued steps that the Palaszczuk government is taking to build on that recovery effort. This state budget demonstrates the Palaszczuk government's commitment to continue supporting and safeguarding Queensland communities. It supports the delivery of the promises we made to the people of Queensland at the last election, especially our most vulnerable, our seniors, our Queensland with, Queenslanders with disability and our First Nations Queenslanders. Through this state budget, we're providing funding that will enable Queenslanders, regardless of their ability, age or where they live, to participate and be included in their communities to be resilient and to enjoy social well-being and economic security. The COVID pandemic has seen our state having to implement a savings and debt plan. Fortunately, my department will achieve its savings targets without affecting frontline services for our seniors, for people with disability or for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Queensland seniors have repeatedly acknowledged the efforts of the Palaszczuk government to keep them safe during the height of the COVID pandemic. Ensuring Queensland seniors can live their lives free from physical, emotional and financial abuse and scams is a top priority for this government. Unlike those opposite, who had no minister for seniors, who slashed the Office of Seniors' budget by 63 per cent, who planned to scrap pensioner concessions, leaving seniors on a fixed income, looking at significantly reduced quality of life just to pay their bills, and had no policy plans to make Queenslanders' seniors' lives better or recognise the contribution that they make to our state and to their communities. The Palaszczuk government is continuing to provide $423 million in seniors' concessions and rebates to more than 839,000 seniors' cardholders. This supports our seniors to access medical aid, to pay their power bills, their car registration, or to access public transport, and to access museums and galleries, also helping to reduce the, efforts of, or the effects sorry, of social isolation. We know that older people are vulnerable to exploitation and abuse as a result of ageing and the fear of homelessness and social isolation. Elder abuse is an abhorrent act which causes harm to an older person and, sadly, is most often perpetrated by a family member or a friend. Earlier this week, on the 15th of June, we launched our annual Elder Abuse Awareness Campaign to mark the anniversary of World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. Yeah. The theme for this year's campaign is together we can stop elder abuse. The Palaszczuk government is committed to doing our bit to stop elder abuse and to raising awareness of this issue in our communities. 
And this is why we are investing $4.8 million over four years and $1.2 million per year ongoing for seniors, legal and support services, financial protection advice and scams and fraud protection helpline for our seniors. In 2012, we saw the LNP cut $642 million from disability services and $368 million from NGOs providing disability supports. The Palaszczuk government is committed to supporting the almost 96,000 Queenslanders with disability. The state's role in disability services changed significantly since the transition to the NDIS full scheme agreement in October last year. That's why we're providing funding of $14.6 million over four years and $3.6 million ongoing to support peak and representative bodies to build the capacity of the disability and community care sector to deliver viable, cost-effective and quality services. We're working proactively with the Commonwealth through Minister Reynolds and all jurisdictions to ensure that Queensland government investment of more than $2 billion annually is delivering the reasonable and necessary supports that the Queenslanders living with disability require. We are also continuing to invest in positive behavioural support for Queenslanders with disability by providing funding of $6.6 million over two years from 2021-2022. There are some Queenslanders with disability who are not eligible for the NDIS. Funding of $7.3 million over four years and $1.8 million ongoing will provide support for disability services clients who are ineligible for services under the NDIS, as well as funding of $5.1 million over four years and $1.3 million ongoing to advance disability services functions. And we recognise the importance of advocacy, advocacy to ensure Queenslanders with disability have access to the supports they need, whether they are eligible to access the NDIS or not. This year's state budget will boost disability advocacy services to assist Queenslanders with disabilities to access mainstream services, safeguard wellbeing and to assist with NDIS related issues, thanks to additional funding of $8.1 million over two years, commencing in 2021-2022. This funding will assist people like Elliot, a 10-year-old with multiple cognitive impairments and living in a regional community who had previously attempted to access the NDIS, however, was not able to source the necessary clinical assessments to provide the evidence to meet the NDIS access requirements. Thanks to those who advocated for Elliot, his application is now approved, assisting him and his family to connect with local support services for the very first time. The Palaszczuk government recognises the importance of Queensland's rich Indigenous culture. That's why we are investing in the health and wellbeing of the needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Queenslanders. We understand that education is critical to securing positive futures for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people. This budget provides a funding boost of $4 million in 2021-22 to the Queensland Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Foundation to increase educational choices for First Nations Queenslanders. We know that overcrowding housing is a critical factor in the disadvantage experience within Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. In addition to the record $2.9 billion investment in social housing for Queensland, the Queensland Government will inject funding for $4.5 million to address land administration requirements and land and infrastructure program planning initiatives in remote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. This investment will contribute to closing the gap and enable home ownership for First Nations Queenslanders in their communities. We are investing funding of $800,000 over four years and $200,000 ongoing to implement the Indigenous Language Policy and Indigenous Language Grants Program, supporting the preservation, revitalisation and maintenance of Indigenous languages. I also acknowledge the contributions that are included in this year's budget from other portfolio areas delivering outcomes for First Nations Queenslanders, including those investments that support Indigenous employment and entrepreneurship, community development, and access to justice. And I'm happy to see ongoing support for the Murray Courts and the extension of the local fares scheme, both of which the LNP cut. In our ongoing efforts to reframe the relationship with First Nations Queenslanders and promote reconciliation, we've committed $27.6 million to managing native title compensation claims and a further $1 million in additional funding over four years and $300,000 ongoing for the continuation of reconciliation initiatives, including the Celebrating Reconciliation Grants Program and funding for Reconciliation Queensland Incorporated. As the Premier has said, ensuring that reconciliation is more than a word, the Palaszczuk Government is putting our money where our mouth is. 
We recognise that reconciliation must be grounded in genuine commitment and actions that facilitate truth-telling and healing. The establishment of a $300 million path to treaty fund honours those who for generations have called for treaty. It honours the knowledge, the contribution and the commitment of those 1,700 community members who contributed to the treaty report and its recommendations. And it honours the work that the Treaty Advancement Committee and Queenslanders are currently doing to progress the path to treaty. Returns will be used to support path to treaty actions and the government's response to the Treaty Advancement Committee report expected to be provided to government later this year. I'm very happy also with what this budget delivers for my electorate and the people of Barron River. Firstly, I know the Barron River locals will be happy that we've secured a million dollars towards a much needed upgrade to facilities at a local not-for-profit animal shelter, the Young Animal Protection Society, also known as YAPS, and $500,000 will flow in this year's budget towards that. The local boaties will be happy to know that $4.6 million has been allocated to construct the Yorkies Knob boat ramp and floating walkways. And for the, our Coranda friends uh, up the hill, I'm pleased to announce $12 million has been allocated for the Coranda Range and Kennedy Highway Intelligent Transport System, or ITS, to improve safety and reduce the number of crashes on this stretch of road. Along with that, over $1.3 million has been set aside for a study of the Barron River Bridge upgrade up at Coranda. The Palaszczuk government continues to deliver for education, with just over $2.5 million for ongoing works on Barron River schools, including upgrading halls at the Red Lynch State College Junior and Senior campuses, creating a new out-of-hours care facility at Machen's Beach and new learning spaces at Freshwater State School. A further $9.9 million will go towards construction of the 94-kilometre Wangedi Trail. This will not only increase local tourism and create jobs, but also provide a huge economic benefit for First Nations people, including the Irukandji people, welcoming visitors to their country and providing cultural education for future generations. The Cairns Hospital will receive a further $46.1 million towards a new mental health unit, expansion of the emergency department, and to continue with ongoing hospital improvements, including progression towards the Cairns University Hospital. The Cairns region wins from this budget with fantastic new infrastructure and capital works projects estimated to support around 3,900 jobs in this region. But last and certainly not least, I'm extremely excited to say this budget will provide the final $31 million out of the $164 million to complete the Smithfield bypass. Yeah, yeah. Also, $10 million has been allocated to continue upgrading the Cairns Western Arterial Road and $14 million to upgrade and expand the Captain Cook Highway. I can assure the residents of my electorate the Palaszczuk government takes improving our roads seriously. It is great to see the federal government come on board and contribute to funding for these arterials. I certainly welcome their support in helping to ease congestion in Barron River, and I'm pleased that the Queensland government contributions are locked in over the forward estimates. In conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Palaszczuk government is committed to creating strong, inclusive Queensland communities uh, where everyone has an opportunity to succeed and to grow. I support the budget. Yeah. Acting Speaker. Call the member for Maywa. Madam Acting Speaker, I rise to make my contribution on the 2021-22 budget bills. This budget is like every other I've seen over the last few years. It includes some really welcome spending on important issues, but there is so much more that it doesn't do. It's the case year after year that these budgets represent a missed opportunity for Queenslanders. This budget was an opportunity for Labor to show some courage, for bold ideas to drive our economic recovery, but they're playing it safe instead. Now, playing it safe might be great as an election strategy, but Queenslanders deserve more than that. They deserve funding commitments that actually stand up to scrutiny, unlike the renewables and social housing numbers the government is touting, and they deserve a government with the courage to make big corporations pay a fair share. The fact is that over the last financial year, the wealthiest corporations in the state only got richer. Mining corporations still exported a whopping $45 billion worth of resources from Queensland. And despite all the talk about royalties falling, coal royalties figures are comparable to what they were as recently as 2015 or 16. So when the QRC or whoever else it is that's writing the government's talking points for them says those corporations can't afford to pay a little bit more, in fact they deserve a freeze on royalties, it is nonsense. But it's not just mining royalties. Labor's Victorian colleagues have recently introduced a developer tax, just like we have been proposing for years now. That could raise billions of dollars in a budget like this. Or they could raise more than a billion dollars a year by imposing a modest levy 
on the big banks just like their South Australian counterparts proposed. The reason this budget doesn't include higher mining royalties or a levy on big banks and developers is not because of COVID, and it's not because these corporations can't afford it. It's because those corporations own labour just like they own the LNP. I wonder if that's also why they have to preface every commitment to renewable energy with a desperate reassurance that they still back fossil fuels. They're clearly still trying to walk that line between working with the environment sector and appeasing their big coal donors. Now, don't get me wrong, it's great that the government is finally putting some extra money towards renewables, but the numbers we've heard are phony. Despite all the media announcements about the $2 billion renewable energy and hydrogen jobs fund, that's just not what the budget says. Only half the much hyped $2 billion fund is actually committed before the next election, and just $500 million of that is actually new money. The other half was already allocated under a different name. So instead of $2 billion, we're actually only looking at one quarter of that amount that's actually new and committed in this budget. Now, I'll leave aside the fact that we need far more ambitious investment in publicly owned renewables for the moment. But if it's $500 million of new money, why not just say that it's $500 million of new money rather than peddling over inflated figures? Now, I do acknowledge and applaud the $145 million of spending on renewable energy zones, including $5 million of new money to connect more renewables to the grid. Now, $500 million or $5 million, whatever it is, new money is better than nothing, but it's completely undermined by the government's support for new coal and gas. Last budget, in 2021, Labor oversaw Stanwell and CS Energy spending $312 million just on upgrades, maintenance and overhauls for the publicly owned coal-fired power stations and the publicly owned coal mines that feed them. This financial year, they'll spend another $229 million keeping those power stations going. Now that's more than Cleanco will spend on building new renewable energy. It's also more than the $225 million to be spent from the new Renewable Energy and Hydrogen Jobs Fund. Newish. If the government spends $200 million, as one estimate has it, $200 million of taxpayer dollars rebuilding the exploded coal-fired power station, it would just be throwing good money after bad. We know that early closures will be necessary for the government to meet its 50 per cent renewable energy target by 2030, and dividends from coal and gas-based generators, Stanwell and CS Energy, are projected to decline to zero by next year's budget anyway. Instead of patching up the out-of-date technology at Calide, we've proposed spending $150 million building a big ba battery to replace the C4 turbine and using the remaining $50 million to help those workers whose jobs would be affected. They should have the option of a job in another coal-fired power station while they're open, redeployment elsewhere in the state government, retraining or early retirement for old workers, as we've seen happen overseas. Coal workers and communities have helped build this state, so they deserve a fair go and they deserve a predictable just transition into the future. But ultimately, without a plan to phase out coal and gas by 2030, including closing our coal-fired power stations and retraining or redeploying workers in the resources industry, Queensland will fall behind, both economically and on our inadequate climate targets. We also know we're falling behind on the nationally agreed 17 per cent protected areas target for the state. Yet far from investing to help grow our national parks, in this budget, the capital purchases from the Department of Environment and Science will actually decline by more than a third, from 98.6 million to 61.1 million in 21-22. Now, of that spend, the amount going to acquire new protected areas and Great Barrier Reef Island National Parks will drop by nearly half from 9.6 million to 5.3 million. Now, that is despite Sorry, the Member, government... pause the clock. The cross-chamber chatter will cease. Member for Maywa has the call. Thank you, Madam, Madam Acting Speaker. Uh, that's despite the government going to the last election boasting about their 10-year plan to accelerate the growth of protected areas. Now, for a bit of context, that spending on new national parks is less than 10 per cent of the money that the government's spending over the next two years on making big Hollywood movies in Queensland. On social housing, I welcome the rhetorical commitment from the government after many, many years of urging by the Greens in the housing sector. It's great that the government has admitted that their housing strategy from 2017 wasn't enough. Accepting the truth is the first step in lots of very good programs, so we welcome that. But it doesn't take a bleeding heart lefty like me to figure, out, to figure that out when there's 47,000 people on the waiting list with more than 14,000 people in the very high need category as at June 2020. 
But just like the renewables numbers, when it comes to the government's housing commitments, the devil's in the detail. So even if we believe that the government can deliver 6,300 social homes they're promising, we know that won't come close to meeting the full extent of the need. But perhaps even more than social housing, what's important to this government is that they build enough prisons to maintain their tough-on-crime image that they're cultivating for the far right. The parole board is completely overloaded, but instead of wondering how we can prevent so many people going to prison in the first place, we've got to fork out $654 million for a new one. And this is the particularly bleak bit, we're going to spend $8 million to put bunk beds in existing cells. When children as young as 11 years old are sleeping in adult watch houses because detention centres are overcrowded, instead of raising the age of criminal responsibility or reducing the number of kids on remand, they slap GPS trackers on some of them and throw others in new short-term remand centre. One thing I'm pleased to see in the budget is funding for a new residential drug and alcohol um, treatment program for young people. I'd like to hear more about this, about who will be eligible, how it will be reviewed and whether there are plans to expand this initiative because this is the, the crucial other side of the youth justice coin. But $7.7 .7 million for just 10 beds falls so far short of what's needed. Around 76 per cent of children subject to supervised orders are dealing with substance misuse issues. And illicit drug offences account for 11 per cent of all offences committed by children. It is heartbreaking and confounding that we still criminalise children, or anyone for that matter, for a health issue like drug abuse. We, if we decriminalise drugs, we'd have about 1,500 less people in Queensland's prisons right now. And perhaps we could spend that $624 million I mentioned before on more alcohol and other drug treatments instead of a new prison. In fact, I wish we were spending the $3 million that's going to new GPS trackers or the $16.3 million this year for a new youth prison on more programs like this. Programs that deal with the root causes of offending not band-aids for a gaping wound at the end of the day. And now, if the government wants to push this as a traditional Labor budget, I assume they'll stand by all of their choices, including the choice to leave Queensland state schools underfunded at just 88 per cent of their needs-based funding. We're still the third worst state or territory in the country, and the government does not have a plan to get us to 100 per cent. They've again ignored the calls from the Queensland Teachers Union to fully fund state schools. Fully funding public schools means smaller class sizes, it means more teachers and teacher aides, but it should also mean free school breakfasts and lunches and abolishing fees for public schools. Now, I would love to see kids at Tawong and Indrapili and Ironside, Milton, Fidtree Pocket, Barden and Rainworth rolling in before school for a free breakfast and taking the stress out of school lunches for parents all over Queensland. I'd love to see school students using public transport for free. And this budget leaves me once again wondering why this hasn't already been done. The government has spent more than $1.7 billion on public transport in South East Queensland over the last financial year, but collected only $221 million in fares. That's not even 12 per cent of the total cost of these services. 12, 12 per cent of the total cost of public transport services. Now, the big spending on Cross River Rail is great, but we will never get the most out of our public transport systems without making it more affordable or even free. Madam Speaker, I'll turn to some local budget allocations, and particularly in relation to local schools and transport spending in Maywa. The budget, of course, uh, See, it's, it's treated like a joke. It's treated like a joke that a government could actually, could actually choose to prioritise the things that people need to make their lives better in Queensland. It's just insane. Okay, the budget, of course, includes previously allocated funding for the proposed new school in Maywa, which has become probably the biggest local issue in my electorate at the moment. And it's clear to pretty much everyone that we desperately need this school to take pressure off the local primary schools particularly Indrapilly, Ironside and Toowong State Schools. It's equally clear that the decision a couple of decades ago to sell off land that was once the Turinga State School was an incredibly short-sighted decision. Now, yes, that school shrunk pretty dramatically through the 90s, and anyone who remembers that site in between Mall Road and Morrow Street would agree that it's not exactly an ideal location for a primary school. But the failure to plan ahead and acquire land for an alternative site is coming back to bite the department now. Now, I'll put on record again, my view is that the government should stump up and buy land for the school site, or at very least to offset any impacts on green space at the site they ultimately choose. And I know this is a view shared by most in my community, 
and I wrote to the Treasurer asking for funds for this purpose. Now, the same increase in population that's driving the need for a new school means that our existing schools and green spaces are all the more precious. It makes no sense to continue to carve them up in the search for a new school site. Now, the pool of funds for land acquisition looks to have dropped to $120 million in this budget, down from the $146 million. Order members, the comments, budget. pause the clock. Sorry, member. Order members, comments will be put through the chair. I'll tolerate a level of interjection so long as I can still hear the member on his feet. The member for Maywa has the call. Thanks once again. Um, as I was saying, the pool of funds for land acquisition has dropped by some $26 million in this budget, but I'd urge the government to keep up the search for land to locate the school and, again, at least offset any impacts on the ultimately selected site. Now, I'm sure I'm not alone in the view that a Riverside Park at the old ABC site would make a fine substitute for any parkland impacted near Tawong. Now, the $65 million allocated for the new school it looks to me to have shrunk to more like $61 million in the light I'd have found. But that said, the Minister's very helpful spreadsheet for all the school spending in Maywa still says 65, so I'm, I'm sure I will uh, hear an explanation for that any time soon. Um, I'm absolutely chuffed to see the $4 million allocated for upgrades to the administration facilities at Indrapilly State School over the next year, uh, a, a development that I'm sure um, Principal Deb Spanner and the rest of the admin team will be very grateful for. Um, Funding is ongoing for upgrades at Indrapilly State School and Ironside State School Out of School Hours Care Facilities. Um, and final funding is delivered this year for new classrooms that are well on the way at Milton and Tawong State Schools. I can't wait to see the finished product at both of these schools. I saw the scaffolding was off the buildings at Milton the other day, and I'm sure that um, Paul Zernicker and Brendan Madden, the principals there, can't wait to get kids and teachers into those classrooms, and perhaps even more so to clear out the construction sites on their school campuses. Now, all this growth in local schools is a consequence of the significant growth in Maywa and points to the very real need for major investment in better public and active transport infrastructure. Uh, there's ongoing funding for accessibility upgrades at the Orkinflower train station worth, um, with $12 million to be spent this financial year. Unfortunately, there's still no commitment or funding to upgrade Taringa station, but I will keep making this case. Given just how well used that station is and how run down the facilities have become and how completely inaccessible it is, massive long stairwells to get to any of the platforms, um, we have to see funding for an upgrade in the near future. There are significant allocations again for the Centenary Bridge upgrade. Unfortunately, the government's inexplicable decision to rule out bus lanes on this bridge means it won't significantly cut congestion or make public transport better in the long term. Uh, I was really glad to see state funding to design a shared uh, cycle and pedestrian path to link the Centenary Cycleway and the new Indrapilly Riverwalk. Um, now that the Riverwalk's finalised, this missing link is all the more important. Um, there's a $500,000 funding allocation to design, uh, the Intrapilly to, to design an Intrapilly shopping centre bus station upgrade, um, $150,000 of that allocated this year, which is great to see. There was unfortunately no funding for the Intrapilly bikeway stages three and four along Lambert Road. Anyone who has tried driving around that neighbourhood at school drop-off and pick-up times knows how desperately we need those bike lanes, and especially in light of the consideration of that area as a location for the new school. Uh, I'm still yet to see any funding allocated for safety and pedestrian upgrades to Met Road 5 or the Varden Roundabout, um, despite the fact that this is one of the biggest issues for people in my electorate, and I look forward to discussing that with the department in coming weeks. I call the member for Mount Omni. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, it's budget week, and I'll give you one guess what I want to talk about first. Of course, it's the Jindalee Bridge on the Centenary Motorway. After announcing the project with the Premier and my good friend Milton Dick, the member for Oxley, last year, it was great to get an update on the project recently from Transport and Main Roads Engineers. This project will cost over $244 million in total. It's a 50-50 state and federal project, and of that total funding envelope, over $20 million has already been spent by the Palaszczuk government on the business case and the detailed design work. So the $112 million of funding coming from the state government will be forthcoming over the, uh, the forthcoming years, and construction is due to start next year, and my community cannot wait, and I know that the um, suburb down all the way through Ipswich are equally excited about this project. As I've said before, Speaker, the western suburbs, in addition to being a wonderful place to live, are also an employment hub. From advanced manufacturing, 
innovation, light industry, through to food like bougie snacks. That's right, those fantastic bougie snacks are manufactured right in the electorate of Mount Omni. I know um, members of the House would be familiar because you can buy them in um, most major retailers. There are so many great jobs in Mount Omni, it's no wonder our motorway needs upgrading. Many of the jobs in private industry are also due to the fact that these companies are sometimes Queensland government suppliers. Um, in fact, over 90 per cent of product for transport and main road projects, like the Centenary Motorway um, in Queensland, are manufactured in Queensland, keeping locals in my electorate in jobs. I previously mentioned a local company in my electorate, the Spacer Company, who supply transport and main roads for many of their projects right throughout Queensland with a little um, device called Spaces. Um, the Spacer Company are just one of the many Mount Omni businesses who benefit from our Buy Queensland policy, of which I'm an, um, an unashamed promoter of and supporter of. And in fact, I understand that the Queensland Government spends well in excess of $100 million in procurement in the electorate of Mount Omni every year. That's an awful lot of spaces. Buy Queensland is the Palaszczuk Government's commitment to put Queenslanders, Queensland workers and Queensland businesses first. Businesses like Photograve, who've had a Queensland Mines Inspectorate contract for over 10 years. Through the, Queens, uh, the Q Tenders portal, any Queensland business can and should sign up to supply the Queensland Government with their products. Queensland, the Queensland Government, or Queensland, um, is the largest procurement agency in Queensland. Our dollars, wherever possible, should be spent with Queensland businesses. This policy creates jobs. It means Queensland businesses need to put on more staff, helping the Queensland economy build back better after COVID-19. And yesterday, we got the truly wonderful news that the Queensland unemployment rate has dropped to 5.4 per cent, way ahead of where we had hoped to be at this time. And this is against the backdrop of a global pandemic and an increased participation rate in the Queensland um, economic data. The Palaszczuk government is also helping businesses grow with grants like Ignite Ideas, Made in Queensland and our fabulous by Queensland procurement policy. Um, can I just finish my contribution today by reflecting on some funding allocated to Currabee State School, $200,000 in fact. Members would be aware that this is not in my electorate, it's in fact in the electorate of Stretton, represented by my very good mate Duncan Pegg until, until last week. I visited this particular school with Duncan uh, when I was his assistant electorate officer and he was newly elected. Um, Duncan absolutely loved visiting schools. On this day, we were visiting the school uh, assembly and he was handing out certificates to the kids. He was really, really so proud to do so and he was so proud of their pride in their fantastic state education. He was proud because their effort showed um, how proud these kids were of their, of their school and I know that Duncan cared so deeply about his community. Um, he thought deeply about his community and he worked so hard every single day, every single day, to get what was best for his community. He never stopped. I know um, towards the end he thought about who the best person would be to continue this hard work in Stretton and I know that he believed his great mate James Martin um, would do a wonderful job in hitting the ground running um, because he's been working in the Stretton community for years. So I just wanted to say congratulations and well done for Duncan for securing that funding. I commend the bill to the House. Speaker. I call the member for Ipswich. Thank you, Speaker. I rise today to give my support to the 2021-22 Queensland Budget. I want to thank the Premier and the Treasurer for their hard work on delivering this budget and putting Queensland on the road to recovery after the COVID-19 pandemic. The Palaszczuk Government works hard every day to invest in projects that deliver jobs for every community across Queensland. The 2021-22 budget builds on our strong economic plan to invest in increased services, more infrastructure and more jobs for Queenslanders. It's a budget that's meeting the demands of a changing economic environment. It invests in our people with record health and education spending and a massive boost to infrastructure and vital frontline services. Ipswich is looking to move on from COVID-19 and there are optimistic signs that we're getting back to normal. Last month, we saw thousands of visitors flock to Ipswich for the Ipswich Show and the Gathering Celtic Festival. And just last week, thousands of visitors came to Ipswich to attend the Winter Nationals at Willowbank Raceway. And this weekend, thousands more will turn up for the annual Ipswich Cup race. 
These events, all cancelled last year, show that Ipswich is a resilient community that can take a few knocks and quickly get back on track soon after. On top of the enormous challenges we've faced over the past year and a half, we've also had to deal with rapid population growth in our region, with around 10,200 people moving to Ipswich local government area in the period from July 2019 to December 2020. The challenge in the immediate future is facing the rapid growth head-on by investing in infrastructure and services that will drive local economic growth and job creation. And one of the biggest areas of investment will be in health, with the Queensland Government committing $22.2 billion statewide for our hospitals and health services. In Ipswich, our health system is not only facing enormous challenges brought on by the rapid population growth, but also an ageing population who have increasingly complex health needs. And that's why I was so pleased to hear the Treasurer announce in this budget that a $2 billion hospital building fund for Queensland will be established to help address growth pressures across our health system. In Ipswich, health infrastructure spending is already well underway with stage one of the $166.9 million expansion and upgrade of the Ipswich Hospital. And this budget will deliver a massive $101.6 million to continue this upgrade, which includes construction of the new acute mental health facility, as well as the new 26-bed hospital ward, which is due to open in September. And I also want to assure Ipswich that our government is responding to growing demands on our local emergency services, with the announcement made late last year that we'll invest $11 million to expand the Ipswich Hospital Emergency Department. In this budget, I'm pleased to see investment in health infrastructure for the Ripley Valley PDA, with $5 million being delivered to kickstart the new $40 million satellite hospital, which I'm pleased to announce will be built in Ripley. This satellite hospital, along with the new public hospital to be built at Springfield, will alleviate growth pressures on the Ipswich Hospital. And in previous speeches um, in Parliament, I've spoken about the record growth we're seeing in the Ripley Valley and the need to invest in public services and infrastructure in this area. Building the new satellite hospital in Ripley will ensure that people living in this major growth suburb will be able to access quality health care close to home. The construction of the satellite hospital will also support 166 full-time jobs. And I'm pleased to see in this budget an investment of $2.5 million towards the construction of the new $5 million Ripley Ambulance Station, which will operate 24-7 and improve ambulance response times in Ipswich. These investments in healthcare are what Labor governments do best, because we understand that protecting the health of Queenslanders, no matter where they live, underpins a successful economy. And we saw that with our government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. We understood that protecting the Queensland population from COVID-19 meant a faster return to normal and a faster economic recovery. And it also means more jobs and improved frontline services for Ipswich. Our track record speaks for itself. Since 2015, the Palaszczuk government has delivered an extra 596 nurses. This budget's record $2.9 billion investment in social housing and homelessness in Queensland will ensure affordable housing is accessible for all Queenslanders. I'm pleased to see that $1.9 billion of that investment will be spent on building more social housing and building the capacity of our homelessness support services across Queensland. I was really pleased uh, to have the Minister for Housing visit my electorate uh, recently and open the uh, social housing units that were, com that were completed at the end of last year. And we have named uh, that construction, that building, after a really important figure in our community, um, Auntie Jill Davidson. It was a, a fabulous event enjoyed by all. This is the kind of thing that Labor governments do, and I'm really proud to have that in my electorate. Um, I, Speaker, the Speaker has reviewed and approved my budget speech for incorporation, and as such, I ask that the remainder of my speech be incorporated. Madam Speaker. I call the member for Southern Downs. Thank you. And uh, I rise to make my contribution on behalf of the people of Southern Downs on the budget um, bills this year. Uh, and I'd like to follow in the footsteps of many of the members of this House in acknowledging um, Duncan Pegg and, and expressing my condolences to his family and friends. Um, he was a very, very clever man. And uh, we all liked him. And he was a particularly fierce fighter for his views and for his electorate. And uh, I remember in the last term when I sat where the member for Mount Omni now sits, uh, he was just across the aisle from me. And I, I can see a knowing smile there from the member for Maribyrnong. He used to get in my ear. He used to have this, this very nuanced way of interjecting and whispering and, and put me off what I was saying, saying it was infuriating. All I could do was bellow at him and it never seemed to work. So, but I really liked, really liked Duncan. I was terribly sad to see his passing and I was incredibly uh, proud to have known him, in, in, particularly in the way that he faced 
um, his impending death from cancer. Um, I think he uh, was a great Queenslander and uh, um, he'll be sorely missed by many. Uh, thank you. Yes, um, now uh, Southern Downs as an electorate is um, a great producer of minerals and uh, food and fibre. We're a, uh, a community, a bunch of communities that um, are, are based around agriculture particularly and um, we make a great contribution to this particular state. And so um, whenever I look at the budget, I'm always looking for what's going to be there for us. And I'm, I'm disappointed that there hasn't been um, what I feel we deserve in Southern Downs for us in this budget. Um, now, um, whilst I'm critical of the re-announcement of uh, funding and projects which have been already put forward, in fact, my, one of my local papers, the Daily Journal, described it as uh, an Aladdin's lamp um, that uh, you know the, the lamps were repolished and put back on the shelf, and that is is true to some extent. I'm talking about funding for the police station in Warwick, um, Warwick State High School's new building, uh, Emu Swamp Dam and Coolmunda Dam, and um, uh, the, the water projects, which were announced recently by the um, uh, Minister for Water, the um, member for Gladstone. Now, I, I would like to say that I do appreciate those things, and uh, in particular, I'd like to thank the government for those announcements for. Um, for Warwick, that particularly um, a, uh, a water treatment plant to enable drinking standard water for uh, the people of Allera and Warwick that share a, a common pipeline there. Um, extra bores for those towns, which will help the towns less rely on, um, on Leslie Dam uh, and would also help provide water security for John D Meatworks, which employs 600 people. And uh, that water security is very important. And there was also funding for the, uh, uh, a really detailed business case into the possibility of a pipeline connecting Warwick and, Stan and, uh, and Toowoomba. Um, now, um, that will give the council, the Southern Downs Regional Council and Mayor Vic Panisi, the opportunity to uh, work out really if it's what uh, is in the ratepayers' interests. And I, I thank the government for those things. Um, but uh, overall, I feel we haven't got what we deserve. Um, and I uh, reflect on the, the debt situation in the state. Um, and if we're going to have $120 odd million, uh, billion dollars in debt, uh, which will take you know, a long time to repay, generations, our kids and our grandkids, I want to see some of it spent in Southern Downs. And um, uh, I'm particularly thinking about something which affects everyone, and that's the highways. So the Gore Highway, the Cunningham Highway, um, the New England Highway, um, in places they're in pretty bad shape. Uh, and the department, who I know do their best to uh, uh, run a, a rolling program of maintenance to fix problems where roads are collapsing and we get potholes and undulations and so forth, there needs to be big money spent, and particularly considering that the Gore Highway is now increasingly important for interstate trucks that are using the second range crossing. Um, there needs to be more than just a, a patch job or a couple of million here and there. It needs to be rebuilt, uh, particularly around the Wyoga crossings. And I, I'll continue to uh, argue with the government that uh, that, that should be a priority. Um, the Cunningham Highway. Uh, there, are, there is some work being done between Yalabin and Dundawindi, which is great to see. Um, now, I don't. I'll be um, keen to see whether those works are of a standard which will prevent future collapses of the road, because like on the Wyoga Creek crossings of the Gore Highway, um, water flows underneath the road, uh, it's black soil, and you end up with these undulations which are pressed in um, progressively by the trucks that are going across them. Um, and the New England Highway, um, I've uh, mentioned to the Minister in passing, and I've, I've written to, to him, and I've uh, been in touch with the regional office about this. Uh, there's work's been going on um, uh, south of Stanthorpe, between Stanthorpe and Ballandine, and, and the roadworks there appear to be functionally complete. The contractor has been telling locals that uh, they are upping sticks as soon as they put um, white lines and, and cat's eyes down on the road, and uh, that's alarmed the local residents. Uh, the people of um, uh, the southern Granite Belt have made it abundantly clear to me that they are very concerned about this. Uh, I acknowledge that uh, a departmental officer will be going to meet with uh, the uh, chairman of the Chamber of Commerce in, on the Granite Belt, that's um, Graham Parker, um, so that he can um, share the concerns that he and the businesses uh, and the locals that use those roads um, uh, share about that. So I'm hoping that uh, what we see now will not be the finished product for the, uh, the New England Highway there. Um, in education, uh, one of the things that I've gleaned uh, from my uh, school visits. There's about 40 schools in Southern Downs, um, most of which, of course, are state schools. Um, is that uh, there's increasingly a need for younger students to have access to a community nurse 
in their schools for referrals, uh, for looking at their, their medical welfare. Um, many of the teachers have said to me that um, they are teaching professionals, not health professionals, and they feel understandably uncomfortable about delving into some of the matters that the young people are, are being faced with. But one thing's for sure, there is a growing number of increasingly young children who are coming to school um, with mental health issues, some traumatised, uh, some neglected. Um, and it could be for a variety of reasons. And I think we all agree early intervention is important. So I would really like to see the state government invest money in uh, community nurses, not just in high schools for a day, a week or two, but also in primary schools. Um, I was speaking to uh, the principal of one of the um, prep to year 10 schools in my electorate who said that um, they were increasingly seeing children in years six, five, four and younger uh, who need that attention. So I, I'd, um, I've written to the department, uh, to, uh, the uh, regional director about this and I'll be happy to take it up with the minister in due course if, if necessary. Um, health, there's been a lot of talk about health uh, and um, there is a, uh, a very sad situation in uh, health in this state where we have um, you know, so many people on, on waiting lists and so much ambulance ramping going ahead. Uh, just looking at the statistics and we're looking at um, you know, a, an alarming percentage of, of patients ramped up to 40%. Uh, and 23% um, you know, of, of patients are not being seen within the clinically recommended time. And the waiting list is almost 55,000. That's about double what it was when the LNP left government in 2015. And I do take the point that we are in a different times, the circumstances are different, but the government must react to this. And I'm not satisfied that record, record spending, record spending, record spending is the answer. You need record output. We need to be judging the system by what it produces, and we, we require a, a record output, uh, and re uh, we require record outcomes. I take that interjection from the member for Scenic Rim, um, and that's what we should be focusing on, because um, throwing money at the problem alone is not the answer, because the health budgets will become unsustainable that way. We need to be smarter about how we deliver health. And I, and I note that um, my, uh, my predecessor, the, uh, as member for Southern Downs, the Honourable Lawrence Springborg, was very successful uh, in cutting waiting lists and getting rid of ramping. And that was simply by taking a farmer's approach, you know, by um, representing the taxpayer and representing the patient, saying this is what we require of health. The purpose of health is to make people uh, well um, and not all of the other considerations which seem to infiltrate um, the way the Labor government administers health. Um, maternity services, I take the interjection from my honourable friend, the member for Mogul. He's a doctor. Uh, you know, uh, we have a... <laughs> Um, I don't know if he delivers many babies, but maternity services, yes. The, uh, the good folk and true of communities um, west of the dividing, Great Dividing Range are entitled to, to know that they can have their babies close to home, um, wherever possible. And I think the withdrawal of maternity services from places like Chinchilla is a um, bit of a slap in the face, which indicates that Labor doesn't prioritise looking after people, regardless of where they come from, the way the Premier always says. And if I can add a personal dimension to this, the question of, of ramping. Um, my wife, um, Belinda, uh, broke her leg at work uh, some years ago, uh, very badly in fact. Um, now, uh, the, because the Air Force Base where we were stationed didn't have um, the facilities for that level of trauma, um, she was taken from the, uh, the medical centre at the base uh, in a Queensland ambulance to Ipswich Hospital. And that was done on the premise that uh, when you're really sick, you go to a proper uh, public hospital because they will have the resources and the uh, capability to look after you. When I got there, um, after my wife had arrived, I saw a uh, car park full of ambulances. Uh, uh, from my memory, there would have been a dozen at least, each of which had two paramedics attached to it. When I went inside and finally got reunited um, with my, uh, my wife, there was a queue of patients on stretchers with two paramedics next to each one uh, waiting to be seen. That's what ramping means. And what happened um, in the case of my wife, where she had a very serious leg fracture um, in two places, uh, she waited for four or five hours before being seen. And the result of that was that she developed fracture blisters and she couldn't have her legs set uh, and operated on um, that day. She had to wait for three weeks in hospital before she was ready to have the, uh, the surgery. She also ended up developing a bone infection. So when patients are rammed, it's not a, um, an abstract um, topic on which we throw mud at one or the other across the, uh, the floor of the house. It matters to people. It mattered to my wife. 
My family and my wife went through a great deal of difficulty and pain and the, the pain and suffering my wife endured as a result of being rammed at Ipswich Hospital um, will never be forgotten. And I'm sure in saying that I speak for thousands of Queenslanders who have experienced the trauma of being injured or being sick, going to hospital and waiting with paramedics who are being paid with an ambulance idle outside to stand next to the patient. It has to stop. And if Lawrence Springboard, a farmer with a grade 10 education, can take on the health department and practically uh, eliminate uh, ramping, then this government can do it too. And I know that, and I know that, this, this, that the LNP will, will grasp the nettle and make health function for the people who need it. There are no other considerations. Health is the, the Department of Health is there to make people well, uh, and that should be the only focus um, of the department of the, the government in, in funding health. Um, and I have to talk about police. Uh, I, I know we always hear about record budgets in these departments. Uh, Gundawindi is in my electorate, and Gundawindi is a fantastic town. Uh, Bernard Salt, the esteemed demographer, said that uh, it is the uh, greatest town in Queensland. And um, who can argue with him? It is a fantastic place, great people. Um, and uh, no, I, I, I'm sure that the member for South Border, it, it, it really is true in the case of Gundawindi. We have a crime problem in Gundawindi, which uh, is a blight on an otherwise fa fabulous town. Now, um, when I see um, the uh, police devoting enormous amounts of their time and absorbing the budget to simply re-arrest offenders who've been let out time and time again, slapped on the wrist by a, uh, by a magistrate, you know, allowed to leave and you know, rejoice on the steps in how they had no penalty, they're off on, uh, on bail again, to commit the same crimes night after night, assaults, thefts, vandalisms. Um, you know, if, you have, if you're a tradesman and you've lost your ute because some scallywag has stolen it and put it in the McIntyre River or burnt it, then uh, uh, it needs to be... Uh, th this is a serious matter. Th this is a, uh, a question of, of people's livelihoods, and, and uh, it's a great moral injury to have someone steal your goods or uh, break into your house, or in the case of um, uh, in the, uh, the five-star... Um, supermarket in, in Gundawindi. I was, I was talking to uh, Chris Henry and, and uh, he and his wife Gail run a small supermarket. They had uh, some kids steal a vehicle, back it into the front of the shop and steal some lollies. That caused $20,000 worth of damage. And it's not, it's not the first time. And, and we do all pay for that. We, we, we pay for that in increased insurance premiums and the cost of operating businesses. To say that we cannot incarcerate or have punitive um, penalties for those who commit these crimes because it doesn't do them any good misses the point. It is not right that those people who live by and uphold the law should be told to be patient and tolerate the crime until we've uh, fixed the problems which have caused it. That's not on. The first duty of the government is to protect those law-abiding citizens who do the right thing from those who do not. And I know I speak overwhelmingly for the population of Gundawindi and other towns in saying that because I just had a, a 3,000 signature petition come before the House calling for breach of bail laws to come back in. Because if somebody has breached the privilege of being on bail and then you put them away, within a few weeks in a town like Gundawindi there'll be no one left to commit the crime. Uh, and if anybody on the other side wants to poo-poo me and say that's not, uh, that's not the approach you have to take, I ask them to come to Gundawindi and say to um, so the locals there who've had their cars stolen, who've had their businesses broken into, who've been assaulted, have had their houses, um, uh, you know, entered, uh, how they feel about those things. There's a lot more that I'd like to say, but time is against me, and uh, I thank the House for the opportunity. Speaker. Call the member for Stafford. Thank you, Acting Speaker. This is a budget that backs education, that invests in health, that delivers jobs and builds housing. This is a budget that delivers for Queensland, and it delivers for Stafford. This is a strong budget, it's a responsible budget, it's a people-focused budget. Acting Speaker, this is a Labor budget. I've said time and time again in my short time in this chamber that one of the core driving motivations for my involvement in the Labor Party and in turn in putting myself forward for public service is my belief in the fundamental power of education to change people's lives, to give Queenslanders a good start in life, the opportunity to build a better life. Not only does this budget deliver right across the state, it delivers locally for Stafford schools. This government is delivering $250,000 for an outdoor, end, uh, outdoor uh, learning area at Kedron State School, $300,000 to make the school hall at Wavell Heights State School fit for purpose, 
delivering the $8 million Wilston State School Hall, including the first $300,000 for the specified for this year for planning and early works, are wonderful to celebrate the 100th year for that school. Uh, in particular, thank you to the um, Education Minister for her input in that regard. $500,000 improvements for the home economics area at Craigsley State School, our State High School, and $500,000 for the refurbishment of the science rooms at the Kedron State High School. And on top of that, $650,000 across the electorate for minor works and maintenance for our local schools. All of these investments are a win for students, for families and staff at local schools. And of course, it's also a win for local tradies as we create jobs on these local pro projects on the way through. I'm proud to be part of the Palaszczuk government that is investing in our world-class public health care system across the state and locally in Metro North. The government is delivering $4.7 million this year of the total of $91 million for the Prince Charles Hospital. This will deliver construction projects to improve services at our iconic local hospital, including the new car park. It delivers on our election commitment what this Palaszczuk government is known for. It's great for staff, patients, families, and as well as local residents as it takes pressure off local roads. Importantly, it will be built and run by the HHS, meaning it will stay in public hands, owned by Queenslanders. That will also ensure that fees will be capped so that staff and long-term visitors will receive accessible and reasonable parking. I thank the doctors, nurses, allied health professionals, the cleaners, wardies and support staff who make the place run, including those who have stepped up and managed the very busy vaccination centre, which has developed a very effective pathway for vaccination patients. And thanks to those who have adapted um, what's normally a community health facility to provide a COVID testing centre also co-located on the hospital site. I also welcome the extra investment at the RBWH, 5.4 million out of 24.3 million investment in construction projects to improve services at the Royal. Compare that to those opposite. When the Leader of the Opposition is specifically asked to rule out cuts, he says he wouldn't be savage. Well, that sends a shiver up the collective spine of our health workforce. The 1,400 health staff who lost their jobs under the Newman government in Metro North alone know exactly what that means. The 750 nurses included in that mass toll, they know exactly what that means. And the staff and families who saw the Newman government shut the Barrett Centre without a replacement, they know exactly what that means. I'm so proud to have the wonderful Jacaranda Place built by the Labor government, serving our community, our young Queenslanders most in need, co-located on the Prince Charles Hospital campus. I'm also very proud to be part of a government that is investing record levels in social housing. Indeed, our Labor government is investing $1.9 billion in social housing, delivering some 7,000 social and affordable homes for Queenslanders. I've spoken in this place before, including as early as my first speech, about the type of dynamic, inclusive community that Stafford, Stafford residents have proudly built and love. That absolutely includes support for vulnerable Queenslanders through social housing. And our community is not segregated into ghettos. We proudly have social housing, first home buyers, young families, retirees, and large family homes with city views all in the same street. I think that is one of the reasons we have such a strong sense of community. I thank the Housing Minister for this significant investment, as well as investment in social housing today. I recently met with her department and local contractors to, to see the latest development of a fantastic new social housing complex. Minister, uh, despite the weather issues in the first half of the year, the project is coming on very well. And in thanking the Minister for the great progress, can I also put her on notice that I'll be knocking on her door to support the rollout of this fantastic extension of social housing across the north side of Brisbane. Um, on a separate issue, can I also um, briefly recognise um, our collective and personal loss of Duncan? Uh, we go back a long way. And uh, there'll be a time to say a lot more. And can I just say today that my thoughts and love are with his family um, at this terribly sad time. Um, Acting Speaker, um, the Speaker has reviewed and approved my budget speech from Corporation, and as such, I ask that the remainder of my speech is incorporated into the record of proceedings. Acting Speaker. Call the member for Palmer Stone. Acting Speaker, um, I myself want to just briefly place on the record my sadness at the passing of the member for Stretton, Duncan Pegg. I and other new members may not have had the time that we would have liked to have gotten to know Duncan well, but I respected him very much as a brilliant political mind, somebody who 
had the respect of members right across this chamber and I reflect what a valuable and impressive thing that is and only hope that at the end of my time in this place I too could achieve that. Speaker, I love Queensland. I love Queensland and it's the greatest honour of my life to have been elected to work hard for the people of Pummerstone every single day and for the people of Queensland. On this side of the House, we're all proud of our communities, proud of Queensland and proud to serve our great state. And the last 18 months have seen Queensland's greatest challenge of COVID-19. And because we do care about our communities and about Queensland, when COVID-19 hit, we didn't call for our borders to be open 64 times. We didn't put big business first, we put Queenslanders first and we followed the health advice. We kept Queenslanders safe and we protected our economy. And those choices were the best possible choices for Queensland's economy and the positive impacts of those choices show in our 2021-2022 budget. Speaker, I sat through the opposition leader's budget reply and I heard nothing of inspiration, no values, no vision. He said that he wanted to give Queenslanders hope, but then he proceeded to repeatedly talk down Queensland. And I realised from that that the member for Broadwater doesn't like Queensland very much. He doesn't believe in our state. And I could add to that that members of the Greens political party that, who we've heard from earlier in this debate also don't seem to like Queenslanders very much, or Queensland for that matter. They don't like people outside their own bubble. And they certainly don't seem to like or value our institutions of parliament very much. It does make you ask why they bothered to take up two seats in this place. On the Labor side, though, we know that at heart the LNP and the member for Broadwater have only got two main policies, only two things they care about. Water members. Talking down Queensland and our world-class health, health system and sniffing around for jobs and services that they can cut. Whether you call cuts tough love like the member for Chatsworth, trimming the fat like Lawrence, Lawrence Springborg once did, we've got the member for Clayfield who boasted about his shrunken capital program, or as Campbell Newman once said of his heartless decision to sack 14,000 Queenslanders, many people often thank me for giving them an opportunity to start a new business or a new career. I wonder if they're thanking the former LNP Premier now. But on Wednesday, we got to hear the LNP's brand new cuts formula announced by the member for Broadwater himself. Cuts, but not savage cuts. Of course, one of the first cuts the member for Broadwater announced when he started his new job as Leader of the Opposition was his $3 million cut for a replacement Bribey Island Bridge. I asked the member for Broadwater now, does cutting support for a replacement Bribey Island Bridge count as a savage cut? I suspect that the people of Palmerstone would say that it does. But to return to the all-important issue of health for my constituents in Palmerstone, um, because Labor does love Queensland and Queenslanders, because we back Queenslanders, we have delivered another record health budget, $22.2 billion in 2021-22. I'll repeat those three words, record health budget. The LNP don't like that phrase much because goodness knows they never delivered a record health budget. Their health budgets mean one thing, and that was cuts. Cuts to services and facilities, like when they closed the Barrett Centre with tragic results. Cuts to health workers, like the 732 nurses they marched out the door in my local health area. And one after another, they've stood up in this house and they've talked down our record health in our world-class health system. And, but as part of our record health budget, I am so proud you're going out the door, member, member for Ujuru, uh, member for Southport, rather. As part of our record health budget, I'm Point so of order, proud Madam of Deputy our satellite Speaker. Yes, program. thank you. I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm going I'll to presume you. what you're going to say. Um, member for Palmerstone, there is a convention is in this I'm house sorry. that we don't... Um, thank you. I don't need instructions. I, I apologise. I did not intend any reflection thank you. on the departure of any member. OK, member, you, member for... Um, Surface par is, surface par is it Surface Paradise? Surface. Member for Surface Paradise. Order, thank you. <laughs> Member for Surface Paradise, that really was unnecessary. You are, um, if that continues, you will be warned. Member for Palmerstone has the call. Thank you. Our new satellite hospital on Bribie is just what the doctor ordered for our ageing community and I was delighted this week to get to stand up with the Premier and announce that we now have a site. 
Um, the site is the perfect opportunity for our satellite hospital to be built. It's well located, it's close to public transport, and it is the next step for our community to get more healthcare closer to home. And in this budget, we are seeing $15 million dedicated to the beginnings of construction for our satellite hospital. I could not be more delighted. I will keep working hard to keep our satellite hospitals both on Bribey and in Caboolture on track, and I can't wait to see them delivered in 2023. The 2021-2022 budget also has $121 million dedicated to continue our massive redevelopment of Caboolture Hospital. I recently visited with our minister to see that um, Caboolture Hospital is looking to be doubled in size under the commitment of this government. Yeah. Um, we're adding 130 new beds, a new cardiac unit, a new NICU, and bigger and better emergency department, and a whole range of new services. But I do want to remind those opposite that while they have stood in this place and um, purported to advocate for people in Caboolture, it was only three years ago that they likewise stood in this place and said that the, our massive redevelopment of Caboolture Hospital, uh, hospital rather, was a political stunt and it wasn't necessary. It is quite extraordinary to me that on the one hand you say that you are advocating for people to get better health care and on the other hand you are claiming that a, a really important local piece of health infrastructure like Caboolture Hospital doesn't need a desperately needed upgrade. Absolutely extraordinary. Uh, the members opposite talk down our health system, but when it comes down to it, there is one simple thing that they could do that would make a very, very real difference. They could pick up the phone and speak to their federal LNP colleagues and ask them to fix the GP crisis that so many communities right across Queensland are facing. Pick up the phone, talk to Federal Health Minister Greg Hunt and ask him to put our communities back on the GP priority health status lists. My community of communities in my electorate of Palmerston got removed from that list in 2019, and since then, wait times for GP services have blown out to up to four weeks, and that is leading to a lot of the pressures that we are seeing right across our hospital system. But have those opposite taken that simple step? I would suggest that they have not. I've not, certainly not heard a word from them about it. They're very happy to talk down our health system, but when it comes to it, what do we hear but silence? While they're at it, if the LNP actually care about Queenslanders' health, they should tell Scott Morrison that his attacks on Medicare are absolutely unacceptable. Absolutely unacceptable. Jackie. Acting Speaker, our budget also delivers on key road upgrades that matter so much to people in Palmerstone. I worked hard to get funding for a new $4.284 million project to upgrade a dangerous intersection of um, Diagula Highway, Dancers Road and Pumastone Road at Caboolture. That intersection is on the top 10 list of problem intersections on, uh, in Queensland and it, fixing it will make a real difference to getting people in Pumastone home sooner and safer. I am absolutely delighted to see that work beginning under this budget. Acting Speaker, the Speaker has reviewed and approved my budget speech for incorporation, and as such, I ask that the remainder of my speech is incorporated into the record of proceedings. Okay, thank you, Member. Speaker. I call the Member for Budrum. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, with the indulgence of the House, I too would like to uh, rise, this being my first opportunity to speak in the House, and I'd like to place on the record my condolences after the passing of Duncan Pegg. As many have already said, Duncan was a passionate and hardworking local member who loved the Stretton community. Duncan was a passionate and genuine advocate for the multicultural communities, which are such a significant part of Stretton. I know that Duncan was more than a colleague to many in the parliament. He was a mate, uh, and I hope Duncan's mates, his family, friends, uh, find comfort during this difficult time in the knowledge that Duncan's life of service to his community was a life well lived. Uh, Deputy Speaker, this is the latest in a long line of what those opposite love to describe as another quote-unquote good Labor budget. Another Labor budget of debt and deficit. Another Labor budget, I'll take that interjection, it's a great budget of debt and deficit. Another Labor budget that's light on detail and heavy on spin. Another Labor budget that fails Queenslanders waiting for surgery. 
Another Labor budget, Deputy Speaker, that fails residents across the South East who sit in traffic day after day. Another Labor budget, Deputy Speaker, that ignores the cries for help by Townsville residents under siege by young criminals. It's another Labor budget that fails to plan and fails to act on the multitude of issues that make life harder for Queenslanders every single day. Queenslanders deserve better. Deputy Speaker, this is a budget that relies on what can most kindly be described as creative accounting or what might be more accurately described as deception. The Treasurer has sought to hoodwink Queenslanders into thinking he's doing something about addressing Labor's escalating debt situation. Perhaps the Treasurer's motivation was to ensure that rating agencies don't hit Queensland with a ratings downgrade which would decimate his chances of being the next in, in the line of succession for the Labor leadership. It says much about Labor that rather than fixing the problem, they've sought to use trickery and deception to hide the problem. Deputy Speaker, just three weeks ago, the Land Titles Office was worth $4.2 billion. It was a lofty valuation when one considers the fact that in 2019, the Land Titles Office generated around $300 million in revenue. So it beggars belief that Labor have, three weeks later, jacked up the valuation of the Titles Office to around $7.8 billion. At that valuation, if the Land, Land Titles Office was a listed entity, it would be the 69th, listed 69th largest listed company on the Australian Stock Exchange. Larger than well-known companies like Channel 7, Airpol, Horizon, Harvey Norman, Bank of Queensland, AGL, JB Hi-Fi and Channel 9, just to name a few. It simply does not stack up, Deputy Speaker. To make matters worse, Deputy Speaker, on the basis of this rubbery valuation, the Treasurer has then ripped $1.5 billion from defined benefit superannuation assets to pay back the government $1.8 billion. So it begs the question where the cash came from to fund this $1.8 billion that is to be retained by the government from this transaction. Deputy Speaker, I suspect the answer is in the fact that the government does intend to rip the liquid assets out of the future fund, which would mean the government is going to again raid funds set aside to meet the superannuation obligations of public servants. It's nothing more than the latest Labor money go round. We've heard the Treasurer come in here and scream and shout about how we're all wrong and he's thrown around lots of thinly veiled threats about highly paid consultants. But if the Treasurer really wants to show that we are wrong on this side of the House, there's a simple course of action that he can take. And that course of action is to table the valuation. That will detail how his tenuous valuation was arrived at for the Land Titles Office. It is time, Deputy Speaker, for the Treasurer to put up or shut up. The government have made much of their investment in this budget in training and support, an investment that's been underwritten by uh, the Morrison LNP government through their $2 billion job trainer investment, which has supported every single state. Of the $460 million that the Minister for Training and Skills Development and her colleagues have been crowing about, $384.8 million is being funded by the LNP federal government. Deputy Speaker, that equates to more than 83 per cent of the funding coming from the federal government, with less than 17 per cent coming from the state government. It's clear who is doing the heavy lifting when it comes to investment in training and skills in Queensland, and it is most certainly not the Labor state government. Deputy Speaker, who is it? I hear the interjection there from the member for Pine Rivers. It's the federal government. 83 per cent of more than 83 per cent of funding for this Labor state Comments budget. through the chair. Deputy Speaker, I will be watching intently at the government's expansion of the Back to Work program. I note the minister's comment that, and I quote, wherever you are in Queensland, you deserve the chance to get a good job." Un end quote. I agree. Unfortunately, as I raised in estimates in December, what we've seen with the Back to Work program is cherry-picking by the government in relation to which regions get support and which regions miss out. I look forward to programs like Back to Work being available to all regions of Queensland. Deputy Speaker, unfortunately, this budget fails to provide any measures to support small businesses that are identified as COVID exposure sites despite the consistent calls from businesses that have had their life turned upside down when identified as a potential COVID exposure site. Many small businesses, through no fault of their own, have been left to carry the can when they have shut down as a consequence of public health directives. I note that many of those businesses, Deputy Speaker, actually sit in seats held by Labor members of, the, of this House, and their silence on this issue is deafening. 
particularly the member for Pine Rivers, where many of the most recent businesses impacted by the Brisbane lockdown were, were cited. Business owners like Marie from the Gingin Bakery feel abandoned by the state government, and it's time that the government listens to their cries for help. The government, Deputy Speaker, could start by providing better information and specific grants to help small businesses meet the costs of cleaning, increase staff costs and to make up for lost revenue when businesses are identified by Queensland Health as COVID exposure venues. It's disappointing that the government continue to ignore the cries of help for help from these small businesses like the Gingin Bakery. Deputy Speaker, I don't believe it's unreasonable to ask that funding for such a grant be established, noting that it will only be required whenever cases arise in the community. The assumptions that underpin this budget assume that there will be no significant COVID outbreaks. So if the government have confidence in these assumptions, then they should have no hesitation in setting aside a relatively small sum of money to support businesses when they need it most. Deputy Speaker, turning now to my open data responsibilities. In this budget, we, have see, we can see just how little importance the, government's, the government places on the digital, digital economy and on the principle of transparency. In this budget, we see no mention of how the government are going to enable business innovation and entrepreneurship through the release of government data. We see no initiatives to improve public confidence in the delivery of government services with data that is more timely and easier to, to digest. Along with the LNP leader, David Crisofulli, I've been calling on the government to follow the lead of other states and implement real-time reporting of hospital emergency data. Queenslanders want to know that when they go to a hospital, they will get treatment when they need it. If we are to look at Townsville as an example, Deputy Speaker, it's pretty clear that the Labor State Government are losing control of Townsville's health system, just like they have lost control of crime in Townsville. Deputy Speaker, Townsville has the worst record of treating elective surgery patients on time. More than one out of every three patients doesn't receive surgery in the clinically recommended time frame. Deputy Speaker, that is more than 4,000 North Queensland locals who are suffering with their condition longer than a doctor has recommended. Deputy Speaker, it's not much better in the emergency department in Townsville, where 18.1 per cent of patients were not seen in the clinically recommended time frame. That's an increase of more than 8 per cent since February last year. And we only know this information because the government were dragged kicking and screaming to release hospital performance data by the Shadow Minister for Health and I. Townsville's health crisis is replicated, Deputy Speaker, across the state, and the initiative that was announced today by the Minister for Health will do nothing to resolve the crisis or improve public confidence. Queenslanders deserve better than to be kept in the dark about the performance of their local hospitals. We know, Deputy Speaker, that a culture of secrecy pervades the government from the top down, but hospital data is not being shared, and it should be. So I call on the state government, again, to get serious about transparency and to commit to publishing real-time hospital performance data for the benefit of every Queenslander. Deputy Speaker, turning now to my local electorate, I'm pleased to see some funding committed for the construction of a new Palmview State High School, which the Palmview community and I have been fighting to get built for years. A new high school is desperately needed to cater for the increased student numbers, which are the consequence of thousands of new residents moving to the Sunshine Coast each year. What's disappointing is that the construction of a new high school has been delayed and will only open in January 2023. The Harmony development in Palmview is the fastest selling development in Australia. Just last week, people were camped out trying to buy blocks in Harmony. In 2017, when I was elected to this place, there were no residents in Palmview at all, and now 5,000 residents call Palmview home. So the need for a new high school has been self-evident for some time. All that said, Deputy Speaker, where we are now is that the high school will, be, will open in January 2023. So I asked the Minister for Education to work with me to find a solution to support the small cohort of Year 6 students who are enrolled at Palmview State Primary School. These students will need to go to their third school in three years if they, to, if they are to attend the new Palmview State High School in 2023. The fact that planning for a new high school has been inadequate doesn't mean that the impact should fall on students who have already dealt with considerable disruption moving to a new school this year. So I again call on the Minister for Education to work with me, members of the Palmview learning community, including parents, teachers and school leadership, to find a way to mitigate the considerable impact which these Year 6 students, who are now thriving at Palmview State Primary School, will experience. Deputy Speaker, I'm 
pleased to see funding allocated in the budget for construction of a new school hall at Budrum Mountain State School and at Chancellor State College Secondary Campus. I've been working with both the Budrum Mountain and Chancellor School communities since I was elected to deliver school halls for both. I spoke in my last budget debate about how disappointing it was to see schools like Caloundra State High School, that has 560 students, have extensions to their existing hall funded ahead of Chancellor State College and Budrum Mountain State School both of which don't have a school hall and have a combined student population of around 3,500 students. One might ask what the, what the reason was, apart from the fact that Calandra was a marginal seat that the Labor Party was seeking to gain. Nonetheless, the government's funding allocation for the construction of new school halls will be important additions to my community, which will result in better access to opportunities and learning outcomes for students. Deputy Speaker, turning now to the Mooloola River Interchange, where we see a $4 million commitment from the government to upgrade this important stretch of road in the centre of the Sunshine Coast, which is choking business and choking our community. The government have taken three years to finalise a business case, which we still haven't seen, I might add. Three, three years to finalise a business case, which we have not seen. I have very little faith that the government are genuinely committed to upgrading the Mooloola River Interchange, despite the fact that the federal government have stumped up half the cost to upgrade what is purely and solely a responsibility of the state government being a state road. <laughs> I take the interjection from the Minister for Transport and Main Roads. The federal government have offered the state a good deal and they'd be well served to take that good deal and start building the road. On the plus side, Madam Deputy Speaker, I notice there is $15 million allocated in the uh, budget for upgrades to the Sugar Road Mooloolabar Road intersection, and, uh, which, which is known as the Budrum Mooloolabar Interchange. I, uh, I acknowledge the Minister for Transport and Main Roads, who is here in the House currently, and I'd like to place on the record my thanks for him coming out to that site with me and inspecting the problem on the ground. So I welcome the action to get work started, and I note that uh, there's a considerable allocation, I think it's a cut over $3 million in this, this year, to get work started. Deputy Speaker, this is a budget that fails Queenslanders. This, this is a budget that puts the interests of Queenslanders second to the interests of the Labor Party. The government have chose to use a policy that seeks to obscure the true state of the Queensland economy and the expenditure of the Queensland government. Deputy Speaker, Queenslanders deserve better. Thank you, Member. I call the member for Gavin. Deputy Speaker, I rise to support the appropriations bills. Uh, this is a budget that delivers for the environment, investing over $1.4 billion. And before detailing where that investment is focused on, I wanted to just respond to some of the comments made by the member for Bonnie yesterday. Uh, I was really looking forward to his speech because on social media he was showing happy snaps where he was writing his speech in the Botanic Gardens. Of course, probably needs to go outside of this chamber because we know that any good ideas on the environment certainly aren't welcomed in this place by those opposite. So I wasn't surprised, though, to hear that there were no new ideas, no real commitments to climate change or protecting our rich biodiversity from those opposite. Deputy, Deputy Speaker, I wanted to address a few particular points, though, and to start with our protected area estate. I did a bit of research, and in fact, our national park overall spending is actually up 24 per cent since 2015, after the Newman government cut 500 jobs within the Department of Environment and Science. Uh, it's one thing to grow the protected area estate, which of course we are doing through a $60 million strategy, but they also have to be managed to uh, do plan burns, to control pest plants, install and maintain park infrastructure. And all of that is pretty hard to do when you've sacked the very people who are working on the front line in our national parks. Deputy Speaker, the second point I wish to respond to is in relation to the waste levy. Who could forget that it was those opposite uh, that made Queensland become the dumping ground of the country when they scrapped the waste levy. We saw dump truck after dump truck drive here from Sydney and other states, clogging up our roads and throwing their rubbish in the Order members. Since then, we've implemented... Member for Senate Rim, I'll ask that you stop uh, interjecting. If you've got a point of order, you're welcome to make it. Otherwise, I'll ask that you stop interjecting across the chamber. Since then, we've implemented sensible reform, and waste from interstate and from construction and demolition has fallen by 65 per cent. Deputy Speaker, there's been a lot of scaremongering about this section of the budget from the LNP over the last couple of days, and frankly, it's been disappointing. 
Uh, so I want to be very clear. The government remains committed that there should be no impact on households as a result of the waste levy. We're continuing the 105 per cent advance payment around $160 million in the 2021-22 financial year. So there's another year's worth of funding that takes us up to the next year's budget. And in the meantime, we'll be undertaking a review of the levy as prescribed in the legislation. And I know those opposite don't like reading very much, but it's section 73E. Uh, there's this great trick called Control F on your computer that can, uh, that can make sure that you find it online if you're wanting, for, wanting to look for it in future reference. Deputy Speaker, we're very proud to be delivering in the resource recovery space in this state, which is helping us reduce emissions, create three times as many jobs as compared to if we put waste into landfill, while also protecting protecting our environment. And through programs like our Food Rescue Project, where I announced recently with the member for TUI, we've provided funds like $200,000 to Oz Harvest to purchase two new trucks, one that will be based in Brisbane, the other in Townsville, to help them feed hungry bellies, as well as Fair Share, who, got, who also received around $200,000 to help them purchase more cool rooms so that they can uh, produce more food for vulnerable Queenslanders. I've also had the uh, privilege of recently announcing a number of food and garden, garden organic trials to be delivered in partnership with councils, and I look forward to updating the House with further initiatives on that very soon. Deputy Speaker, unlike those opposite, who saw a 43 per cent increase on electricity bills and they slashed $60 million from council grants and subsidies, we will actually work with local government, our community, industry, to drive down the amount of waste that's going to landfill while creating more jobs in more industries. To conclude, Deputy Speaker, I'll turn to the Carbon Reduction Investment Fund. Uh, and I, I really don't know how more clear we can be on this fund. I'm happy to bring some crayons to the next sitting to explain it in detail for the member for Bonnie. We know that acting on climate change, though, to be fair, is a bit of a foreign concept for the LNP. They really seem to be struggling with it. Uh, so, uh, Deputy Speaker, I'm incredibly proud that we've set up this $500 million fund that provides certainty, continued certainty for land restoration carbon farming across this state, which was a flagship project that was developed by this government government that actually the Commonwealth is now copying off. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I'd like to conclude by saying uh, how proud I am to be a part of the Palaszczuk government to deliver this record investment in the environment. We have the most biodiverse, biodiverse state in the country. Uh, so I want to uh, take this opportunity to thank my staff, the Department of Environment and Science staff, uh, the many organisations and community members who all helped inform and, informed and deliver a record investment for the environment. Deputy Speaker, the Speaker has reviewed and approved my budget speech for incorporation, and as such, uh, I ask that the remainder of my speech is incorporated into the record of proceedings. Thank you, Member. Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Corumban. Deputy Speaker, before I go on to make my contribution to the budget debate, I put on the record that I intend to talk about an election commitment that Labor made to the people of Corumban Valley to acquire 148 hectares of parkland and turn it into ecotourism. I declare that, like a number of my constituents, my husband is an employee of a company that is associated with the entity that owns that land. Mr Speaker, promises have, sorry, Madam Speaker, promises have been made by this government and then those promises have been broken. But to begin with, allow me to mention the positive for my community in this budget, because, Madam Speaker, that's going to take a whole of two seconds. Yeah. My in my budget reply speech last year, I said that I aspire to be the kind of representative that acknowledges when the government commits to something that my community has called for, because that is what government should do, and it is the very minimum that this government should do. So it is in that spirit I want to express my delight that 452,000 has been allocated out of the maintenance fund for the Eleanor State High School to refurbish their home economic centre. And this is fantastic because they have been patiently waiting for this money on a waiting list for over a decade. But sadly, Madam Speaker, this is the only bit of new money in this year's budget for the Corumban Electorate Schools. The little of what is funded in this budget was in fact promised in last year's budget and is only now being delivered. But hey, I am grateful for the promises that are actually being funded because there are a lot of promises that have no funding in this budget. 
The ones that are actually being funded, like the outside hours school care facility for the Corumban State School, the upgrade to the toilet block for Eleanor State School, and the upgrade to the administration block for Talabudra State School. These are all investments that these schools have been crying out for for a long time now, and I am grateful that they are now receiving it. The commitment of $2 million to the Corumban Beach Viking Surf Life Saving Club to build a new Nippers Club is another commitment I'm happy about. As a teenager, I earned my bronze medallion at the Vikings, and I'll tell you what, they needed a new Nippers Club then. So I was delighted that last year the LNP committed $2 million to upgrade the Vikings Junior Nippers Club, and Labor matched it, and now they're getting that funding. So I'm very grateful that that is happening. <laughs> And why? Why do you ask? Am I so grateful for the promises that are actually being funded? Because there are so many promises this Labor government has made to my Corumban community that are not being funded. In the 2020 election, Labor unequivocally promised, and I quote, a re-elected Palaszczuk government will deliver a local satellite hospital for Chugan. The Chugan, they said. They plastered it all over promotional material. Here's one. The Premier came down and announced it. I'll table that. Here's another. The Premier came down. Satellite hospital for Chugan. I'll table that one. All in an attempt to win Corumban in the state campaign. And Chugan needs this satellite hospital. They need this investment and they need the 924 jobs that will be created. So it is so disappointing to see this state Labor government unable to provide any detail around where this satellite hospital will be. Following last year's budget, Order members. I expressed my dismay that the Labor government is shying away from this promise. I know, dismay is conservative. I was absolutely disgusted. And six months on, I am still facing this dilemma. In last year's budget papers, not only was this project renamed, it's no longer called the Chugan Satellite Hospital, it's now called the Southern Gold Coast Satellite Hospital, but the project pin was dropped in Burley. And now, in this year's budget, there's no project pin. There's no location. And the name, once again, has been changed. It's now being referred to as the Gold Coast Satellite Hospital. If they plan on making good on this promise, and build the satellite right, hospital pause the Chugan. clock, pause the clock. Why all this pause the clock, the member for Corumban, member for Corumban. Yeah, thank you. Look, every, I uh, apologise, members on both sides, the noise is really getting a bit much. If we could just be mindful that I would appreciate hearing this in as much relative silence as we can. Thank you, member for Corumban. Thank you for your protection, Madam Deputy Speaker. And now, you want to know why there's all these smoke and mirrors around the name? Do you want to know why? When all the other satellite hospitals, their locations are known? I'll tell you why. Because this deceitful Labor government is trying to wiggle out of this promise because it no longer benefits them in Corumban. My community want to see this promise kept. They want this government to know how much this commitment of a satellite hospital in Chugan means to them. And I want to see this seedy state Labor government deliver on it. They are seedy, yep. It's the second major Order commitment members. this government made to my Corumban community that they are hoping my constituents will forget about is their election promise to acquire 148 hectares of land Another in Corumban Valley and turn it into ecotourism. Labor said they would buy that land. Labor said they would ensure the site would remain out of the footprint, out of the urban footprint. They said they would transform the whole of the 148 hectares of Martha's Vineyard into one of the largest ecotourism parks in Australia. They called it an eco-win in Corumban. And I will table that. Well, do you know how much money, Madam Deputy Speaker, they've allocated to this in the budget this year? Zero. They plan to acquire a parcel of land for zero dollars. During the state campaign, it became clear that the Labor candidate plucked this commitment out of the air. The Labor candidate had not even consulted with the landowners before making this announcement.
Thank you, members. I have spoken very previously about just the general noise level. I will start issuing warnings. There's a couple people I'm monitoring. You are you are cautioned. Member for Corumbin has the call. Madam Deputy Speaker, this land was purchased by the current landowner in 2019 for $15.25 million. In last year's budget, a measly 500000 was allocated for negotiations, and in this year's budget, there is zero dollars allocated. Even this out-of-touch treasurer should know that 500000 is a far cry from the $15.25 million which this land was valued at over two years ago now. But we all know that valuations aren't this treasurer's strong point. Maybe he thinks, maybe he thinks he can make the valuation up like he did with the land titles office. Sorry, Treasurer, but that won't fly in the real world where market valuations matter. Mr Speaker, how is this deceitful Labor government going to secure this land when they are coming to the negotiation table with zero dollars? This is another Labor promise that this Labor government is set to break for my Corumban community. And there is a consistent theme here. The Treasurer promised $2 billion for the hospital building fund. But when you look to the budget for the money, there is nothing there. In reality, there is a $74 million drop of actual expenditure for the whole year for our hospitals. And of greatest concern to me is that $51 million of this reduction in expenditure is on the Gold Coast. In this budget, the Treasurer promised $1 billion for the housing investment fund. However, when you flip through the budget papers and try to find the money, it's not there. The Treasurer promised $1.5 billion for new renewable energy and hydrogen jobs fund. There's only $500 million in the budget for it. The budget's missing $1 billion there. The Treasurer promised $300 million for the Parts of Treaty Fund. And again, no actual funding in the budget. Madam Deputy Speaker, the truth of the matter is Queensland and my Corumban community have received a truckload of nothing from this state Labor government. Madam Deputy Speaker, this budget also does not reflect a government in support of its small businesses. When faced with the disastrous impacts of this pandemic, when we on the border called for targeted funding to help businesses directly impacted by border closures and restrictions, what we got from this state Labor government was a barely functional yet aptly named disaster hub. That launched with typos, errors and the same lack of care Labor has shown our small businesses all along. Not to mention the false hope when they closed the applications for the Business Basics grant a mere three hours after it opened. And Madam Deputy Speaker, as the Shadow Assistant Minister for the Nighttime Economy, I am beyond disappointed in the lack of vision, the lack of planning and the lack of care given by this state government to grow the economy, let alone the nighttime economy. It is past time this government provides support to emerging industries such as this. Further, the government must step up and do better to support local community groups in Corumban. As the Shadow Assistant Minister for Youth, I'd love to see some funding provided to the incredible not-for-profit and volunteer-run organisations that service my community. One example of this is the incredible Fight for Youth, a multicultural youth chattery that provides relief to young people in need. Lisa Logan, who founded Fight for Youth, is a qualified chaplain, and when she's not volunteering her time at Fight for Youth to help youth live the best possible lives against disadvantage, against discrimination, against harm and against self-harm. She's working at the Brisbane Youth Detention Centre, helping youths in detention. Lisa's whole objective is to reach those kids that need it, to empower them, to strengthen relationships and to inspire respect for themselves and for others, to keep them out of detention centres. I want to see Fight for Youth supported and I am committed to helping Lisa however I can. Further, Madam Deputy Speaker, as the Shadow Assistant Minister for Justice, I cannot ignore this state Labor government's clear disregard for my community's safety on the policing front. The Gold Coast 
is the state's second largest city, accounting for 15 per cent of the population. Yet the government has decided a single increase in police resources on the northern Gold Coast is enough for the whole city. The budget set aside $15.1 million for, for Queensland Police Service, and yet the Gold Coast receives a mere $51 million for one project. It completely neglects the Corumban electorate. The people of Corumban and the wider Gold Coast community are also left to wonder if the roof over their head is here to stay and whether they'll be able to see any funding out of the social housing that they need. Earlier this week, ABC's Brisbane anchor Matt Wadsworth pressed the Premier where it hurt. He asked her about the government's welfare investment that falls well short of what Queensland needs. He said, we've got a housing system on the wait list. And he was right. But the Premier couldn't stand this pressure. She snapped back, saying she doesn't accept this. The Premier stated, and I quote, we're putting $1.9 billion into housing. Tell me which other government has put $1.9 billion into social housing. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'll tell you, the Victorian government has. They're investing $5.3 billion into social housing. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, this isn't the point. The point is, the Gold Coast, which already houses 13 per cent of the state's population, only receives a mere 7 per cent of the budgeted money to be spent on the construction of new social housing and only 3 per cent of the budgeted money to be spent on upgrading social housing. Madam Deputy Speaker, there are, are 25,000 people on the social housing waiting list. These Gold Coasters cannot wait on the state Labor government any longer. Madam Deputy Speaker, the last point I want to make is one that is very close to my heart. For the past six months, I have been fighting alongside the Gough family to see spinal muscular atrophy included in the newborn blood spot screening process in Queensland so that another Queensland family does not have to suffer the way the Goughs have. So that another Queensland family does not have to watch while their child deteriorates from SMA when it could have been prevented with early detection at birth. I was hopeful the Health Minister might listen to the 14,500 petitioners that signed the petition and the 500 people that sent letters to the Health Minister imploring her to add SMA to the newborn screening process. Even the AMAQ has once again in their budget submission implored the Health Minister to include it in the budget. AMA has estimated this cost to only be 700000 Here is their budget submission. They've said AMA Queensland wants SMA testing introduced to the newborn heel prick test in Queensland so babies diagnosed with the disease can begin treatment early and have a better quality of life, and I'll table that for the benefit of the House. And yet, there is no commitment or certainty in this year's budget for testing for SMA. I am devastated by this, Madam Speaker. We must not let another Queensland family or baby go through what baby Oakley is going through. I know the Health Minister is still open to considering this, and I hope with all my heart that the government will act on this, because it is above politics. This is a matter pertaining to the life and death of children in Queensland. And for a test that costs $10, this is something that this government should be doing. It's why I won't stop fighting for it, and it's why you must continue to push this government to move for Oakley and include testing for SMA as part of the newborn screening process in Queensland. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'll conclude by saying this budget is one of the worst budgets for my Corumban community, and it's one of the worst budgets for Queenslanders. Not only has it let my Corumban community down full of lies and deception... Madam Deputy Speaker. Thank you. The member's time has expired. Uh, the member for Aspley has to call. I congratulate the Treasurer on a fantastic Labor budget. It is a budget with a laser-sharp focus on recovering from COVID-19. Uh, the economic policies of this government are helping our great state power forward. We have nation-leading interstate migration. We have nation-leading economic growth, uh, nation-leading housing starts and nation-leading retail spending. I was pleased to see this week our unemployment rate dropping to 5.4%. Uh, which is especially good considering the participation rate is higher than the national average. Uh, and we are the first of the major economies in Australia with a path back to surplus. So as I see it, there are three reasons for the economic success that our state is experiencing. The first is that we enter the pandemic in a strong economic position. Uh, secondly, the Premier made the right calls at the right times during the heat of the pandemic. And thirdly, we have a strong economic recovery plan to drive forward Queensland. And this budget recognises the importance of social and community support. Queenslanders know the government will deliver for and always protect those most vulnerable. 
I was really pleased to see our $1.9 billion investment in social housing over four years and the new $1 billion housing investment fund to support uh, housing supply and increase housing and homelessness support across Queensland. And I congratulate uh, the Treasurer and the Minister on that. Uh, this will mean thousands of new builds over the next four years. So this financial year, our economy will grow by three and a quarter percent, uh, more than double the national growth rate. It's even more impressive given our economy contracted less than the national average over the last year. Uh, and by the end of the forward estimates, our economy will still be growing faster than the national average. Uh, but of course, because of COVID-19, the economic recovery hasn't been able to benefit all industries equally. Uh, live music has taken a big hit since COVID hit, uh, particularly indoor venues. While it's been difficult for many across pubs, clubs and nightclubs, uh, those whose main business is putting on gigs have been particularly affected. Uh, that's why I was very pleased to see the Premier, mm -hmm. our Treasurer and Minister Enoch announce $7 million in support uh, to be delivered by Arts Queensland uh, this coming financial year for live music venues. Yeah. Uh, and I thank Angela Seven and John Collins from the live music sector in particular for working with us on this package. Yeah. Uh, now we just need the federal government to hurry up and sort out their vaccine supply so that these venues can fully get back to normal. Uh, more broadly, uh, pre-COVID, Queensland Labor governments were delivering surplus after surplus and we are on track to get there again. Uh, federally, the LNP haven't delivered a surplus since four Liberal Prime Ministers ago. Uh, Morrison, nope. Turnbull, nope. Uh, Abbott as PM with sloppy Joe Hockey as Treasurer, nope. And, and in Queensland, of course, the Newman government never delivered a budget surplus, despite promising to do so. Uh, earlier this week on Sky News, the Leader of the Opposition, when asked if he would rule out cuts, he said, quote, I'm ruling out being savage. So they're happy to do cuts, just not savage uh, over there. Um, and when you think of the Leader of the Opposition, the word savage doesn't come to mind. More savage garden than savage, I think. And I was very shocked to hear the Leader of the Opposition yesterday. I was very shocked to hear the Leader of the Opposition yesterday in his budget reply talk about a lack of housing options in Aspley. And I've got a couple of points to make about that. Uh, firstly, if the LNP care about housing affordability in Aspley, they really should talk to the person directly responsible for town planning and housing developments for the better part of the last decade in Aspley and indeed across all of Brisbane. And that is, of course, their last candidate for Aspley. So the LNP imply that planning is broken in Brisbane, and then they run the person who ran planning in Brisbane as a candidate in their most marginal seat in Brisbane. The mind boggles. And, se and secondly, and perhaps even more shamelessly. Madam Deputy Speaker. Yes, what's your point of order? My point of order was unparliamentary language just a moment ago from behind me. I'm happy to draw about Madam Deputy Speaker. Okay, thank you. Member for Aspley has a call. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I don't know what's going on over there. Uh, perhaps, more, perhaps more shamelessly, uh, if the LNP think there is a lack of housing options in Aspley, uh, then why have they been imposing the Castle Dine Village in the heart of Aspley? This is a project that will provide a range of affordable housing products directly linked to public transport and adjacent to sporting and transport infrastructure that we are building. So they say in here that they support public uh, housing, they say in here they support affordable housing, but then they don't have the courage to say they support it in the suburbs. Uh, this budget has plenty of great funding uh, for local Aspley roads, of course, with continued funding for Beams Road overpass, uh, Bald Hills Diverging Diamond, a fantastic open uh, project. I turned the sod on uh, with the member for Sandgate recently, uh, jointly funded with the federal government. Uh, we've got Linkfield Road overpass funding. We've got Albany Creek Road, Bang Bangalore Street intersection. Some really great projects. Uh, particularly, I am happy, though, uh, about some local education funding. Uh, so Aspley Special School and Geebung Special School, they're great local schools. They work really well together and they service uh, not just my electorate but the broader north side. I was really pleased to see $5 million this year as part of a total commitment of $11.4 million for additional classrooms for Aspley Special School. That's a really great commitment. Uh, also in this budget, we saw $4 million this year for Geebung Special School uh, out of a total commitment of $7.9 million for additional classrooms. And I've spoken to the schools this week and they're really pleased uh, with those commitments. So, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, the Speaker has reviewed and approved my budget speech for incorporation, and as such, I ask that the remainder of my speech is incorporated into the record of proceedings. Thank you, Member. Madam Deputy Speaker. I call the Member for Warrego. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I rise to contribute to the debate on the appropriation bills. This is a typical Labor budget. Cuts to infrastructure spending of $4 billion, black holes, blank lines and dodgy asset sales to themselves. Madam Deputy Speaker, I wish to commend the Opposition Leader David Christofuli and the Deputy Leader David Janetsky on their budget reply speeches. They have the attention of my former constituents with the Independent Parliamentary Budget 
office to bring Queensland into line with the Commonwealth and other state jurisdictions. One of my constituents, Louise Travers, has made this comment about the budget. She wants a bit of truth about the finances and the promises that have not happened. For example, the Toowoomba Hospital. And it's a fair question too, Madam Deputy Speaker. Madam Deputy Speaker, this government have been saved by Queenslanders. Queenslanders that have been working hard during COVID. Queenslanders who have been innovative and Queenslanders who are paying taxes to the state government. These same Queenslanders are paying the waste tax, the wagering tax, the land tax, the property investor tax, the car stamp duty tax, and all of these taxes were introduced by the Palaszczuk Labor government. Madam Deputy Speaker, it looks as though there is another tax on the way for Queenslanders, and the government's own budget documents point to this. Madam Deputy Speaker, that is the rubbish bin tax, and it's coming to households across the state in 22-23. And I will elaborate more on this shortly. That's it. It's a tax on rubbish. I firstly want to deal with the sham in this budget, the sham sale of the titles office. The dodgy part of this sale is the value on the titles office of $7.8 billion. Two weeks ago in Parliament, the Treasurer said the titles office was valued at $4.2 billion. Well, what happened in the past two weeks? What happened in the past two weeks? How did this revaluation? I wish I could get a revaluation that quickly. Does this dodgy figure, using this dodgy figure, the Queensland government has sold the titles office to an over an overinflated price to itself to wipe the debts from the books? The sale was made from the, tre the Queensland government to Treasury, but no money changed hands. It is dodgy, Madam Deputy Speaker. That's because it is. Through this sham sale, the Queensland Government just reduced its debt figure without actually reducing the level of debt it must repay. It moved the debt uh, sideways. Pause the clock. Member for Harvey Bay, you are warned. Understanding orders. Thank you for your protection, Madam Deputy Speaker. Through the sham sale, the Queensland Government has just reduced the debt figure without actually reducing the level of debt it must repay. It moved the debt sideways, not down. This phony accounting while the state careers towards record debt. It's Labonomics as per usual, and it just doesn't add up. The state Labor government has failed to answer one simple question. Where is the money in this budget to pay for the billions of dollars of promises? The Treasurer made nearly six billion announcements that can't be delivered in this term of parliament. If it's not in the budget, it doesn't exist. So for the benefit of the House, let me list the funds which we have from those opposite without funding. There's a hospital building fund. Nothing in the budget. It didn't even rate a mention as a line item. A housing investment fund. Nothing in the budget. The renewable energy and hydrogen jobs fund. Missing a billion dollars in the budget. The path to treaty fund. Nothing in the budget. The carbon reduction investment fund. Nothing in the budget. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, it truly beggars belief. Where is the money? Madam Deputy, Madam Deputy Speaker, there is a need for the real truth about the finances and the promises of this government. And I table for the information of the House a media release published by the Minister for Environment, who was quoting figures of nine years of funding as one year's expenditure in this year's budget. So the Minister said the funding for councils in this year's budget for Works for Queensland was $900 million. Wrong. It's 100 million. She said the COVID works for Queensland is 200 million. Wrong. This program finishes in 2021. She says that building our regions is 418 million in this budget. Wrong. This year it's 70 million. She said the local government grants and subsidies was 286 million. Wrong. This year it's 25 million. But wait, it gets better. And I'm pleased to see the Minister for Transport's in the, um, in the House. She said the transport infrastructure development TIDS is 700 million in this year's budget. Wrong. It has not increased since 2015, and this budget it's 70 million. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, if the government's own ministers get it wrong and don't know how to read the budget, how are the public supposed to get the full facts on the state of the finances? And Madam Deputy Speaker, when it comes to the Works for Queensland program. The government would have you believe the rivers are flowing with gold to local governments across Queensland. That is not so. 
What the budget documents tell us is the Works for Queensland drops to $70 million in 2022-23. It is further cut to $30 million in 2023-24. And there is a similar story for the South East Queensland Community Stimulus Package. That package drops back to $40 million in 2022-23, and it's further cut to $10 million in 2023-24. There is no way that councils in Queensland will be able to support 26,000 jobs in the future across Queensland with less than half of the funding. This budget tells us the Labor government have cut back local government's sacred cow, works for Queensland. Queensland local governments have been shortchanged. They will not be able to keep up with the demands of population growth for local infrastructure like parks and footpaths, curbing and channelling or security. Four o'clock. Member for Logan, you are warned under standing orders. Madam Deputy Speaker, whilst on the local government issues, what an appalling attack we had this morning from the Treasurer on the Brisbane City Council Mayor and councils in receipt of the waste levy advance payment. And the Treasurer said, councils should be so lucky taking credit for a rebate that the Labor government is giving to households via them. Why is it that Labor governments hate councils so much? What we have learned from this budget is the waste levy advance payments for councils is only confirmed for 21-22. There is no commitment to continue these payments beyond 2022 to 39 local governments. Councils will be forced in future to hike rates to meet the forward estimate revenues for Labor's waste tax. Councils will become the tax collectors for the state government in the future. Councils will be forced. Member Four, is that Gimpy? You are warned understanding orders. Councils will be forced to collect approximately a billion dollars for the state government waste tax over the forward estimates. The rubbish bin tax will be the sixth tax from this Labor government. This waste tax has already shoveled millions of dollars into the Labor government coffers and Labor has failed to drive the investment into the recycling and resource recovery. Local government are once again faced with doing the heavy lifting of tax collection for the failures of the state Labor government in the future. And what we know is this Labor government have misled Queensland local governments and misled every Queenslander who has a wheelie bin. They are treating local governments like a poor cousin once more, and they are treating honest Queenslanders as fools. Aged care homes and the not-for-profits will have to pay for the rubbish bin tax in the future. And we already know the member for Gavin is not good with figures. That's clear to see. So how will she explain to her Gold Coast constituents how they will have to pay another $88 per year for the rubbish bin tax? And I look forward to how the Premier will explain to her constituents why are they going to pay another $88 per year for their rubbish bins when she, has, when, she has, when she was the one who gave the commitment that Queensland families will not face the cost of this levy. The budget papers tell us this is a broken promise. How will the member for Bundaberg explain to his constituents in Bundaberg that in future they may have to pay more than $88 per year for their rubbish tax? And that's not the only explaining that the member for Bundaberg will have to do. And I table a copy of last year's budget where the Bundaberg flood levy was clearly articulated as a budget line item. The Bundaberg flood levy has vanished as a line item in this year's budget. That's right, no line item at all for the Bundaberg flood levy. So here we have the member for Bundaberg who made great promises at the state election and he has lost the money for the Bundaberg flood levy from this budget. And Madam Deputy Speaker, let's not forget that he lost the level five hospital as well. So Madam Deputy Speaker, we've heard a lot through this parliament about the Roma hospital. So just for the record, this hospital redevelopment started under former Minister for Health, Lawrence Springborg. This was a hospital where you could put your hand through the walls to the daylight on the outside and it was riddled with concrete cancer. It would have started to collapse if it was not for the redevelopment that started under the LNP. Successive Labor governments drove the infrastructure into the ground, literally. And I want to place on record my thanks for a person who was not at the opening, however, was pivotal in guiding the hospital through the funding gates. And that's former CEO, Glenis Schultz. She was tireless in her drive to achieve a new hospital for Roma. Without her, this hospital would not have happened. Thank you, Glenis. And we heard the Premier this week say, no matter where across our state families live, 
they should have good, a good quality health system. Well, Premier, there needs to be some more support for local health professionals in Roma to deliver that good quality health system. Just ask William Titmarsh of Roma. His original referral was in September 2019 to the Roma Hospital for a hip replacement. Finally, after my representations, he's made it onto the wait list for the Brisbane Marta Hospital for elective surgery. So he may well have to wait another 365 days for his surgery. That's about three years since his first appointment before he will even be looking at getting his surgery. I don't agree that this is a good quality health system, nor does Mr Titmarsh, who's had that long wait. And whilst I'm on health, the Tara Hospital is crying out for more support from the government. More nurses are desperately needed due to an increase in the population across that region. And Madam Deputy Speaker, in the time I have remaining, I have some constituent budget requests which I wish to address. Councillor Robin Firmister wants a guaranteed advance waste levy payment to councils for more than a year. Well, Robin, this budget clearly shows that in 2022 the rubbish bin tax will start. Leslie Cook wants to deal with the lack of affordable medical assistance and the lack of birthing services at the Chinchilla Hospital. Well, Leslie, I too am passionate about birthing services at Chinchilla. However, this government doesn't seem to share our passion. Angie Hockday wants more dollars and subsidy to transport recycling from the southwest to the east for processing. Angie, it's a great suggestion, and the government have had three years to pick up on this initiative for recycling. However, they've done nothing. Sally Hemming wanted to talk about the poor condition of the regional roads, especially for heavy vehicles that um, use these roads. And Sally, unfortunately, there's a $6 billion maintenance backlog on the state road control system, and the budget fails feels very short of addressing that backlog. And God, I'll take that interjection. How much will it go up this year, that backlog on those state control roads? Andrew and Wendy Henning um, would, said it would be wonderful if rural and remote education in Queensland could be considered in the budget. Well, Andrew and Wendy, the budget has a record spend on education. However, some of the more immediate issues, like water supply for schools, has not rated a mention, nor has accommodation for school camps for distance education students. And Liz Hill wants more affordable housing for small rural towns. Liz, there's a housing investment fund promised. However, there are no funds in the budget for that fund. And I, find, I, I think Liz will have some real difficulty trying to get you know, that housing investment fund out in the regional areas. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, this is truly a typical Labor budget, a typical Labor budget that disappoints. Thank Madam you. Speaker. I call the member for Bun... I'll just wait for silence. I'll call the member for Bundamba. Thank you, Acting Deputy Speaker. And Queensland continues to lead the nation in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Our ongoing response is one of strength, solidarity, determination and commitment. It is typical of our great state and these very same character characteristics shine bright in our 2021-22 budget. This budget delivers a fair go for our local community in Bundamba, both now and into the future. New schools, healthcare upgrades and major infrastructure investments will support thousands of new, secure local jobs at a time when we need them most. We've delivered a record $22.2 billion health budget that delivers record uh, frontline services and health staff for our local community. It means $750 million for local Ipswich health services, an increase of $59.45 million from last year's budget alone and a whopping 64 per cent increase since the Palaszczuk Labor government was elected. It includes $101.2 million for construction projects to expand and improve facilities at the Ipswich Hospital precinct, including a new acute mental health unit and $1.6 million for the Park uh, Centre for Mental Health. This budget also commits $7.2 million towards the 26-bed uh, expansion at Ipswich Hospital and $5.3 million to secure additional bed capacity. 
There is also initial funding towards a brand new dedicated alcohol and drug rehabilitation centre. Yeah. And in a huge boost for our local community, South Ripley will be home to the brand new Ipswich Satellite Hospital at Barrams Road. Yeah. A business case is now being prepared for a 2.7 hectare site for community health care, including ambulatory and low acuity day uh, therapy like renal dialysis, chemotherapy, complex wound, wound management and urgent care for minor injury and illness. Our local community will also be supported by $177 million for a 174 bed public hospital at Springfield. What this all means is more world class health services closer to home in our community. The budget also delivers $3 million to progress a new ambulance station and police facility uh, in Ripley. We have a record $15.3 billion uh, for the education budget, which will see new schools open in Ripley, Augustine Heights, uh, by 2023, along with two new schools in the Bellbird Park, Collingwood Park and Red Bank Plains areas by 2024. Our existing schools will benefit from a further $39.8 million, supporting the expansion and upgrades of schools in Bellbird Park, Goodna, Red Bank Plains, Red Bank and Ripley Valley. We're also backing uh, training and apprenticeships with $3.3 million to expand the Metal Trade Centre and deliver a new manufacturing and robotics centre at the Ipswich TAFE campus at Bundamba. We're investing a massive $2.9 billion for social housing through our $1.9 billion over four years uh, program to increase social housing stock and a new $1 billion housing investment fund to support current and future housing need. Through this, we're fast-tracking uh, more supply of almost 10,000 social homes over the life of our housing strategy. That includes almost $52 million in this budget for Ipswich. And we recently opened facilities at Bellbird Park and Red Bank, with an additional two sites at Red Bank uh, currently under construction. Deputy Speaker, cheaper, cleaner energy is what Queensland's need to get ahead as we continue our focus on the post-COVID economic recovery. And this budget commits a record $2 billion energy investment to continuing powering our economic recovery. Our commitment to publicly owned power assets and homegrown Queensland renewables continues to keep power prices down for local homes and businesses. We're investing $15.2 million in our local Swanbank E power station, publicly owned by Cleanco, to support a major overhaul that will deliver local jobs. We've installed 536 solar panels at Bundamba State Secondary College, which joins 270 panels at Kruger State School as part of our landmark $97 million Advancing Clean Energy Schools program, and our nation-leading $2 billion Renewable Energy and Hydrogen Jobs Fund will drive local supply chains and advance manufacturing jobs. We have the skills and workforce to manufacture the components and new technology Queensland needs to meet our renewable energy target. Solar panels, electrolyzers, wind turbines and batteries can and should be made right here in Queensland. This budget delivers the investment our publicly owned energy companies need to support our 9,500 strong energy workforce, supercharge job creation and put Queensland jobs front and centre of our renewables revolution. This is a budget for the Bundamba community and all Queenslanders that continues our great state's strong recovery by delivering more health care, education, community services, housing, roads, infrastructure, renewables and most importantly, jobs. Yeah. Deputy Speaker, the Deputy Speaker has reviewed and approved my budget speech for incorporation, and as such, I ask that the remainder of my speech be incorporated into the record of proceedings. Yes, Madam Thank Speaker. you, Member. I call the Member for Cynic Rim. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, this budget is a sham. It's full of smoke and mirrors and shonky propositions, and the biggest shonky proposition put out there by the government is this $7.8 billion net debt reduction uh, associated with the Land Titles Office, plucked out of the air in the form of a transfer from the Land Titles Office from one government section to another government section to reduce the debt figure in the budget. It's uh, without actually reducing a single, by a single cent, not one cent, the actual dollar amount of debt to be paid 
uh, by Queensland to its creditors. This is tricky accounting, but sadly it's just the latest uh, thing in a long line of trickery and cover-ups when it comes to budgets from this government. And I think people need to ask, though, if the government's shuffling the titles office around, how long will it be until it's flogged off? I mean, Queensland knows that the Labor Party has form in selling assets. Who sold the assets? The Labor sold the assets. We've got Queensland Rail that they sold. There's a long list of them here, Madam Deputy Speaker, a long list of them. Uh, the Port of Brisbane, Order Queensland members. Railways, Forestry Plantations, Queensland, Labor sold the assets. And I can just see it now. I can see it now. Treasurer Dick getting it ready, fattening it up for sale in the future, just like New South Wales has, just like Victoria has. Why else would you go through the process of this shonky accounting procedure that they've already done it? Who sold Queensland Rail? Who sold Queensland Rail? Answer that, Minister Hinchcliffe. Queensland Rail sold by the Labor Party. And why did they do it? Why did they do it? They did it because they were under duress and because Order the creditors members. were coming to get them. The creditors were coming for the, the credit rating. In fact, they'd already lost the AAA credit rating when they sold Queensland Rail, but they were trying to do something about debt back then. They were concerned about the, the debt levels of government. Interest rates are low now, but how long until they go up again? And there seems to be some consensus out there in the financial community, especially in the Minister. way of uh, the opinion put forward by Terry McCrown, especially, that inflation is going up around the world, and when that hits Australia, we're going to see interest rates go up as well. And what's that going to do to the Labor budget then? It will blow it out of the water. The servicing of that debt will go through the roof, and then we'll see this government looking for things to do, either to raise taxes or sell assets, and the title's office will be ready, because the Treasurer has got it ready for sale. So I think we need to look, on, look at that very carefully in the future, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, when it's going to be sold off, cashed in to reduce the crippling interest bills that Queensland is going to face in the future. I'll take that. Maybe you should take it, uh, rule it out, because I, I don't think he has ruled it out. Uh, and in fact, if he did rule it out at this point in time. Pause the clock. Yes, point of order. We've just debated a bill where we actually uh, legislated that it be preserved, and there is, he is misleading the House. Thank you, Member for Logan. There is no. Member for Logan, there is a process for misleading the House. If you feel that has occurred, you can write to the Speaker. Member for Senior Karim, you have the call. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Cameron Dick has laid the ground to sell the titles office just like they sold the assets before. And, uh, but it's a long, as I said, it's a long line of budget trickery. We had the cancelled budget last year when the government chose deliberately to hide the financial position. To from Queenslanders before the election, before the election, we should have had the budget before the election, but they they hid the financial uh, uh, state of the finances from Queenslanders, and then they sprung $28 billion worth of extra debt on the people uh, after the election, which wasn't promised. And before that, they had the rating of the public service uh, super fund, the defined benefit scheme. So now there's a one in two chance of that going to default into the future, according to um, reports about that. And now we've got the blowout in Cross River Rail costs as well, which the member for Chatsworth has very well highlighted. There's a lot of questions about uh, this budget, a lot of questions about uh, the finances of Queensland, in fact. Uh, revenue is up in this budget, according to the budget papers, but infrastructure spending is down. And uh, as far as I can see, health spending is stagnant. If you take out the additional money that's actually been given to the state by the LNP federal government. Thank you to the Canberra government uh, for doing that. The Treasurer says you can't build Cross River Rail twice, and that might be why there's a dip in infrastructure spending. But I'm not even sure if, that's, uh, if they'll build it for that budgeted figure, in fact. But that's no excuse for a cut, Madam Deputy Speaker. A savage cut, in fact, to the infrastructure budget of Queensland. It is a savage cut to take out $4 billion from the infrastructure spending when there's so many other things that, that could be spent on. We have a nearly $6 billion backlog on the maintenance of state-controlled roads and a whole heap of other major road infrastructure projects that could be invested in. But they're not in the Ford estimates. They're not in the Ford estimates because they're not budgeted for. And obviously there is going to be a cut to infrastructure spending across the state just at the time when we need it. Like the Cunningham Highway, uh, we need investment there desperately. And we need more on the Mount Lindsay Highway. But that's not there in the Fords, even. Uh, uh, even anyway, but uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, why should we be surprised about this, especially when it comes to the Cunningham Highway? Um, we've uh, seen we have Labor MPs in Ipswich 
who refuse to stand up for their community time and time again to get action on the Amberley Interchange, a project that remains on the never-never in this budget uh, because of the inaction of this government in bringing forward a design, a cost of design, that they can seek funding from the federal government for. I was appalled to see Labor members in their speeches, uh, and uh, I refer especially to the member for Ipswich West, didn't mention the Cunningham Highway once in his budget reply speech, even though it runs to the Amberley Air Base, which is in the, on the side of his electorate, and thousands of people go there every day. Uh, from what I saw from the member for Ipswich, didn't mention it either. And that's a disgrace, because in this chamber just a few weeks ago, they had the gall to mention the Cunningham Highway as an issue with the federal budget. The federal government has got money on the table for that highway, but there is nothing to build in that part of the world, and that lies at the feet of this government here in Brisbane. Even Shane Newman, the federal Labor member for Blair, knows this is the problem. But this government and those members refuse to do anything about it because they take uh, Ipswich for granted. They always do. It's an absolute disgrace, and, and what they need to get on uh, with actually a project that can be built there before someone else is killed. And people have been killed there before, and we don't want to see that again, uh, whether it's from my electorate or from the member for Ipswich West or Ipswich's electorate. Although, sadly, Madam Deputy Speaker, I do fear at this point in time that's exactly what it will take uh, to get the attention of this government to that point of the world. Madam Deputy Speaker, there has been roadworks carried out in my electorate of late, and I appreciate the effort of Transport and Main Roads officers to actually get those projects funded through a combination of state and federal funding. And I need to emphasise the federal funding, especially on Boona Ipswich Road, $7.9 million in total, 3.7 of that came from Canberra. Especially on uh, Bodesert, uh, Bean Lee Road, $12 million spent, 50 per cent of which came from Canberra. And also there's significant uh, investment as well from the federal government in road safety projects along that stretch. I think around 80 per cent. Nothing would be happening without the injection of funds from the Commonwealth, and that is a disgrace which, uh, again, lies at the feet of this government here in Brisbane. Um, they need to invest more in our roads, and when you see there's an infrastructure cut, it makes it even more disgraceful. Can I just turn to the waste tax? There's been some talk about that in this chamber in the last few days. It hasn't slowed down the growth uh, in dumps here in, in, in Ipswich. Uh, there are three dumps proposed in my electorate at this point in time. There's a major court action going on at the moment, which Ipswich City Council is defending on behalf of the ratepayers of Ipswich. But it's costing hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, for the council to defend those actions. This government, and I've called on them repeatedly to do this, should call in those projects and knock them on the head for the benefit of those people who live near those proposed dump sites. But they won't do it. They won't do it because the waste tax has always been and always will be just another source of revenue for this government. And we see that again in this budget where in the forward estimates there is no revenue at all uh, for the continuation of payments to uh, councils to offset the wheelie bin costs. And, uh, and if it's not in the forwards, it's not in the budget. So I think householders have every reason to fear that they are going to see an increase in their wheelie bin charges next year. Uh, because uh, it's not in the forwards. And if it's not in the forwards, it's not in the budget. I hear the minister saying nonsense. Well, if it's nonsense, minister, they should have had funding in the budget to continue that subsidy into the future. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, can I also mention the irrigation tariffs? And the well, minister for, um, who can, uh, oversees electricity in the state has spoken about the additional subsidies or uh, measures that are going to be put in place for irrigators and other uh, special users who are going off transitional tariffs uh, in the Ergon area. Uh, this completely ignores, completely ignores the fact that there are farmers in South East Queensland, who are uh, hundreds of them in fact, who have been using those transitional tariffs and that have been maintained by energy retailers even when the regulatory regime around them was discontinued uh, three or four years ago. Uh, they have been continuing those tariffs um, because they know that they are beneficial to those farmers. This new measures put in place by the government, the new measures put in place by the government completely ignore farmers and SEQ uh, and that should be accounted for because we all need to support our farmers in South East Queensland, in the scenic room, in the Lockyer, whether it's in the Somerset area as well, which the member for Nanango represents. They need those nighttime tariffs, they need those low cost tariffs because of the inherent uncertainty involved in agriculture. But they have been completely ignored by this government, even though they must have known. They surely would have known 
that it is an issue for the Energex area as well. So I look to the minister to come up with a solution which puts them on the same footing as the people in the Ergon area, or better, if that, if that be the case, because of the importance of the, and I know the member for Lockyer would like to see a better situation for our farmers, but, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, at the moment they have been completely ignored. When we talk about the um, Mount Lindsay Highway uh, again. Pause the clock. Minister, that. I'll ask that you not quarrel across the chamber. Thank you. Come back, come back to the Mount Lindsay Highway again. It's a major issue for the Senate Grim electorate. And can I just I see the member for Logan here perking up because he wants to have a go at me. But what I'll just say about the member for Logan is that he remains the luckiest state MP in Queensland because he has been allowed to escape responsibility for the Mount Lindsay Highway because the federal government the federal government has stepped up to the plate with 80 per cent funding for a lot of sections along that road, even though this member and his predecessors and his predecessors and his predecessors, and some of you across there were responsible for this as well, caused all the problems on the Mount Lindsay Highway. The federal government, the federal government is chipping in to the, the tune of, I think, over $100 million at the moment. And we are starting to see some progress on that road, but it's very slow progress. And the member for Logan takes responsibility for that slow progress in getting planning going. And I'll just give you an example. There's $97.8 million in the budget uh, for that highway at the moment, and uh, $80 million of that is federal funding. $80 million out of $97.8 million. Now, so I, 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 I know that the member for Logan will keep trying, but uh, thank God for the federal government, for Scotty Buckholz and for Scott Morrison coming to the party. And when, we look at the, when we look at the aspects of the Mount Lindsay Highway that are actually paid for by the state, they are few and far between, and they are minuscule compared to the federal funding. But we have got some, we've got some planning work uh, going on uh, between North McLean and Camp Cable Road. Uh, there is uh, $1 million in 21-22 and I think a similar amount in 22-23. Why so slow? Get on with it. This road has been shocking for the last 30 years, and they're still drip feeding planning money to get it out there. Uh, there's two million dollars for safety works between Bow Desert and the border, and it's from it's it's time from 2022, 2023, and beyond in the out years, and that's a disgrace. I mean, it's it's they're tight. Tiny amounts compared to what really needs to be done, and they're in the out years. We see also uh, on a different uh, side of the electorate, Warrell View to Peak Crossing Road, 232,000. I mean, that is uh, not necessary work, but that's delayed until 2022-23. I mean, when we're trying to generate jobs and get infrastructure spending going for such a small amount, why put it in the out years? And then we've also got uh, issues with the Bow Desert Boona Road at Colson, which is two point six two five million dollars and there are issues with that road that need fixing but again they're way out beyond 2022 23 and beyond nothing for Boona Rath Downey Road which is like a go track in some parts and caravans and other tourist things very re re regularly have near misses on that road and the minister should get that onto the agenda quick smart but that's not doesn't even feature at, at all and nothing uh, more for Boona Ipswich Road as well after the feds came to the party so handsomely uh, with works uh, there just in the last few months. Can I mention specifically the work that is programmed now for Bow Desert State High School to uh, fix their exit uh, and main roads is uh, to, programmed uh, a few hundred thousand dollars work there to commence in July. This is something I first raised with the government in about this month in 2015. So it's only six years that it's taken to get a few hundred thousand dollars worth of work done, but I, I, I thank them for it. But perhaps next time we have a safety issue and a congestion issue that needs to be done and needs to be fixed, they might be able to get onto it a little bit quicker than six years, because it's an absolute disgrace that it took that long. There's also some funding from the local government minister for upgrade facilities at Lake Mogra. Thank you for that. Now perhaps we can get SEQ Water and the council to work together to reinstate all the camping places that were taken away through a new agreement last year, where campsites went from about 400 down to less than 100, depriving our area of so much tourist income. If we're going to get those new facilities, we should increase those numbers again. And I'll mention briefly, in the time remaining, the fire ant program failed. Fire ants continue to spread, and I see this week the program is putting out a call to rejig the national agreement. 
What that means is they need more money because they've wasted all the money they've had and still fire ants continue to spread. We need the Auditor General to look at that, Madam Deputy Speaker. Thank you. The member's time has expired. I commend the member for Logan on his restraint and uh, call the member for Mulgrave. Madam Deputy Speaker, I rise to make a contribution to this cognate debate, including the Appropriation Parliament Bill 2021. The budget bills before the House again support Queensland's economy during this time of global crisis and, importantly, supports jobs today and future employment opportunities in our growing communities. To this end, I wish to speak about the support for the growing film industry in Queensland, and especially in Far North Queensland. A few weeks ago, I was excited to be appointed as the Far North Queensland Screen Champion. I'm already working on attracting productions to create jobs and maximise opportunities for the vibrant Far North Queensland screen sector. Beyond regional strengths in tourism and agriculture, the Far North is increasingly recognised as an attractive and safe destination for local and international film and television production. The natural breathtaking scenery in the Far North provides the perfect backdrop. I was proud to launch with the Premier the Far North Queensland Stream Strategic Plan in 2019 to boost professional capacity, support local creatives and foster a positive screen culture in the region. As Treasurer, I was proud to fund our production attraction strategy in 2015, which has now seen $100 million of support provided. The government's investment in the Far North Queensland screen industry has also delivered results. Since the start of 2020, we've seen extraordinary interest and investment in Queensland screen industry, with 39 productions secured by Screen Queensland, injecting an estimated $437 million into the local economy and creating more than 5,500 jobs. Recent productions in the Far North include Dive Club, airing on Network 10 and Netflix, Straight to the Plate on SBS and NITV, crime series drama crime drama series Tropo and the drama series Irreverent, both to air on the ABC. This budget lays down a further $71 million, including $53 million for the production attraction strategy and $4 million earmarked specifically for developing the industry in the Far North. I look forward to working with Screen Queensland and key stakeholders to champion investment in the Far North screen sector, support jobs for local screen practitioners and drive the delivery of state-of-the-art production facilities in the region. As Screen Champion, I'll also be an advocate for local storytellers, including First Nations writers and directors who are bringing stories of the far north to screens across the world. We should not underestimate the growing demand for new screen productions. The growing demand for content on Stan, Netflix and other streaming services requires new film production facilities to meet this demand. That's why I'm proud to be working to deliver the government's election commitment for a $6.8 million production facility in the far north. As chair of the implementation group tasked to deliver the facility, I'll be working with Screen Queensland to provide the Far North with a facility to drive more local screen productions of global quality. Importantly, the new Far North Queensland production facility will become a vital piece of economic infrastructure, supporting screen projects that will support local jobs and businesses. The new Far North production facility will further strengthen and diversify the Far North Queensland economy, and I look forward to the day when the screen industry is seen as one of the key industries of our local economy. As Speaker of the Queensland Legislative Assembly, I also wish to make a few specific remarks about the Appropriation Parliament Bill 2021. In terms of the Appropriation Parliament Bill 2021, the Bill makes provisions for $106 million for the Legislative Assembly and Parliamentary Service for the 2021-22 financial year, a funding level commensurate with the 2020-21 funding levels. In 2021-22 funding includes a capital spend of $7.9 million. Capital projects include continuation of an upgrade to tr critical building infrastructure and services supporting the parliamentary annex, the ongoing electorate office accommodation improvement program and replacement of precinct information technology network infrastructure. The most important commitment made in this budget cycle is the $41 million investment to refurbish the parliamentary annex, commencing in 2022-23. The parliamentary annex is now over 40 years old. It's indeed in need of significant repair and refurbishment. The work needed is not a question of aesthetics. It is a matter of workplace health and safety. I thank the government for their commitment towards ensuring that the facilities that parliamentarians use are fit for purpose. I also thank the opposition for their support for refurbishment of the annex, ensuring that the project has bipartisan support. I believe this outcome, we can actually deliver a value for money outcome that will extend the life of the annex at a fraction of the cost of replacing the building. The $41 million refurbishment of the annex will commence the second stage of the critical infrastructure program. The first stage of this program has been underway since 2019-20 uh, and will conclude in 2021-22. The first stage was supported with total funding of $14.493 million over three years, the final $4.862 million provided for in this year's budget. The first stage involved a major upgrade and replacement of central mechanical services, 
supporting air conditioning systems, which is now completed. Ongoing works include upgrade of fire protection systems in the annex, and major upgrade and replacement of electrical switchboard systems. I can report that the first stage is on track for final completion in June 2022 within budget. The second stage of the critical infrastructure program, which the government has committed to, will be far more wide ranging in scope. The program will deliver a significant mid-life refurbishment and upgrade of major infrastructure to extend its life and bring it in line with current safety and technology standards. The annex upgrade consists of two main components. The first component is an upgrade of the building facade to replace deteriorating concrete exteriors and to improve acoustic noise reductions to members' bedrooms and office floors. The second component is an upgrade of existing members' office and accommodation floors 9 to 23. The office and accommodation upgrade will address the current dated condition, providing equitable access and the flexibility to manage future increases in the number of members. Planning for stage two of the critical infrastructure program would commence in the second half of 2021-22. Practical work would commence in July 2022 over a period of 12 months. Uh, the Deputy Speaker has reviewed and approved my budget speech for incorporation, and as such, I ask that the remaining parts of my speech uh, be incorporated in the record of proceedings. Thank you. I call the member for Theodore. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, before I start, I'd like to uh, also uh, pay uh, my condolences to uh, Mr Duncan Pegg, um, a, a great member of this uh, chamber, and uh, his uh, life was uh, taken certainly too soon. And I uh, certainly uh, served with him on the committee for quite some, uh, quite some time and uh, always enjoyed his company. He's a very decent, or was a very decent human being and his uh, family should be very, very proud of everything he has actually achieved over the years. Um, before I uh, get started with um, the main part of my uh, contribution today, I just want to uh, highlight an issue that uh, has come to my attention through some of my constituents. And that uh, issue is to do with a cut to a program on the Northern Gold Coast with uh, Gold Coast Health. Um, this is an important program. Uh, this is to do with uh, newborn children to highly vulnerable um, families, uh, with, uh, certainly with highly vulnerable uh, needs. And uh, this uh, program is ending at the end of this um, financial year, and I have uh, quite a few residents pleading with the, uh, the government to extend the funding, because these are vulnerable children. These are um, infants to the age of two, where this program actually looks after. It's a nursing program where the uh, nurses go out there to make sure that the uh, children are safe and well and giving support to the families. And it's, we, we talk about in this place about uh, saving money, but uh, when it comes to only a very small um, cost um, burden on the uh, Queensland Health and especially Gold Coast Health, that this program should continue. This program should continue, and that is the uh, home visiting program. So I ask the Minister, please um, look at the budget you've got, uh, continue this program. It, has, it is making a very good impact in the northern Gold Coast, and it is well worthwhile continuing it. Um, we shouldn't be cutting programs that are protecting the most vulnerable in our society. So again, I say to the Minister, please, Talk to your uh, department officers on the Gold Coast and reinstate this department so that its funding can continue. Well, the Theodore Electorate is um, obviously situated on the northern Gold Coast, um, a place that I'm very, very proud of. It is a beautiful electorate. Um, we have suburbia and we have the rolling hills of uh, Mount Tambourine in the back areas. And it's a very diverse area. We have uh, multiple uh, uh, different uh, suburbs uh, which uh, dot throughout the electorate, like Pacific Pines, Oxenford, Wonga Wallen, Guanaba, Kluggerba, Coomera, Upper Coomera, Helensvale, and uh, Moorsland. And each area has their own uh, specific needs. And I like to talk about the, the roads budget because obviously roads are a very important uh, connection piece for all of our electorates. And when it comes to the roads budget for the theatre electorate, yes, we have got some road projects um, coming up uh, soon, which I do appreciate, something that I've been pushing for for quite some time with the uh, department, and that is um, the Gorge Road and Morrison Road intersection, getting signalisation there. Um, that is a very dangerous intersection. And I am happy that um, that finally is getting our funding, and it's, uh, it certainly does warrant it. 
But when I look at the uh, Q-Trip um, information package and what I find with the Q-Trip uh, information package, most of the projects in the theatre electorate are being posted into the Never Never. Air smokes and mirrors. I take that interjection. And as an example, uh, the John Munts Bridge, the, the riverbank upstream from the John Munts Bridge. Uh, this is a, a, a very important issue for my constituents. The reason being is back in 2017, and I've said this in this chamber so many times, back in 2017, the riverbank washed away, which cut the connection road on the north, well, western side of the bridge of the Cooma River. And when it cut that connection road, it caused a catastrophe for residents from all over the northern Gold Coast in the areas of Upper Coomera, Tambourine Mountain, Wonga Walla and Guanabar, Moorsland, because it is the main thoroughfare. So we're looking at around 10,000, 13,000 cars per day actually go across that bridge. And I noticed in the Q-Trip budget that the, they, they made an election promise at the last election. They, they decided to um, uh, listen to the LNP and say, yes, we need to fix this up. But they've actually pulled the uh, funding out to 2023, 2024, um, 2024, 2025. So literally it's in the never, never. So every time we get a flood, more riverbank is washed away, which costs more money than to fix it up. The problem is we're getting to a point that we're going to have to replace the bridge. So spending $920,000 while helping um, Gold Coast City Council repair it, $920,000, 50 50, back in uh, 2017, yes, would have cut it. But now the cost has gone up dramatically because we've lost, you could say, upwards of 100 metres of riverbank. So $2 million in total is not going to cover fixing the riverbank anymore. We're looking at three times that, potentially six to $8 million to fix it. And that is a problem that the government needs to address. Because if we allow more riverbank to wash away, it's going to cost the taxpayer even more. So as an example, you're potentially going to have to spend $50 million to build a whole new bridge, the full length of that floodplain, to protect that vital arterial link. Because that vital arterial link services Mount Tambourine, the tourism areas of Mount Tambourine. And when it went out last time, it crucified those businesses. It crucified them. And those people don't deserve it to go again. They don't deserve to have their, building, uh, their uh, businesses uh, collapse because we, the, the government in this chamber, has not done its uh, proper homework to fix it when they should have fixed it. Also, the, there's a, some funding being allocated for uh, Tamarine Oxford Road, Michigan Drive, which is a very dangerous intersection. But again, this is being put out to the never never, this $2 million. This road is a very dangerous intersection. For motorists turning right out of Michigan Drive, they go along that uh, very busy road, as I said, um, 10 to 13,000 cars per day, and you've actually got a major transport network for the buses. So the buses can sit there for about 15 minutes before they can get a gap. And that stuff's up there, all their timetables. And therefore, and therefore, that ruins the timetable for them going to the train stations. Look, this is a project that needs to be done sooner than later because whilst people are very cautious at entering that intersection and we haven't had a fatality there, there will be one in the near future. And also with Charlie's Crossing, I know it's not on the Q-Trip paper. Charlie's Crossing also desperately needs an upgrade. Ever since the Gold Coast City Council put that new service station in there on the state-controlled road, which main roads ticked off with it and said, oh, they've just got to do these little minor upgrades, it has caused traffic chaos for anybody trying to turn right out of Charlie's Crossing. And people there are getting to a point where they're absolutely fed up of waiting. They're worried about the kids crossing that road because we've got a bus stop on one side and another bus stop on the other side. And in the afternoons and in the mornings, kids actually run across that road. It is so dangerous. This needs to be a priority. It needs to be put in the Q-Trip budget for this year. But it's not going to be. Which many of my residents just feel that they're getting left, left out. 
Henry Roberts Drive, we're getting some money for um, uh, safety works there, but we're still not getting money for a safe turn left lane into Her Henry Roberts Drive from the Gorge Road. And we need that because it's on, a it's on the reverse side of a blind hill. And that reverse side of a blind hill, when you're decelerating to go into Henry Roberts Drive, many occasions I've seen near misses because you'd be flying over the hill at 80 kilometres an hour like everybody else does, and there's a car uh, slamming their brakes on because they're trying to make that turn. And many a times you see cars swerve out into oncoming traffic to avoid running in the back of another vehicle. It is a dangerous, it is a danger and it needs to be looked at. But when it comes to my uh, local schools, I want to thank the uh, Minister for Education for sending out a nice little uh, spreadsheet and uh, giving us a little bit of an update about what's happening in our schools. But when it comes to our schools, we only got a very small amount of money. We have old schools in the theatre electorate. We've got one of the oldest schools on the Gold Coast, and that's Coomera State School. And Coomera State School desperately needs a lot of TLC spent on it because it's got new schools getting built all around it, all around it. And therefore, parents are going, oh, well, I'm going to send my children to these new schools when they don't realise that Coomera State School is a fantastic school. It doesn't have the brand spanking new buildings like these new, uh, like Pitney Creek, but it is a fantastic school and it's because of its age, they've got rid of all the teething problems, the school's working well. But the thing is with this school, it needs, it desperately needs that extra funds spent on it. But also, the department should not be taking, allowing um, further, um, uh, it's taking students away from its catchment area because at the moment Coomera State School has multiple classrooms which are sitting empty because all these new schools are taking all these new, uh, all these children and they're not going to the older school. So I asked the, the Minister for Education, redo the boundaries for the catchments to get that population up in that local school because every time the population drops in that school they lose a the deputy principal, they lose skilled teachers which are very, very hard to replace for those areas because those areas, those teachers have been there for many, many years and they know the environment. They know how to deal with the families there and the children. And I say to the department, please, you need to keep those students and allow that school to increase in population, to keep those great teachers there. Um, also, some other schools like Park Lake, they certainly need a facility upgrade. They need to uh, certainly uh, uh, increase the size of their staff room for um, learning uh, outcomes for the, uh, the, the staff there to actually help with profession, uh, professional development. Um, again, because their staff room, when they first built the school, is obviously dramatically increased since then, and that would be something which would be well worthwhile. But something what constantly teachers and uh, my principals certainly say to me is we need head of year levels to guide teachers, to be like master teachers, to give help to those teachers to ensure that they are uh, getting the proper support that they need to um, teach those classrooms well. And therefore, that's something that um, the department certainly needs to look in, and that's something my principals and my PNCs have been very, very vocal about over the years. Um, my sporting facilities, unfortunately, again, uh, I, I uh, sent a a letter, well, I actually did a question on notice to the uh, Minister for Sport, um, highlighting the deficiencies with uh, my local sporting gl uh, clubs in their desperate need to upgrade their facilities. And their facilities are like uh, Cooma Hope Island, they're desperately after uh, lighting and also an upgrade to their uh, cricket club. Their clubhouse is very old, it's um, an old wooden uh, structure and they want to get a lot more uh, female players involved. The problem is they don't have the facilities to properly cater for them, so we need to spend money to fix that up. Also, the Coomera Colts, which is a soccer club, they're desperately after money to fix up their falling down facilities. Their old clubhouse, it's got cracks through it, um, the, uh, the, the septic system doesn't, uh, well, the toilet system doesn't work very well, and it's a major issue. It's also one of the largest soccer clubs in South East Queensland. And I can certainly say it's the largest soccer club in the northern Gold Coast. Uh, Helensville Hawks, um, the cricket club, they're after obviously more. They're, they'll be. I don't take that interjection. Um, I'm sorry, but the uh, Ormo won't beat them. 
the Helen Fall Hawks um, there after additional change rooms for their female players, and also the uh, Coomera Magpies are desperately after an upgrade to their uh, clubhouse. Um, when it comes to public transport in the area, I'd just like to highlight a desperate need to increase our bus, um, uh, buses in the western areas and also around the Helensville area. Um, many of the elderly residents so go uh, local shopping down at um, Sir John uh, Owen's uh, uh, Drive. They, they unfortunately have to go along Discovery Drive and walk upwards of uh, one and a half kilometres to get to the shopping centre. If they go down the, um, the, the road I just suggested, then they would actually have a five minute, uh, you could say a minute walk into the shopping centre, and that would actually make their lives so much easier, the elderly residents in the Helensville area. But uh, also, we have a wake park, a good sports park in the area, which if we actually had a bus transport into that wake park, that would make a huge difference, especially for younger people in the area. That would actually help that business through the tough times, but most importantly, get young people involved in these sporting activities, and especially wakeboard riding. It's a fun sport, and I certainly say to anybody, come down to that uh, wakeboard park. Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Pine Rivers. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And it is an absolute honour to rise this mm. afternoon and support this fantastic Labor budget. Mm. And can I start off first and foremost by um, thanking and commending the Treasurer on such a fantastic job this budget. This budget delivers for Queensland from end to end. And you know it's a really good budget when you've got those opposite tying themselves in loops trying to figure figure out why it's a bad one. And it could just be fundamentally that they can't comprehend debt reduction without actually sacking people, without decimating people's lives, without putting them out of house and home. It could just Order. be that they don't understand how future funds work. And I hear members opposite, even this afternoon, still asking questions about this, still putting questions to the minister, despite it being asked every single question time multiple times. Order. The answers are sufficient. Order. The answers are sufficient. I take those interjections, thank you, Deputy Speaker. And can I just say that the answers are sufficient, and I recommend that those opposites actually think a little Order, more member for about how um, budgets work. Um, if, they were, if they were to simply look up a definition Member for Pine Rivers, you have the call. Thank you. A definition of a budget, they'd find Investopedia, I think, had the best explanation that I really liked, and I think is easy for those opposite to comprehend. A budget is an estimation of revenue and expenses over a specified future period of time, and it's usually compiled and re-evaluated on a periodic basis. Well, that's exactly what this budget's doing. And while they're saying that it's smoke and mirrors, when they're saying it's just guesses, when they're saying it's full of holes, if they actually think back to what a budget is, it's based on estimates that Treasury make. We have economic managers, specialists, experts who work in Treasury, who figure this stuff out, who provide it to government, and we figure out expenditure from there. And can I say that those opposite need only look at the facts, Madam Deputy Speaker, in relation to the position, the economic position that Queensland is in right here and now, Queensland is creating more jobs than other states. Our employment is the fastest growing employment in the nation. And Queenslanders here living today are paying less tax than the average Australian. And we've got lower property stamp duty than any other state. Madam Deputy Speaker, this budget delivers for all of Queensland. I want to talk specifically about some of, some of the health infrastructure in my electorate of Pine Rivers. This budget starts off our satellite hospital and can I commend the Premier, the Deputy Premier and Minister for um, Health, the a member for Redcliffe, on this initiative. It is fantastic. It will free up our local hospital beds. It will ensure that people can access their health services closer to home. It's a really exciting initiative. I know my community is embracing it wholeheartedly. Um, and the satellite hospital, with the preferred location 
of the university campus at Petrie will be a game changer for health service delivery in my local community. The Prince Charles, of course, is our major hospital, and the publicly owned car park will be a, a transformative piece of infrastructure there at that facility. I know personally I've spent a lot of time in that hospital car park over the last few months. I know how expensive it is, and I know what a burden that is on households right across my community. So that is a fantastic deliverable in this budget. The Pine Rivers Health, um, Community Health Building in Strathpine is receiving major works to infrastructure, mechanical services, aircon and electrical, along with the Caboolture Community Health Centre. And the ambulance station in Petrie is getting relocated from its location in Petrie to Gympie Road in Launton, which is a far better site. It's a site that the ambulance service is already using for some particular services. I went and I thanked those frontline service workers um, after the COVID pandemic um, uh, had its peak. And um, that, that workforce there, those officers, those paramedics, are well and truly keen to move into our new facility in Launton. This is a budget for education, and we invest in education. We invest in our future generation. There is a really exciting bill. I want to thank the member uh, for McConnell, the minister, for this um, education budget. There's a really exciting build that she came and visited in my electorate only a few short weeks ago at Bray Park High. We're putting in a new innovation centre there with additional classrooms, custom-made learning spaces. It is a fantastic addition to the Bray Park State High School, one that I know the growing school community is absolutely in need of. At Bray Park High, we're delivering a new outdoor learning centre there. Uh, we've also got a refurbishment of, of STEM classrooms as well. At Debra State School, we've got accessible pathways that we're just kicking off building now, and we're also building them a new senior playground. We've got a Pine River Special School where we're putting in a new administration building and additional classrooms. And at Strathpine West, we're refurbishing their preppies block, and we've also got a project to expand their outside school hours care, something that they so desperately need. Road infrastructure is all always important in my electorate, given its size and diversity. I want to thank the member for Miller for his investment and his continuing work on some of these projects that we've just got to get a little tweaked. So the budget delivers for roads and transport infrastructure right through our community, from the upgrade at the Strathpine Shopping Centre bus facility through to the park and ride at Fernie Grove. The member for Fernie Grove sitting here now, and Minister, I know you've worked so hard to achieve this project, uh, one that uh, members in my Sanford community will absolutely benefit from. There's roadworks up Mount Nebo, Mount Glorious, the Sanford Road upgrades, safety works along Eaton's Crossing Road. And I know the member for Aspley has worked so hard, along with the member for Sandgate, for the Gympie Road arterial upgrades on Strathpine Road and Linkfield Road as well. I want to thank the member for Morayfield, our police minister. He's investing in a new Debra police station. So we're going to kick off the consultation. Debra is a really special community. We want to make sure the facade of that police station is right and the interior is fit for purpose for Sergeant Ken and the team out there. And can I also thank the member for Sandgate and the Deputy Premier for the um, investments that they're making uh, in the Nolan Park um, track. Um, it's a Pine Rivers BMX track um, that we're relocating for the community. It is a fantastic partnership program, one that will have a world-class facility for our local community uh, right in the heart of Brendale. Uh, Deputy Speaker, just in the couple of minutes, um, that I have left. Can I thank, of course, the Treasurer and the Premier on this fantastic, um, fantastic budget. But I also want to recognise the member for Stretton as well, in that he is not here today. But um, my Facebook memory showed um, a four-year memory where I delivered my budget speech, and he was actually up the back, um, up to his usual mischief. And, um, and it, it put a big smile on my face. He, um, he asked me to actually make a condolence speech for him, so I'll do that at a later date. But um, can I just say, in terms of this thing week, that he is very dearly missed and pass along my condolences to his friends and family and his wonderful community that will miss him terribly. Thank you. Oh, hang on, hang on. Sorry. <laughs> Deputy Speaker, um, I've reviewed and approved the budget. Uh, Deputy Speaker has a, a reviewed and approved the budget speech for incorporation. And as such, I ask that the remainder of my speech is incorporated into the record of proceedings. Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Lytton. 
Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I too would like to echo the words of many members in the House that have acknowledged the great Duncan Pegg and thank him for his dedication to our great Australian Labor Party and to his community and to his family and friends. He was a great colleague and a great advocate for everyone that, um, in his community and he worked tirelessly. So he will be sadly missed. Rest in peace, Duncan. Um, it's really great to stand up um, today to speak about a great Labor budget and I'd like to begin by acknowledging and thanking the Treasurer and his staff because I know that undertaking such, a, a, uh, an, uh, such an undertaking is a big ask. So I thank you for the great work that he's done. Deputy Speaker, the world is inching towards a new normal and 21, 2021 is the year of the vaccination and like many I've had my jab. Queenslanders have followed the expert advice, done the right thing and worked together. I saw my Bayside's rally. We have connected, helped and supported each other and we are ready and stronger and I thank you for this. I thank them for this. The Palaszczuk Labor government gets it and we are on your side. It is, and it's clear that the Queensland Economic Recovery Plan is working. This plan recognised and acknowledged the issues that are important to all Queenslanders and all Bayside's. We also know that when we protect the health of Queenslanders, then jobs will grow. The importance of exceptional health care and hospitals, schools that educate our kids for jobs of the future, safer roads and the importance of social and community support are the cornerstone of Labor values. And this budget strengthens the core values of the Palaszczuk Labor governments. Health care, education, infrastructure, renewables and jobs. It is a true Labor budget. We are building more schools. We are building better roads and a workforce for tomorrow. We are equipping Queenslanders with the skills they need to succeed and unlocking the opportunities our state requires to grow and flourish. This budget is about jobs. It's about working with communities. It's about businesses and industries across Queensland to create jobs and to recover. It is responding to the needs of Queenslanders, setting out a clear economic plan, growing innovation, attracting investment and building infrastructure. And it responds to the needs of Queenslanders and Bayside's because everybody and every business matters. With an eye to the future, the Palaszczuk government has allocated record education funding across the state and Bayside kids are really benefiting. With Darling Point Special School receiving $6 million and Manly State School receiving $2.2 million for, the, for additional classrooms. Manly State School is also in line for a further $500,000 for playground upgrades with Manly West State School, Wandle Heights State School, Wynnum West State School all receiving funding for a range of projects including outside of school hours, care for, um, amenities, playgrounds and other amenity upgrade. There is also $850,000 allocated for maintenance across our 11, uh, 11 Bayside schools. This $10.2 million commitment in the Bayside to education will improve our education outcomes for teachers and students and create job opportunities for local tradies. It ensures that we are inspiring creativity, creative think critical thinking and building resilience for every Bayside student. And I reckon that report card is an A+, plus, so thank you, Minister Grace. I love the Skilling Queenslanders for Work program because I know how successful this program is. And I am thrilled that this budget has announced $320 million to continue the Skilling Queenslanders for Work initiative. Babby, our fabulous youth and family services organisation, is one local provider that has delivered Get Set for Work in the Bayside. And these, pro this, these programs have seen over 300 young people assisted. And of course, let's not forget the wonderful free TAFE um, program, which has assisted 320 Bayside's, 64 of whom are now up in, getting in an apprenticeship. Deputy Speaker, lights, camera, action. Star spotting has become a favourite pastime in the Bayside. And following a bumpy year for Queensland film, television and games production, the Palaszczuk government is injecting a further $71 million as part of the state's economic recovery plan to continue growing Queensland booming screen industry. Our very own Screen Queensland Studios, or what we Bayside like to call them, Hollywood and Hemet, has been an amazing success, creating over a thousand jobs for actors, hairdressers, crew, caterers, makeup artists, tradies, extras and so much more. The Palaszczuk government is investing $2 million to the screen fi finance program to create screen projects and career pathways, a further $5 million investment to support growth of post-digital and visual effects industries by offering one of Australia's most attractive incentives to generate expenditure and jobs. 
This is attracting interstate and international productions to Hemet, creating jobs, stimulating our economy and upskilling our local industry. With productions like Young Rock and Joe Exotic, as well as Love and Monsters, which, might I add, is an Academy Award nominee for, VFX, uh, uh, for the VXX Award. So it's no wonder it's such a much sought after location. Deputy Speaker, the Palaszczuk government understands that your family and your family's health is important. And that's great news for Bay and it's this, the great news for, Bruce, for Lytton Bayside is, is that the budget makes a $22 billion commitment to Queensland health needs. And in fact, Casuarina Lodge, where our fabulous uh, facility at uh, Wenham West, is receiving over $600,000 for construction projects to improve facilities. Deputy Speaker, the past 18 months has shown us that Queensland frontline services keep us safe. The Palaszczuk government recognises this and since 2015 has increased Queensland number of nurses by 30 per cent and the number of doctors by 36 per cent because they are always looking to, we are always looking to enhance our frontline services. I understand and sympathise with how the last 18 months has been hard on my community because I get it and I'm always on their side. Deputy Speaker, the Speaker of the House has reviewed and approved the my budget speech for incorporation and as such I ask that the remainder of my speech be incorporated into the record of proceedings. Madam Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Toowoomba North. Madam Deputy Speaker, before I start, let me um, just pass my condolences to uh, Peggy's family and friends. We didn't agree on much and we would often uh, dispute each other's versions of how we should move forward, but uh, he cherished this place and uh, he should be remembered in it. So thank you, Peggy. Now I rise to make a contribution uh, to the budget debate, and uh, the first thing I'd like to talk about are a couple of a couple of big ticket items. These are statewide piece of infrastructure. Inland rail is uh, something that we need to hurry up and get on with because it will make a big difference in my region and the government should make sure it does all it can to enhance the speed that this gets delivered, particularly because the closure of Ackland coal mine is now going to drastically affect the current railway line that's 150 years old. Once the uh, Ackland mine shuts, the maintenance on that rail line is going to have to be borne by the current users, and I don't see any additional allocation in this budget for it, and I'm very concerned as to how that will leave the rail line. So have a look at that, please, Minister. Um, I would like to thank the uh, Minister, the Agricultural Minister, for the uh, spending on the DAF uh, in Tor Street. Um, I think it's a good facility, it's a, a good piece of funding to keep it up to date because it is getting a bit tired and I would encourage the Minister to move the whole DAF department there because Toowoomba would love to be the home uh, to DAF. Uh, I note in the budget there are um, some local um, uh, sporting facilities that have been upgraded for girls and women in particular. Um, and there is one in Toowoomba, not in my electorate, but I'd like to encourage it, uh, the Minister and the local club at Heritage Oval, the uh, South Toowoomba Bombers, Aussie Rules, and the Toowoomba Bears Rugby Union and the TCI Cricket uh, could all benefit from this program, and I would encourage them and the Minister to look at that facility. At Captain Cook, Garden City Raiders and Toowoomba Cricket uh, would also benefit at that facility at Rockville Park where diggers play cricket and we got some nets delivered for them a number of years ago uh, and the uh, Toowoomba Tigers Aussie rules play. The, the, the ladies game and the girls game is growing fast and these facilities were not built for those ladies so it would be good to see some upgrades there. Likewise with Commonwealth Oval um, for Rangers uh, baseball and Willowburn soccer and uh, at the Toowoomba Sports Ground where South West Queensland Thunder um, and the Southern Suburbs Rugby League uh, play, it would be good to see some more money invested in that facility, particularly coming up to uh, the Olympics. I also see there is some funding for social housing, which is going to fall, unfortunately, tens of thousands short of what is required. And whilst that leaves many people homeless, I would like to encourage uh, the people at Lifeline Darling Downs, Derek and Matt, who do a great job providing facilities there, um, for people who are homeless and in hard times and trying to find them housing in the um, both public and private sector. Likewise, at the base services with Nat and Tiff, um, the, uh, he will soon be having his annual sleep out and, uh, and I will go and sleep out with him to raise money. They provide great service for people who are homeless 
and unfortunately will not benefit from the very frugal amount that is being spent on housing in Toowoomba. Um, Emerge, Jen Shaw and Penny Hamilton do a fantastic job with young people in particular and uh, I would encourage the Minister um, to have a look at that facility and what they do and provide and, and how they operate. Likewise with Pro to Your Place, a facility that looks after women who have experienced domestic violence and are uh, in danger of becoming homeless and or homeless. They are all facilities that could benefit from an extra injection in uh, our local region for social housing. But now let me get on to a couple of topics that I am concerned about, and everybody here has heard me talk about the Toowoomba Hospital. Now, um, it's great news that we've got the day surgery. 40 odd million dollars, and that will take some pressure off day surgery. This in no way will help us falling off a cliff of, uh, of disaster around the services we have. I received an email just today from someone who works at the current hospital saying that the medical students don't know how to use the equipment they've got there because the equipment they're trained on is so much more modern they have to go through a familiarisation in the emergency. Our hospital is dated, it is old, our population is getting older, and it is now time to build this new hospital. It's going to be an expensive proposition, and I would encourage the Health Minister to look at a PPP for funding solutions, because we cannot wait. We cannot wait any more. Um, the second road to Highfields along connecting Boundary Street and, and Old Goombungee Road is a critical piece of road infrastructure that has again been completely overlooked and is very disappointing because the New England is choking and it's making it very difficult for all the people in North Toowoomba and Harlaxton to be able to go about their daily business because of all the traffic coming in from Highfields. It is, means that the people from Highfields are taking a lot longer to get home and a lot longer to get to work. They're all burning fuel. None of this is good for anybody. It is time to do a business case and secure the land for Boundary Street to connect up to the back of Highfields so that we can future-proof the growth in that suburb. And it will also allow all of the people from Highfields to be able to access the second range crossing much, much easier. I would like to thank the Minister for some education funding. Wilsonton State School is a great state school in my area and it's received funding. It was already announced at the election, but it's good to see it confirmed and it will get arts and trade uh, classrooms, which really helps complete that classroom. And I should also thank the Minister for Toowoomba State High, who got their facility last year for the arts. West Special School, I know at the election they were concerned that only half the funding they needed for their um, projects, classrooms and other there was in the election commitment, so it's good to see uh, some additional in this budget, and those are good things I'd like to thank the Minister. There is one little school that I would like her to look at, one that has a lot of Yazidis um, there and a lot of new Australians there. Um, its population has grown. It doesn't have an indoor hall. It doesn't have a space. North State School could really do with some TLC. It does a fantastic job in what is one of the toughest demographics and areas that I have in my electorate, and it certainly should um, receive some additional uh, uh, care and attention, particularly around its, um, uh, around its hall. Now, with all of that, and there's some things in there that are good, and there are some things in there that I'd like to see done. But let's just have a look at what we are talking about here today, because we've heard a lot of conversation about how a government asset of the titles office might be worth this, and how the budget is this, and how we're doing a great job and everything else. Well, I'd just like to say this is a binge, not a boom. Since the Palaszczuk government have been elected, our debt has increased by $22 million a day. The debt of Queensland has increased by $22 million a day. 365 days of the year, you don't get one off for Christmas, for every year that they've been here. So when people say we don't have enough social housing, how much could you build in one day of that debt increase? $22 million. 
when people are talking about road upgrades, how many road upgrades could you have done with $22 million just one day of the debt loading? How many could you have done across the state? My electorate would nearly be paved with gold, yet we have seen this debt rack up $52 billion, and what do we have to show for it? We have ambulance ramping. I have a hospital that is old and no longer a built environment that our hard-working doctors and nurses can provide the service in that they should. We have road networks that are overburdened and struggling to deal with the traffic. We have education facilities that, although there are some great upgrades coming, could always do with some more. So there are many things that we could have done with $22 million a day. But what do we see? We see now, now let, me just, let me just be clear. The $22 million a day doesn't include the little shell trick with the overvaluing of the titles office. Now, people will say to me, oh, well, you know, but it's been valued by these people, it's been valued by those people. What were the assumptions that those organisations were given to work out the valuation? Because I, I've only been in small business. I'm, I'm just a humble hospitality guy, run a few pubs, a few cafes, that kind of stuff. But I can tell you now, I would never invest that amount of money to get that amount of return because there are a whole lot of other businesses out there that would be much better. So I question the assumptions around the valuation. Because, well, you know, these are things. So, but, but let me, let me just Order go back to the debt. With. Let me just go back to the debt because it's important. And I've said, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help the people of my electorate and the people of Queensland understand what is going on. We've been binging not booming. We're binging. We're spending not just, not just the future generation's money, but plenty more. Imagine if we could, instead of spending an additional $22 million a day, $22 million a day, imagine if we could just get that to 10,000 surplus. Just a 10,000 surplus. We save $22 million plus 10,000. How long would it take for us to get back to the debt level that the Palaszczuk government inherited when we left office, it will take 14,000 years. They've been in government for six. They've been in government for six. And if we got to surplus, which is $22 million away, if we got to surplus, it would take 14,000 years at $10,000 a day surplus. That is the trouble that Queensland is in. That is why we need to be looking seriously at this budget and asking ourselves some questions. Where is the money going? Because I don't see the new hospitals, I don't see the new roads, I don't see all of the investment and the, the things that Queensland desperately want. $22 million a day. The Townsville Stadium could have been paid for in a week and a half. A week and a half, it's paid for. We, we, we could look at the, the uh, second M1. We can pay for it if we don't spend $22 million a day more than we earn. And that's the problem with a Labor government. We've been told this is a Labor budget. Well, it sure is. The average scorecard over the last six years is that they have spent $22 million dollars more every single day on delivering worse health, on delivering worse roads, on delivering worse outcomes around crime for everybody in Queensland. Now, you know, whether it be a helicopter for up north, whether it be a road in my electorate, whether it be a hospital, whether it be an ambulance, more paramedics, more teachers, more nurses, more doctors, what could we all do in our electorates with $22 million a day, every single day, 365 days of the year for the last six years? That's what we, we've got to ask ourselves what we could do, and the people of Queensland have got to ask themselves what we could have been doing with that money. And then they should ask themselves and look, what have we done? Now, 
If the people of Queensland think that the $22 million a day them and future generations have invested in this government's leadership of the state and its governance of our finances is good value for money, then good on them. But by the time the next election comes round, this equation is getting worse, not better. And that's without me going into the rating of the superannuation for public servants or the overvaluation. I'm counting those things as read by the Treasurer. And still, and still we spend $22 million a day. The kids at North State School just want a place to meet together. We're talking about not much money. That will, that will be an hour, an hour of the overspending of this government would build them their hall. One hour. If we could just not spend that much money for one hour, the kids have a hall for 25 years. But without good management, without good control, and when we've got a treasurer over there who's too busy, worried about his social media and whether he can trick everybody into how clever he is, you don't have to be clever, you've just got to spend less money than you earn. And unfortunately, this is a Labor budget, and it's a terrible one. Madam Speaker. I call the member for South Brisbane. I'd like to start with condolences to the family and friends of Duncan Pegg. Duncan and I shared this chamber only for a short time, but we attended many community events together over the years, and I saw how much Duncan loved his community and how much they loved him. Madam Speaker, I rise in response to the 21-22 Queensland budget and a document that says absolutely everything about this government's priorities. This budget was an opportunity for the government to think big and show courage and bold vision to drive Queensland's economic recovery from the COVID-19 crisis. But that's not what we've got. Instead, we've seen a budget that thinks small lumping everyday Queenslanders with cuts, instead of making big banks, property developers and mining corporations pay their fair share to provide the essential services that Queenslanders need. I, with my Greens colleague, the member for Maywa, wrote to the Treasurer ahead of the budget, urging him to prioritise investing in jobs, in housing, in schools, health and critical infrastructure. And we could do all of this by making the big end of town pay its fair share. The revenue measures that we took to the election are common sense, a bank levy of 0.05 per cent on the five biggest banks operating in Queensland, a developer tax on land value gains from upzoning applying to developers who are redeveloping the land, lifting the cap on infrastructure charges so that local councils can charge developers according to the cost of delivering infrastructure, and of course, ending the freeze on mining royalties and increasing them to ensure that mining corporations pay their fair share. The resources sector has been receiving red carpet treatment for years now. The mining royalties freeze that my predecessor enacted in 2019 is still in play, while mining billionaires pocket billions of dollars that should be going to everyday Queenslanders. During 2020, when the rest of the state was in lockdown in the name of public health, the resources sector was designated as an essential industry and work continued unabated. The sector is not doing it tough. It exported $45 billion worth of exports over the past year. Projections for coal exports are down, but only down to about 2015 levels, and there is no excuse for not raising royalties. The government will say it has to cut services or borrow more money rather than holding the big end of town to account and ending the free ride for their big corporate mates. And the result? This week we saw some of the most disgraceful and misleading claims from the Treasurer that we've seen in a long time in Queensland. We were thrilled on Tuesday to hear the government announce more funding for social housing. This is something that we and the sector have been pushing for for years. And in the midst of a housing crisis, 47,000 people waiting for social housing and a third of Queensland renters in housing stress and rising number of people in insecure housing or sleeping rough. This looked like a welcome announcement. But a closer examination of the budget revealed a different story. 
Capital expenditure for social housing by the Department of Housing has been cut by $20 million from last year. The $1 billion housing investment fund is also a farce. Of this $1 billion, Queenslanders will only see $160 million. And with that money, supposedly 3,600 homes can allegedly be built over Member four Fairbiton, years. Member Fairbiton, excuse your interjections. But only if the private sector gets enough incentives or enough handouts to make it happen. And at the end, it will be super funds and private companies walking away with profit off the backs of some of the most vulnerable Queenslanders. We know what works. Good quality public housing delivered by the government. Profit-driven development of social housing will end up delivering shoddy homes and hand profits to corporations. The story of a government misleading Queenslanders on public housing investment may not be new, but the proof will be in the pudding. With the housing crisis getting worse by the week, the test of the government's investment will be how many people are still Order. facing homelessness when we head to the next election. Every week, my office helps folks in housing stress. On the night of the budget, we helped someone find crisis accommodation when he had nowhere else to go. Last month, we negotiated to ensure a mother wouldn't be evicted into homelessness. When we support someone who has been on the social housing waiting list for too long, who has nowhere to sleep at night, or who is at the complete whim of their landlord about whether their home will remain their home, Queensland's housing crisis is not just a tagline or a political tool, it's a personal reality and we will keep fighting for these people. I will keep fighting for the renters of Queensland struggling with an unjust system massively stacked in favour of wealthy investors and the real estate industry. Tenants Queensland have said that the budget does very little to support the 1.8 million Queenslanders who rent their homes. The 1.8 Queenslanders who rent deserve security with rent caps and an end to rent bidding and a genuine end to no grounds evictions. For two years in a row, the government has capitulated to the real estate lobby rather than Queenslanders. And then it wonders why it's losing progressive seats to the Greens. This past year shows how vital our health system is. Can you imagine how it would look if mining corporations paid their fair share. If we raised revenue from the big end of town, we could create 21,000 more hospital beds, 1,000 more ICU beds, and raise Queensland to world best standard. We could employ at least 6,500 genuinely new nurses and 3,000 more doctors, expanding much needed emergency department capacity, and improve nurse and doctor to patient ratio. We could build hundreds of public health clinics with free, publicly funded and paid GPs and specialists to take the pressure off our hospital system. The budget includes $40.3 million for new hospital parking facilities, but no steps to ease the burden on Queenslanders with free hospital parking. Instead, the $1 billion savings dividend remains in place, forcing frontline staff to do more with less. The budget papers themselves tell a story of outpatient and emergency waiting times. Only 65 per cent of specialist outpatient waits with, within clinically recommended times. Only 70 per cent of emergency patients were transferred off a stretcher within 30 minutes. The COVID-19 crisis was the biggest disruption to our health system and our economy in modern times. And to power our recovery, this takes enormous investment in jobs and services. By increasing the number of frontline health workers, we can ensure our health system is resourced to do its job while ensuring our job market and economy continue to recover. I also note with sadness the closure of three regional Murray Stopes clinics this week, leaving just five abortion clinics remaining in all of Queensland. Despite finally decriminalising abortion in 2018, geography and finance remain barriers for many Queenslanders wishing to access reproductive health services. 
Before I was elected, Labor continually told the progressive voters in my electorate that the Greens shouldn't be running against a government that had delivered abortion law reform. But what's the point of making abortion legal if people and in regional and rural areas have nowhere to access the services or can't afford it? This budget saw no new money for abortion services and support. To truly deliver on abortion law reform, the government needs to embed essential reproductive health care in hospitals and health services and ensure genuinely accessible and free termination services in Queensland. Yeah, yeah. Like universal public health, fully funded state schools aren't out of reach either. Queensland has some of the most underfunded state schools in the country, and parents, teachers and children pay the cost. Over the past 10 years, state funding per public school student decreased by $128, while funding for private and Catholic schools has increased by $220 and $246 per student, respectively. In Queensland, we have no plan to reach 100 per cent schooling resources standard funding. We're at just 69 per cent of the 80 per cent we're meant to be putting into our state schools and in a wealthy state like Queensland. There is no reason why our state schools should go underfunded. Brisbane State High School, my alma mater in South Brisbane, one of the biggest high schools in the country, is ironically one of the most underfunded. While infrastructure funding for Brisbane South State Secondary College, Buranda State School, West End State School and Dutton Park State School are all exceptionally welcome. This does nothing to help parents with everyday cost of schooling. We can fully fund our public education system and bring the government's share of needs-based schooling resources standard to 80 per cent by investing an extra $1.5 billion a year, a fraction of what we could raise each year by raising coal, LNG and mineral royalties. Yeah. People with disabilities continue to face barriers in nearly all aspects of public life and should not have to fight for dignity. After a powerful campaign from disability organisations, the government committed to ongoing funding for advocacy services that I'm pleased to see reflected in the budget. I'm pleased to see $7.3 million to support people who are ineligible for the NDIS, and I'll be seeking details on where this money is going and who will be eligible. But Mr. Speak Madam Speaker, I would like to note my dismay that Narbathong State Special School has not received any funding in this budget. Narbathong provides specialist teaching for students with vision impairment. They cater to a cohort of 50 students and 80 preschool age students who have vision impairment and other disabilities. Many of these students have very high needs. The staff are exceptionally talented with their teaching model that is world renowned. But the school buildings were built in the 1960s and they're no longer fit to deliver the safety and dignity of those students. This budget has allocated no extra funding for this school and in a wealthy state like Queensland, there is no excuse for this. And I will continue to push for Narbathong to get the funding that they deserve. I also note East Brisbane State School, which will potentially be severely impacted by the redevelopment of the Gabba Stadium for the Olympics vanity project. And I'm disappointed that this school, students, family and community have also been overlooked. So too have other parts of my electorate, Madam Speaker. I wrote to the Treasurer ahead of the budget advocating for jobs, housing, schools and infrastructure to get the priority they deserve. For a start, we want to see funding for the Kangaroo Point Riverwalk expanded to meet its true cost. Given Brisbane City Council has failed to contribute funds, we want to see the state kick in more than $22.5 million it's committed, which is only a third of what this project would need. Further, we want to see an investment in active public transport, which sees the 192 bus service expanded. City gliders introduced east, west and north, south. These routes would fill some of the biggest gaps in the inner Brisbane transport network and would connect thousands of Kangaroo Point residents with the new Cross River Rail station at the Gabba. To keep ensuring our cycling infrastructure is safe, we want to see specific funding for protected bike lanes along Vulture Street. I also want to give credit to the work of a few organisations in my electorate who haven't received extra funding but will continue to work tirelessly. The MARTA Refugee Complex Care Clinic and in Integrated Refugee Health Service provides vital care for people from refugee backgrounds with a particular focus on those who can't access Medicare. 
Eating Disorders Queensland offers treatment for people living and recovering with eating disorders, their carers and loved ones. Of the $27 million allocated by the federal government for the treating of eating disorders, some of which will be distributed by the states, I call on the state government to ensure that Eating Disorders Queensland get an opportunity to administer funding via their programs. I'll also keep advocating for increased funding for community centres like West End Community House and organisations like Community Friends, who provide food relief for folks right across Brisbane. Why should Queenslanders be waiting for essential health care when there's been a royalty freeze for the mining sector? Why should our schools be underfunded and our housing wait lists blow out when our government refuses to raise revenue from the big end of town? The options for increasing the state's revenue are all there and they are no secret. Levies on developers and big banks, as well as options for more effective mining royalties, have all been well tested in the marketplace of ideas. The case is there and the numbers are clear. I can't stay silent while the government trumpets its progressive credentials while so many Queenslanders go unrepresented. This budget allows the big end of town to continue its free ride and its everyday Queenslanders who are left behind. Deputy Speaker. I call the uh, member for Capalaba. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. And can I start by acknowledging my good mate and friend Duncan Pegg, the member for Stretton. Um, this was Christmas week for Duncan, budget week. Um, it was no coincidence that uh, in his highlights video uh, that was shown on his uh, going away um, event with his community that uh, the best hits come from uh, this, uh, this debate. Um, he, was, uh, he knew the politics of government finances better than anyone else that I knew. Um, I miss his advice. I miss being able to uh, talk to him during this week and ask him questions uh, about many matters. Um, but it is fitting that this budget del still delivers for his community, particularly Stretton College, who is receiving $8 million uh, in this budget. And it was also fitting that Stretton College named their, uh, uh, their drama and artistic hall um, recently built uh, after Duncan Pegg. And I have no doubt that our mate James Martin uh, will pick up the baton of where Peggy left off and continue to deliver uh, for the good people of Stretton. Yeah. Deputy Speaker, Don delivers a record budget again for, Re for Redlands, seven times in a row, <laughs> seven times in a row. And it's fantastic that I can get up here to do it yet again. A record budget in health. 30, 32 new beds in ICU, um, major upgrades. The biggest single Water investment members. in Redlands Hospital uh, in, in the history of the Redlands Hospital. Uh, a brand new car park as well. It's been an issue down at uh, Redlands for a number of years. Cars parked up on the on the kerb, um, parking problems down here. But it's yet a Labor government that's going to do the fix uh, there in the, in the car park. And we did a fantastic job. We promised that we were going to deliver five levels. Uh, when a tender came out, we delivered an extra two levels. And I thank the health minister uh, for that. An extra 270 car parks for exactly the same price. It's fantastic. Satellite hospital as well for Redlands. No, though it's not in my electorate, um, it's going to take some. It's going to take a lot of pressure off Redlands Hospital, especially for the growth area down the bottom of, of Redlands there. And I congratulate the member for Redlands for her advocacy and her delivery in this regard. Don delivers a vaccine hub that has opened up today in Kapalabar. Don's going to vaccinate Kapalabar, and, it's, and I'll be down there on Tuesday to get my jab for the first time. In contrast in health, let's just have a look at the track record of the LNP when they were in government. Uh, closure of Wynnum Hospital, closure of the Moreton Bay Nursing Clinic. And I found it pretty outrageous today that the member for Ujiru would ask us to open up more aged care beds because we, he knows that the, the federal system's failing, and that's why he's asked us to do it. But when he was in government, he shut them down. He shut them down. He shut down hospitals, sacked nurses, complete contrast, put a heap of pressure on Redlands Hospital, did no upgrades in his time, but yet we're coming along. We're doing major upgrades, car parks, satellite, uh, a complete contrast to what they do in government. They have absolutely no track record when it comes to health. 
record investment in education. We've got a brand new hall for Capalabar State College. I've been lobbying for this for a number of years now, sitting down with the uh, PNC, with parents, with teachers, because that school hasn't been able to have a full assembly or awards night for a, for a while now because of the growth in that local area. Uh, but it's also important because the school has a, a, an excellence program in volleyball and basketball, and they will love the indoor facilities that it will provide. But it will also provide uh, valuable basketball and volleyball facilities for the whole community outside of school hours as well. And I thank the minister for that. $800,000 for Wellow High uh, as well. We've got $9 million for Redland Special School. We've got investment in uh, Alexandra Hills Primary School. We've got investment for outdoor learning uh, area for Birkdale South Primary School. Uh, after school care, Vienna Woods. We've got, um, we've got refurbishments happening at Hilliard School. Uh, there's only two schools left in my one or two schools left in my local area not to get air cons. We're still delivering uh, on our promise to air con every single classroom across the electorate. And I think I've got one or two schools left to do in our solar program. So again, record spends in education delivering uh, the vital services that my community deserves. While also talking about education, uh, we are yet again delivering for TAFE in my local area. I want to make sure from prep to their job that you can get the whole education in my local area of Kapalabar. And we're just about to open the $10 million upgrades of the plumbing workshops there and also the nursing training facilities, with the Premier coming out on Tuesday to open up, and I can't wait for that. But yet there's another million dollars in the budget for wet trades. I know it's pretty hard to get a tradie at the moment, and there's a particular shortage uh, in roofers and tilers. Uh, so it's important that we facilitate this. And it's best to get their trade training uh, at TAFE, and I can't look, and I can't, uh, or I can look. Uh, I am looking forward to those trades being traded there at Alexandra Hills. And again, compare that to the contrast of the LNP. They had plans to sell it off. They brought in Kadama, gutted the place. There was two teachers left there when I got there. The tool, they, they didn't have tools for the students. We turned the place around. We invested in it. We backed TAFE. And we back it every single day of the week because it's the right thing to do because we know that if you get a trade training, you're going to get a job as well. So we, we are backing our students, backing workers in our local area. Uh, infrastructure, $30 million for the Eastern Transit Way. We've got billions of dollars coming for the Cross River Rail. $5 million for the construction of the gateway uh, on-ramp that's just about to be completed. I know there's a lot of roadworks happening on Old Cleveland Road. I apologise to my residents, but it just shows you how much I'm delivering when it comes to Old Cleveland Road. Further delivery on $300,000 $300, to do the design work of the Birkdale train station car park. For some unknown reason, there's a fence around the concrete slab uh, of my old preschool that separates the two car parks there. Um, I, I know I have some sentimental um, uh, memories of going to that preschool, but I don't need to keep the concrete block, so we're going to do the design work. <laughs> the, the, the concrete slab, we're going we're to get rid of that. We're going to do the design work to make sure that we could join up the two car parks and get extra car parks. Looking forward to that uh, as well. Uh, and we're also delivering in regards to my local community, $300,000 for the Redlands Community Centre, uh, a fantastic centre that makes sure that people who are really doing it tough when it comes to food, when it comes to homelessness, uh, when it comes to financial advice, they're there to make sure that we've got the safety net in Kapalaba. $2 million for, uh, for uh, social housing construction in my local area. Very important um, that we ensure that we have, the, again, the social safety net to provide a house and a roof uh, over the residents on my local area. $7 million for a new fire station that will service uh, the rural blocks of the back of my electorate at Capalabar and Alexandra Hills. Again, the member for Springwood and the member for Redlands doing great work delivering for their local communities. And I do note, again, that the LNP didn't even want this fire station. They continued. The, the, LNP, the LNP president for Bowman still continues to say in the media this very week that he doesn't want it. So it is, it is crazy that they campaign against fire stations. Crazy. Order, members. I'm coming to you, the member for Ujuru. Through the chair, please, <laughs> member for Capalabar. You have the call. Thank you.
Deputy Speaker. And it's typical. I, I, I love hearing the contribution from the member for Ujuru because he comes in after the election and talks about all these things that he wants us to deliver for him. Everything, got, everything that's been delivered in his election has been delivered by a Labor government because the three years that he was in, in government, he did, didn't deliver a single thing. And Order, member. Your, your interjections aren't being taken. I call the member for Capella Bar. Yes, big swing it was. And then, again, lead up to the election, there's no promises. After the election, when, when we win government, oh, what comes in here, you've got to build this, you've got to build that, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. Uh, but yet, Order, it member. doesn't back it up when it comes time for when he is in government or in the lead up to the election. But let's just talk about the LNP uh, in Redlands and look at the federal budget. Now, Andrew Lamming's put out his uh, budget, uh, budget update for 2021. It used to be a four-pager. Now it's the. Uh, member, are you tabling that document? Uh, not yet. Not no. yet. Well, well. <laughs> I've got to pause the clock. The pause the clock. Two pages uh, of member, four pages. pause the clock. Member, we'll either table the document or we'll read from it. We can't do. We can't use it as a prop, as you know. I call okay. the member for Capella Bar. <laughs> so we um, budget highlights in here. Um, we have a look in it. Two pages only, and not a single item. Not a single item for Redland City. Absolutely zero. Obviously, he's been put on the cooler, and it's obviously he's on the cooler in Canberra because he is not getting a single thing in here. Now, what did the Liberal LNP mayor say about this uh, not getting a thing from Canberra? Absolutely nothing, because she doesn't want to. She doesn't want to get. A, she doesn't want to get in trouble by a potential new boss. It's absolutely silence. When we when we handed out down our budget this week. Record investment in Redlands. You know what she said? There isn't enough dot points. There isn't enough dot points. Completely, it just shows you how an, a former independent mayor has turned into a, a typical liberal and, and is not standing and is not standing up for her local area because she, uh, because she Order wants members. to stand up to Canberra, but she'll, she'll Order member for Redlands. Of dot points in our in our budget. But we are again, as I've stated. Um, delivering record investment in health, record investment in education, what we do best uh, over in this side of the house. So you've got a Liberal mayor and you've got a Liberal, Cam a, a, a Liberal in Canberra delivering absolute nothing. But she put out an absolute doozy of a campaign video yesterday, sent out to uh, the Liberal members in her area, uh, emailed out. I got the email about five minutes later because those, uh, there's complete infighting uh, between the LNP. They're leaking like sieves over to, over to me. Like, hey, get this into your brownie, check this out. Um, they're fighting. Um, you've got Peter Dutton not even backing the local candidates out there. He's not even backing Karen Williams. But let's, uh, let's have a look at the dot points in the transcript of uh, what Karen put out in her local video there. Her highlight over a 17-year career, nine of which was mayor, is I bought a block of land. And then she's got the gall to come in and attack my budget this year and, 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 and attack my budget this year because, because we are doing record investment in Redlands Hospital, record investment in education. But guess what? She bought it. She bought it. And I'll table that for the benefit of the House. So the, the, the excuse that the Mayor is giving for not doing uh, and not delivering anything over a nine year career of being the Mayor is because the Labor government. Well, what a member for a jury. Your admitted, interjections aren't being taken. She's been admitting that she can't deliver. In the video, it makes it plain and simple that she can't deliver for her local area. It's plain and simple that she won't stand up for camera. So I'm calling on the Mayor to resign now. Put all your focus into, put all your focus into becoming the LNP candidate because you've just stated in your video you're not willing to be able to work with the state government and you aren't delivering for your local area. It is there in black and white but in the transcript. But we are delivering. We're the only level of government delivering in the Redlands because it's a Labor government. That's the reason why we deliver in the, in, in the Redlands. I congratulate the Treasurer. I congratulate uh, the Premier on such a fantastic budget yet again for the people of Redlands. I commend, commend both the bills to the House. Before I call the next speaker, I just wanted to remind the members for Harvey Bay, Logan and Gympie that you are currently on a warning. I call the Premier. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And of course, um, I rise to speak in relation to these um, appropriation bills. And from the outset, can I uh, thank the Treasurer for handing down uh, this budget? Can I also thank um, the members of CBRC, the uh, Deputy Premier, um, Minister De Brenny, Minister Grace, 
Can I thank uh, the ministry for all their hard work? A lot of preparation goes into a budget. Uh, of course, the assistant ministers and, of course, every single member of our government uh, who strive every day to deliver for the people of this great state. And can I say yeah. the contributions yeah. from the government members in this debate have shown once again why Queenslanders have put their faith in our government to make sure that we, A, keep them safe, which is fundamentally important, and secondly, get on with our economic recovery plan. And of course, the Treasurer and everyone here today has been talking about the terrific news about the labour force figures, that record uh, low unemployment rate, 5.4 per cent, that shows yeah. our economic recovery plan is working yeah. in Queensland. Yeah. And as I said uh, time and time again, this is a traditional labour budget. It's focusing on health, it's focusing on education, yeah. it's focusing on housing. And, yeah. and I'm very proud of the investment in housing because I remember my grandfather always saying to me, there's nothing more important than having a roof over your head and food on the table and to have your family. And we know that there is housing stress out there. Um, it's happening right across uh, the state. And we've got to help those vulnerable Queenslanders that, through no fault of their own, are experiencing hardship and distress. So yeah. thank the Housing Minister. Great yeah. work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and delivering a housing strategy. Uh, of course, Mr Deputy Speaker, our health system is incredibly important. The record health budget delivering those satellite hospitals we're going to do over the next two years, making sure that we uh, grow the number of beds in this state. Over 1,000 beds are going to be delivered in the next four years, uh, right across Queensland. And what also, um, uh, what else I want to actually mention too is the fact that our education system is world class. Um, yeah. Led, of course, by Minister Grace Grace, we're giving young children the opportunity to achieve their dreams and, and where Queensland is a place that they can be whatever they want to do if they put their minds to it. Um, and, and to that extent, too, I'm actually really pleased that we've had a really large injection of money into Glenala State High School. Now, when I first became the member there, um, through uh, an earlier program of renewal, we had some injection of uh, money into that, into that high school. And uh, now through our government, we've had nearly $12 million into that high school. And once where uh, buses used to pass Glenala to take kids down the road to Corinda, they are now going to Glenala High School. They've had some fantastic principals. Um, in fact, uh, one is now a great member of this house. Um, very proud of the work that she did there as well, um, Corinne McMillan, member for Mansfield. But honestly, it is about giving kids the opportunity. And they've got a skills and training facility that's going to go there to link them with Ryan Mattel as well. Yeah. So making sure they've got a pathway to long-term <laughs> secure jobs. And of course, we know how important the environment is and the Great Barrier Reef. It was something that was raised with me uh, when the, uh, the tourism minister and I presented uh, about the Olympics that they asked us about sustainability and the Great Barrier Reef. We want to showcase the Great, Great Barrier Reef to the, to the world. And our funding for water quality enhancement is exactly uh, what is needed. And of course, we've always uh, aim is to protect the Great Barrier Reef. And to that extent, too, in my local electorate, the RSPCA is getting $500,000 for the Wakehole Koala Hospital, part of $6 million over four years. And what great work the RSPCA does, and I know the member for Mount Omni often visits there as well, so I want to thank her for the work that she does. Uh, but of course, this is a budget for Queenslanders, and look, honestly, no one ever thought we'd be going through um, a world health pandemic. No one could have foreseen the situation where Queenslanders are today, and that is because of the hard work every single Queenslander has done. And I'm absolutely uh, proud of. When I go to different events, when I go to cafes and restaurants, uh, when I'm out and about in the local community to see people basically essentially living their lives with relative freedom compared to what is happening in the rest of the world. And whilst, and whilst the media may not be reporting uh, those devastating impacts across the world as much as um, they could be, um, You've got to think about we are very lucky to live in Australia. Yeah. We are absolutely yeah. lucky to live in Australia. And uh, the work that all governments are doing in keeping Australians safe, not just Queenslanders, uh, has to be commended because um, I could never have foreseen, and I don't think even like Federal Treasury would have ever foreseen That's right. 
the economy bounce back so strongly um, with such resilience um, and Order, Member. I call the Premier. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And, um, Mr Speaker, uh, we will continue to support businesses. We will continue to invest in manufacturing. We will continue yeah. to make sure that young people are linked with skills and training. We will look to the future with renewables investment. They're the biggest in investment in renewables in this state that we've yeah. ever seen. In history. In history. And, uh, and then we'll look to the future for hydrogen to make to make Queensland a super powerhouse, and I'll end on this note too, is that we are on the cusp of something great. I was just reflecting, um, I was getting a briefing before about uh, the Olympics in Tokyo. This is the world's biggest event. There is nothing bigger than the Olympics. And never did I think, um, from sitting over there with seven members, that we would be on the cusp of an Olympic Games here in Brisbane, Queensland in 2032. Uh, this brings so much opportunity to our state, one that I could never have foreseen, but one we will, we will grab with both hands um, gladly because it's an investment in the future of this state and will set this state up for the decades and century ahead of us. I call the Treasurer. Deputy Speaker, I thank uh, all members of the House who have provided support for the appropriation bills uh, this year. I'd also like to once again thank the Treasury uh, officers who brought the budget together and who have been conscientiously listening to the debate, including into the early hours of this morning. As I said in my opening remarks, Deputy Speaker, this is a Labor budget which is focused on Labor's enduring mission, delivering better, higher-paying jobs for Queensland workers. Yeah. Deputy Speaker, and there was no better endorsement of our job-creating budget and our government's economic settings than the latest ABS labour force data, which were released during the member for Broadwater's speech yesterday. The data showed that Queensland's economic recovery plan is working and our budget continues that good work. More than 32,000 jobs were created last month, more than 1,000 jobs created each and every day. Queensland is now 84,900 jobs above its pre-COVID level in March last year. We've added more jobs than any other state or territory. Our labour market performance takes the Order, number for Southern jobs Downs. created under the Palaszczuk Labor government to 337,400. Speaker, that's 12 times more jobs created under Labor than under the Newman LNP government. Yeah. Queensland recorded the largest fall in unemployment in the nation last month, with the unemployment rate down to 5.4 per cent, which is below its pre-COVID level. Deputy Speaker, the last time the unemployment rate was at 5.4 per cent was in April 2012, the first month of the Newman government. After that, it was all downhill for the Queensland labour market in those dark three years, Deputy Speaker. What makes our current labour market performance even more remarkable is that unemployment has fallen while the participation rate has risen. The share of people in work or seeking work rose to 66.6 per cent in May, almost half a percentage point above the national average. The Queensland labour market is recovering and our government is driving the upswing. No. Deputy Speaker, I'd like to address some of the issues raised by members opposite during the debate. Deputy Speaker, we've seen these issues litigated throughout Budget Week, both inside and outside the House. And while my colleagues have ably, very ably addressed them in their speeches, I'll seek to summarise them with my remaining time. Speaker, this is an unashamed Labor budget. When the pandemic hit, our government made the deliberate decision to put the budget into deficit to protect jobs and livelihoods. Queenslanders have backed our economic response just as they backed our health response. And as a result, our economy is coming back stronger than the rest of Australia and our government's fiscal position is being restored. Revenues are returning, deficits are narrowing and debt as, is coming down. This is a Labor budget. Yeah. Deputy Speaker, unfortunately debt, debt is a four-letter word for the member for Broadwater, who mentioned it just once in his speech. And that's for one simple reason. It's because the LNP hate the fact that debt is lower under Labor. Speaker, it's down by $9.7 billion this year relative to last budget. As I said on Tuesday, the greatest single fall in net debt in Queensland history. Yeah. Deputy Speaker, the member for Broadwater barely mentions debt, not just because it's down under Labor, 
but because he knows he is completely compromised on debt. He'll go to Rockhampton and say, we need to borrow more. And he'll come into this House and say, we need to rein it in. When it comes to debt, the Leader of the Opposition will rack it up in the regions, but he won't back it up when he returns to this place, to this House. The LNP have exhausted their political capital on debt. They failed to seduce journalists into believing that Queensland debt was as high as $130 billion because the true figure reaches less than a third of that number. Let me say that again. The true figure reaches a less, less than a third of that number at $42.6 billion at the end of the forwards. The Queenslanders have worked them out. They know, Queenslanders know, the LNP are phonies. The LNP are stranded on the island of debt and the good ship Queensland has sailed away without them. Deputy Speaker, the LNP hate the fact that there are no new or increases, increased taxes in the budget, just as our government promised the people of Queensland at the last election. That's why the member for Broadwater and the shadow treasurer, the member for Toowoomba South, mentioned tax just once in their replies. Our government has ensured, Deputy Speaker, that it is almost $1,100 cheaper to live in Queensland than it is to live in New South Wales even before accounting for higher cost of living and housing prices in New South Wales. Speaker, taxes are lower under Labor. To that end, Deputy Speaker, I table the erroneous post from the LNP's Facebook page on the eve of the budget which reads, more taxes, more debt, more broken promises. As Deputy Speaker, like a postage stamp printed upside down, it is now a collector's item because of how wrong it is how completely wrong it is, and I table it for posterity. Yeah. Speaker, and can I offer, offer for the benefit of the House, a corrected version for the LNP's benefit? No more taxes, lower debt. Please table, the, table taxes. the document, please, Treasurer. I table that for the benefit of the House. Deputy Speaker, the LNP hate the fact that Labor is projecting a return to surplus after the largest global health crisis in a century. Before the New South Wales Government, before the Victorian Government and before the Morrison Federal LNP Government. And the LNP hate the fact that we're returning to service surplus the right way, and that's the Labor way, by growing the economy and by growing jobs. The member for Clayfield boasted in his contribution to the debate that, when he was Treasurer in the last LNP Government, he managed to turn the state's operating losses around in just one year. Well, what he didn't say was, how we did it. The LNP was only able to turn its record first year deficit into a second year surplus by sacking 14,000 workers, including 4,400 health workers. Savage cuts they were. Well, we're not quite sure because the Leader of the Opposition says he's happy to cut and cut and cut again just as long as it's not savage. And I can assure you, Deputy Speaker, from today until the 26th of October 2024, I will be reminding Queenslanders of the Leader of the Opposition's promises on savage cuts every single day. I will not forget, the government will not forget, and I can assure you we are going to remind Queenslanders so they never forget. Deputy Speaker, the, fundament, the LNP fundamentally hate this budget, not on any principle, I mean, how could they, but because this budget snatches away the lazy critiques that they've always readily reached for in budgets gone by. They've had to get very creative in talking about this budget because their cupboard of criticism is completely bare. Their two-bit bargain basement, baby John Burgess, has spun his wheel of misfortune and it's landed on lose a turn. <laughs> Speaker, the, the most I enjoyed writing that. Speaker, the most agree and saying it even more through the, through the Speaker, chair, please, the Treasurer, most, through the chair. Deputy Speaker, the most egregious and outrageous accusations levelled at this budget surrounded the valuations of the titles registry, a key component of our debt, reti debt retirement fund. As I noted in my budget speech. The $7.8 billion valuation recorded in the budget is the result of detailed due diligence undertaken by the Queensland Investment Corporation and Queensland Treasury. Can I say yet again, QIC obtained advice from four independent firms, the Bank of America, BIS Oxford Economics, Allens Linklaters and Deloitte. 
Now, Speaker, Deloitte, Deloitte, if you can believe it, Deloitte was cited approvingly in his budget contribution by none other than the Shadow Treasurer, the member for Toowoomba South. So for them, they can rely on Deloitte for what they want to say, Deputy uh, Speaker, but when the government relies on Deloitte to provide advice, of course, it's a trick. They're fraudsters. It's plain wrong. They're the words the Leader of the Opposition used. Well, I challenge him again to go out of this House in public and say the managing partner and all the partners of Deloitte in Queensland are fraudsters and tricksters and con artists and do not professionally discharge their responsibility in providing professional advice to the government. Order, members. They are Order. absolutely wrong. Deputy Speaker, and of course, EY and PwC verified the valuations. Moody's and SNP Global confirmed that they would view the transaction as providing an offset. Order, members. Debt. And fundamentally, that is what the Leader of the Opposition hates. He hates the fact Order that Member two of the biggest uh, ratings agencies in the firm have said we will use this transaction to offset Queensland debt. The member for Broadwater has been consistently flummoxed by the fact that Queensland was, in his words, selling the titles registry to itself. Speaker, it is almost as if he would sell it to someone else, like other people. It's, as, it's, a, it's almost as if the Leader of the Opposition would like to privatise Order, it. Member for Mermaid Beach. Speaker, now, I'm not going to verbal a member for Order, members. like he verbals everyone else. I hope that even he can see the follow, folly of selling off the silverware, as New South Wales and Victoria and South Australia have done, when our registry has been valued at two to three times the value of registries in other states. The member for Broadwater, remember that? He wants Queensland to be the best. Remember that? We heard that over and over. Well, this valuation puts that beyond doubt, Deputy Speaker. We've also heard the bold accusation from those opposite that the debt retirement fund doesn't represent legitimate debt reduction. Not enough sackings, they say, Deputy Speaker. <laughs> So, so let me spell it out for, for the LNP. The future fund is an offset to debt as, a set, as assessed by international rating agencies, rating agency giants, Moody's and S&P Global. At the same time as we kicked off the future fund, debt has fallen because our health and economic management has steered us to relative safety from COVID-19. Moody's has put the lie to the specious accounting claims of the LNP by saying, and I quote, as a result of the revenue recovery, no mention of the titles office, no mention of the titles office valuation. These are Moody's words. As a result of the revenue recovery, Queensland's general government borrowing requirement will be lower than had previously been expected over the forward estimates to June 2024. The Future Fund is not some exercise in cooking the books, as the LNP said, as those opposite are dangerously and, can I add, dishonestly alleging. It's not some accounting magic. Campbell Newman and the leader of the opposition's hocus-pocus. Now you see 14,000 public servants. Now you don't. Speaker, no public servants got anything to worry about from the government I lead. Remember that? Remember Campbell Newman saying that to the people of Queensland, Deputy Speaker, and all along. There was his apprentice standing next to him, the member for Broadwater, who was then the member for Munningborough, nodding his head, agreeing with every single thing his mentor did. It is a legitimate exercise, Deputy Speaker, backed in by independent bodies, keeping public assets in public hands and making public dollars work harder for Queenslanders. Yeah. Deputy Speaker, the LNP have also taken issue with the budget's presentation of the sub-funds within the Queensland Future Fund. Now, we're deep in the weeds now, Deputy Speaker. The people of Queensland are absolutely riveted with this one. Unfortunately, it's not our problem that the LNP simply don't understand the budget. The ratings, understa ratings agencies understand it. The investment banks and accounting firms understand it. The investment committee at QIC understand it. Stakeholders like QCOS understand it. St Vincent de Paul, they understand it. It's using the <laughs> dividends available to solve a critical social and economic problem on an ongoing basis. And I tell you, who else understands it? The people of Queensland. Yeah. Queenslanders want us to keep the dividends from our assets and reinvest in Queensland, Deputy Speaker. They know what the LNP would do to our assets. 
the LNP would sell our assets again and again and again. Deputy Speaker, let me make this point. The LNP... The LNP Order, members. Order, member for Toowoomba North. I the call LNP the Treasurer. The LNP is pretending they don't understand... The LNP is pretending they, they don't understand it because what they want to do with assets is they want to sell assets. Everyone in Queensland knows how debt offset works. Everyone in Queensland understands the critical need to invest in housing, in carbon reduction, in the path to treaty, in an ongoing, sustainable way, and that's exactly what these funds provide. Order, members. Deputy Speaker, members opposite have also taken issue with our government's $2 billion hospital building fund. Can I confirm for Queenslanders that this is real money being earmarked for real projects? This fund is a larger amount than the Queensland's uh, health's usual operating program, which is typically capital program, which is typically just $1 billion per year, but it is around $1.3 billion, billion for capital in 2021-22. Now, initial investments from the $2 billion fund in ways and hopefully in a way that even members of the opposite can understand include $42 million over the forward estimates for the Toowoomba Day Surgery. There was the member for Toowoomba North blowing hard. There's nothing for Toowoomba except a $42 million Toowoomba Day Surgery. Order, member for Toowoomba North. Order. Marta Public Hospital, Springfield. Welcome by the member for Order. all of the of Labor members, the Labor members who represent the Western and West Morton Corridor, $120 million over the next two years for an uplift. Order, member for Broadwater. Order, members. Mike. Thank you, Speaker. They're seeking to confuse Queenslanders by talking about four years of spending from last year's budget and comparing it with four years of spending from this year's budget, Deputy Speaker. Our bumper $56 billion investment is for the four-year period beginning this financial year. Now, Deputy Speaker, we're talking about a different four-year period commencing next financial year, and for the benefit of those members opposite, that starts in 12 days' time. The new program reflects a different spending profile, notably the completion of Cross River Rail. And next year the program will be a different number again, depending on the mix of projects. What doesn't change is the commitment of our Labor government to delivering a $50 billion infrastructure guarantee to Queenslanders. Our economic recovery plan had a $51.8 billion capital program for the four years commencing 2020-21. And that was what we were elected on. The pledge was increased to $56 billion after the election when we handed down last year's budget. Shamefully, the LNP reduced infrastructure spending in every single one of their budgets when they were in government. They made a virtue of it in the 2012 budget, where in the LNP's budget paper three it read, the capital program will be smaller than in previous years, Order, members. the determination of the government to restore the state's financial position. Speaker, on infrastructure projects, the LNP thought they were onto something with the reporting of Cross River Rail in this year's budget. Sadly, all they succeeded in proving was that they didn't just fail to read this year's budget, they failed to read last year's budget and the budget the year before. Deputy Speaker, the $6.888 billion figure has been clearly reported in budgets since 2019. It consists of the state's capital contribution of $5.4 billion and a $1.5 billion financial contribution from the private sector. It explained as early... Order, members. Your interjections aren't being taken. Five. Speaking, you only had to get to page five of Budget Paper 2, which commits... A lot of numbers. A lot of words. Take the interjection. Which commits the government to... Let me read it for the public record and for the record of this House. $1.517 billion in 2021-22 towards a total of $6.888 billion for the continued delivery of Cross River Rail, including a capital contribution of $5.389 billion, along with financing of $1.499 billion secured through the public-private partnership. The $6.888 billion overall figure was published in the 2019-20 budget, 
in Budget Paper 3, page 104, and again in the 2020-2021 budget. Of course, the LNP cut Cross River Rail not once, they cut it twice, along with their $1.6 billion in cuts to the roads and transport budget while sending train building jobs overseas. Order. Deputy Speaker. Pause the clock, please. Uh, Treasurer, resume your seat. Now, Member for Kiwana, you've been repeating interjecting, uh, interjecting repeatedly, uh, most of it of no relevance to the uh, debate. I'm warning you under standing orders. I call the Treasurer. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Cross River Rail will transform how we will travel from and through Brisbane in the future, and it is critical to Queensland's bid for the 2032 Olympics. It is creating more than 7,700 jobs as we speak and is pumping more than $4 million a day into our economy. Deputy Speaker, as I noted this morning, the government remains committed that there should be no impact on households as a result of the waste levy. We have an arrangement with councils to continue with the 105 per cent rebate through the current financial year. This is delivered in the budget with an allocation of $160 million. As the opposition and the Lord Mayor know, the legislation requires a review of the levy by June 2022. That's what it says in the law of the land. That's what it says on the statute books of Queensland. Deputy Speaker, we will work with councils through that review and we will negotiate the arrangement that will apply after that period. This is a sensible and it is a fair approach. But look, if they don't want the money, we can provide it directly to households. Deputy Speaker, there was a paucity of policy ideas in the LNP's reply. One that caught my eye was the proposal for a parliamentary budget office. And fair enough that the LNP should suggest it, because when it comes to costings, the LNP need all the help they can get. Speaker, we all remember. Oh, it's just funny. He was here. We all remember the train wreck costings press conference from the member for Everton last year, where the thirteen, members. The 13 billion dollar Highway members. hoax was revealed as a mere fifty million dollar scoping study. Only twelve billion two hundred and uh, two hundred and fifty million short. No, nine hundred and fifty million short. Speaker, only that much. Missed it by that much. <laughs> That's shrinkage. Twelve million nine hundred and fifty million dollars short. And what about the big bowl plan for Queensland? <laughs> Queenslanders were subjected to that hoax from the LNP for a year. They talked about it and they talked about it on and on. It was going to change the world. Fifteen dollar. $15 billion fake Bradfield scheme, Deputy Speaker, evaporated into a $20 million plan. Only one thousandth of the dollars proposed. It's so small, one, one thousandth of the dollars proposed. A drop, a drop, Premier, in the proverbial inland sea. When it comes to lecturing the government, and this is all about transparency, they put this idea of a parliamentary budget office because it was all about transparency. Deputy Speaker, I've been mean being lectured to by the LNP on transparency because when it comes to being lectured to by the LNP on transparency, they are absolutely shameless. Their shameless, shamelessness knows no limits. This is the LNP that dismissed the entire PCCC and changed the way the chair was appointed to avoid scrutiny. The LNP who sacked the head of the ethics committee that they themselves appointed. The LNP when the member for Kawana was the Attorney General who appointed the Chief Justice as a Chief Magistrate as Chief Justice against all convention and advice, and the Attorney General and a government that broke the confidence of the Supreme Court leaking out private conversations. They are the LNP Speaker are total phonies on transparency. Another proposal that caught my attention was the Social Enterprise Startup Fund. And I spoke briefly about that earlier today. Now, I'm a bigger supporter of the social enterprise sector, as you'll find, Deputy Speaker, which is why in the budget I handed down, our government announced and started delivering a social enterprise jobs fund last year. It led me think for a moment, brief moment, to be, to be fair, but it led me, um, took me to a brief moment, Deputy Speaker, when I thought I was being too harsh on the opposition. Maybe they do know how to read the budget papers. Maybe they're still making their way through last year's budget papers, Speaker. A truly dismal performance by a party that's not just a step behind Queenslanders, but a whole financial year behind. 
Deputy Speaker, they are not fit to read and they are not fit to lead. <laughs> Deputy Speaker, I'd like to reflect for a few moments on the contribution from the member for Maywa, who was very critical of our government-owned corporations spending money maintaining our power stations. Deputy Speaker, this government has a commitment to generating 50 per cent of our electricity from renewable sources by 2030, and we are leading the country with that policy position. Yeah. Deputy Speaker, our power station is something a, the Greens will never, ever be able to deliver because progressive transformative policy is only ever led and driven by the Australian Labor Party. Yeah. Deputy Speaker, our power stations are going to be required to operate through to this time and beyond. They are large pieces of industrial machinery. Power turbines spin at 3,000 revolutions per minute for the benefit of the member for Maywa. This kind of energy in such a large, heavy piece of machinery needs to be well maintained for the safety of workers and the stability of the electricity grid in Queensland. We make no apologies, Deputy Speaker, for maintaining high safety standards across government-owned power stations to protect the workers who contribute so much to our state. And I know the member, Minister for Energy acknowledges that. The member for Maywa suggested that the $2 billion renewable energy fund was inadequate or not spent soon, soon enough. It's important for both, our GOCs, uh, for both our GOCs, Deputy Speaker, and the broader energy industry that they have visibility of our long-term strategy. Having a pipeline of funds available allows our GOCs to plan their investments accordingly. Stakeholder groups, including from the environment sector, have asked the government to do more planning on the pipeline of work necessary to reach our target. And this pipeline of money should go a long way towards demonstrating our commitment to a renewable energy pipeline and a renewable energy future for Queensland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Deputy Speaker, if the member for Maywa is truly concerned in reducing emissions, he should stop playing politics on these important energy issues and start working with the government to achieve practical solutions for the state's energy. Order, member for Southern Downs. Order, Deputy, Deputy Speaker, Premier. Can I conclude by saying this? This is a budget for all Queenslanders. House will come to order. Can I say, Deputy Speaker, this is a budget for all Queenslanders. It will benefit Queenslanders for generations to come. And I am so pleased to say, for the benefit of those members opposite, but more particularly for my colleagues and friends in the government, this is a typical Labor budget. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I commend the appropriation bills to the House. Yeah. The question is that the appropriation parliament bill and the appropriation bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Appropriation parliament bill. Appropriation bill. In accordance with standing order 1772, the appropriation parliament bill and the appropriation bill stand referred to the portfolio committees. I call the leader of the house. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I seek to advise the House of the determinations made by the Committee of the Legislative Assembly at its meeting today. The Committee has resolved, pursuant to Standing Order 136, that the Economics and Governance Committee report on the Public Health and Other Legislation further extension of expiring provisions amendment bill by 6 August 2021. The Committee Support and Services Committee report on the Housing Legislation Amendment Bill by 6 August 2021 and the Transport and Resources Committee report on the Resources and Other Legislation Bill by 6 August 2021. Deputy Speaker, I seek leave to move a motion without notice. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Deputy Speaker, I move that notwithstanding anything contained in the standing and sessional orders for this day's sitting, the House will not break for dinner at 6.30pm, but will continue to sit to conduct government business until the adjournment is moved. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of opinion say aye. aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. I call the Leader of the House. Deputy Speaker, I seek leave to move the motion without notice. Is leave granted? Is leave, leave's granted. Deputy Speaker, I move that the standing rules and orders of the Legislative Assembly be amended by replacing Schedule 7 with that circulated in my name effective immediately. The question is, is the mo I call the member for Kawana. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Schedule 7, of course, is the Chief Executive Officers that uh, estimates can uh, asked to be witnesses in the estimates process in the committee meetings. And I note there's two noticeable absences from this year's estimate schedule, seven, and that of course is the Productivity Commission and Building Queensland. So the very bodies that the Labor Party established to get productivity working in the state are no longer on our estimate schedule. Oh, I take the interjection from the Treasurer here, here, considering, considering it was a Labor Treasurer that introduced the Productivity Commission, but because he, because he cannot 
because he has because he has the ego that he can order members any Labor treasurer having any order treasurer he cannot stand any former Labor treasurer having any record on these sorts of things in this space, he's got to abolish it. So he abolished the Productivity Commission, and of course now we don't have the Productivity Commission. So the very body that should be giving this Treasurer advice, Productivity Commission advice, we know this fellow has, we know this Treasurer likes to hide things, likes to keep his departments out of his offices, puts his electronic locks on his office doors, keeps Keeps locks the doors from his department, Mr. Speaker. Order members. Tries to hide the spur debt when he was the Attorney General. We know he doesn't like accountability and transparency. And all these interjections now, all these interjections now. Order Treasurer. Charles play interjections over there. All these interjections now. Just show. Order Treasurer. Just show. Treasurer. You are Order the worst Treasurer. Treasurer in Australia with the biggest glass jaw. Right now, the House will come to order. I call the member for Kiwana. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The worst treasurer in Australia with the biggest glass jaw. He cannot stand, he cannot stand to be in this place that the member for Mulgrave introduced the Productivity Commission and he abolished it and now it's been just sneakily taken off the Schedule 7 amendments. And of course, who could forget Jackie Trad's building Queensland? It was going to get Queensland moving with all this construction, all this construction. But of course, he can't stand it. So it's abolished now, abolished a few weeks ago, and his non debt and no savings, negligible savings bill that he introduced and passed in the parliament. So, Mr. Speaker, I go off subject, but I just make the point that the two bodies that were on last year is only, I might add, December last year, we're only talking six months. Six months ago, apologies. Six months ago, the Productivity Commission, which is giving independent advice to Treasury, and this Treasurer, God knows he needs it, but he want, he doesn't, he cannot stand. I take the interjection from the Shadow Treasurer. He doesn't want to hear it. He can't stand it because he doesn't like being told when he's wrong. And he doesn't like the record of other tre Labor treasurers in the state, so he abolishes the Productivity Commission, abolishes Building Queensland. So I just make the point, Deputy Speaker, they're not on the schedule because this treasurer, the worst treasurer in Australia, the most egotistical treasurer, yeah. doesn't like accountability and transparency, and that's why they're not on Schedule 7. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those that have opinions say aye. aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. I call the Leader of the House. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I seek leave to move a motion without notice. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Deputy Speaker, I move the Financial Procedures 2021 motion circulated in my name. And in doing so, uh, Deputy Speaker, the Palaszczuk Government understands the importance of the parliamentary estimates period. And uh, like all of my colleagues, uh, cabinet colleagues are looking forward to attending our respective estimate hearing days to talk about how the Palaszczuk Labor government's budget is delivering for all Queenslanders. As members will see, the motion sets out the days and timings for each of the estimates hearings. The times within the hearings are similar to what occurred in December, with only some minor changes. As all members will be aware, the Palaszczuk government is fully behind the Olympics bid for Queensland in 2032. And I note that the bid has received a bipartisan approach, not only across the political divide, but across all three levels of government. And I'm excited, like I know many in this chamber are, for the very real potential of Queensland and Brisbane host hosting the Olympic Games. As has been publicly canvassed, the Premier or the Minister for Sport will attend the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games to continue to do everything we can as a government to secure such an important world event right here in our very own backyard. As a result of this potential travel, the Economics and Governance Committee estimates will move from the slated Tuesday the 27th of July 2021 to Friday the 16th of July 2021 to ensure that there is no delay in the opportunity of those op opposite to put thought-provoking questions to the Premier, Treasurer and Minister Hinchliffe the government has decided to bring forward the Economics and Governance Committee hearings to ensure that members are able to ask questions of the budget 
and how it is benefiting Queenslanders sooner rather than later. The alternate was for it to be delayed, and we would not want that. I also put on the record that we have consulted with the Speaker about the date change, as the Speaker's estimates is part of that hearing, and I thank him for his feedback. The remaining estimates hearings will take place as planned. This is a sensible approach. Members will also note that this motion enables the Leader of the House, after consultation with the Speaker, to change the days of estimates when the hearing is not sitting, if required. This is similar to Sessional Order 1B regarding amending the date and time of Parliament when the House is not sitting. I want to stress, Deputy Speaker, this provision is purely to ensure that the Parliament has a method to change the dates and times if for some reason it cannot sit due to COVID-19 or a health-related matter. This is the sole purpose of this provision. It is a contingency plan to ensure that if for some reason something happens that would prevent the hearing from occurring, then appropriate arrangements can occur to change the date to ensure that members are able to ask the executive questions about the Palaszczuk Labor government's budget, which delivers for all Queenslanders. I commend the motion to the House. Mr Speaker. Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Kiwana. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm disappointed because I wasn't consulted on the substantial changes to the estimates dates. I wasn't consulted. Uh, the Leader of the House says she consulted the Speaker, but I wasn't consulted on the new little provision that they're inserting in there with respect to the Leader of the House basically can, at, without notice, consult the Speaker, then just change an estimates day. Wake up in the morning, wake up in the morning and the Minister for Housing, for instance, might have a bad front page Courier Mail headline. The Leader of the House can just Stop estimates on the day. Never have I seen this before. And if it was COVID related, if it was COVID related, then the Leader of the House would have consulted me like she has on every other COVID related issue that this Parliament's dealt with, or, or raise it at the CLA meeting we had today, which of course, Mr Deputy Speaker, this is the first that I've heard about it. But look, the reality is, this is the Tokyo Amendment to Tokyo estimates. Amendment. This is the Tokyo Amendment. We we called out the Premier weeks the ago Tokyo with respect to we called out the Premier weeks ago with respect to uh, the Tokyo Olympics, the Japanese Olympics in Tokyo, and how would the Premier attend estimates? Bearing in mind that the dates of estimates on the parliamentary calendar thus far is the 27th, 28th, 29th, 30th of July, the 3rd, 4th, 5th of August. It wasn't like the government didn't know when the Olympics were going to be held this year. We've known we've been sitting in the parliament all year. We've had no, no restrictions in place to our sitting uh, in the parliament, Mr Deputy Speaker. We've not missed a day sitting. We haven't done much work here, I might add. The government's agenda is pretty slack. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, we've known about it. And, of course, this has all come about because the Premier has now decided she wants to go to Tokyo. Uh, and I suspect, Mr Deputy Speaker, it's because they... The government just cannot work, with, work out whether they can trust to send the member for Sandgate by himself to Tokyo. So the Premier's got to go and hold the Minister's hand, the Minister for Sport's hand, and they're really they're hedging, they're hedging the bets, Mr Deputy Speaker, with respect to members, whether relevance. it's the Premier or whether it's the member for whether Sandgate, not, whether he's going. Sandgate and the Leader of the House just explained that it may be the Premier, it may be the Minister for Sport, it may be, it may be both. And the whole reason, Mr Deputy Speaker, you're going to ask me to get to the point, and I will. I Mr. am. Mr Deputy Speaker, the, the whole point of... Mr Deputy Speaker, the whole point of this schedule is bringing forward by two weeks to the 16th of July. And as just pointed out by the Leader of the House, the reason... They're bringing forward the Premier, the Treasurer and the Minister for Tourism, Innovation and Minister for Sport two weeks before the rest of the estimates process is because of the Tokyo Olympics. That was the reason that the, health, uh, that the uh, Leader of the House just gave. Mr Deputy Speaker, you're going to have now a period of about two weeks before a week and a half. I'll go your uh, half. Members, a members half. comments will come through the chair and stop the calling across the uh, Mr. chamber. Deputy Speaker, you're going to have now this period of a week and a half before the, between the 16th of July and then nothingness until... Well, this is the complaint. This is the complaint. The complaint is this. Through the chair, please leave it to the house. It'll be less time now for questions on notice to be issued. It'll be less time for questions on notice to be issued and answered. Remember estimates last year? The election, the budget was handed down and we went straight into estimates without questions on notice being answered, Mr Deputy Speaker. So we're going to have a process now. The budget gets passed tonight and then within a short period of time we'll beat the first estimates. 
that's the first thing. But more concerning, Mr Deputy Speaker, is the fact that the Leader of the House can, without, consultant, uh, without consulting the opposition or without consulting the crossbench, can just change the sitting days for each hearing. So they could effectively just say there's been a, a case detected in Bondi Beach. Uh, we're worried about that. We're going to stop the estimates process in Queensland. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, if you give the Labor Party the power, they will use it. They will take advantage of it and they will use it, Mr Deputy Speaker, as we've seen in the past. Now, the other thing the portfolio committees used to be able to do is if the portfolio committee decided that they have a witness they want more testimony out of, then the Portfolio Committee can decide to keep going in the estimates process. They can keep the time. They can extend the time. If the witnesses agree, the witnesses are there, the Portfolio Committees can extend the time. This prevents that from happening because it says the Portfolio Committees are only to hold hearings and take evidence within the time frames provided in Table 1, circulated in the Leader House 8. So no ability for the committees to determine their own destiny with respect to the estimates. So we are going to see a farce of a situation, as we've seen under this Labor government, the estimates process has become such a farce in Queensland. There is no accountability, there's no transparency, there's no integrity. But remember, Premier Palaszczuk said when she got elected, I'm going to be lead differently, I'm going to be open and transparent. And the first thing they do is curtail the speakers. Uh, detail the estimates, timelines and so forth, Deputy Speaker. So I've got real concerns that the portfolio committees will no longer be able to determine that if they want to sit another hour or, for whatever reason, uh, they won't be able to do it. Uh, it also says that they are enshrining into this motion that the portfolio committees are only allowed to raise the matters specified in Table 1. Now, the portfolio committees have had the ability, while they've had the directors general's, uh, directors general sitting there, if they wanted to go from this issue to this issue, the Crime and Corruption Commission, whatever, these guys and girls are being paid a lot of money, they sit there, the portfolio committees could decide which witnesses to take. Now, this says that's not an out, that, that will no longer happen, and it is purely that this half hour, this 45, 45 minutes is for this chief executive officer. No ability for the committees to change it. So, Deputy Speaker, we know where this has come about. So, I'm not going to support this motion because of the fact one, we weren't, opposition wasn't consulted. And if the Leader of the House wants to talk about Tokyo being bipartisan, then if this was a Tokyo, as I said, it's a Tokyo amendment, then I would have thought the, uh, the government would have at least had the courtesy to let me know before moving this motion, the timelines of the committee, the new powers of the Leader of the House just to decide at her whim after consultation. I note, Mr Deputy Speaker, it doesn't say the Speaker has to agree to it. It just says after the Leader of the House consults with the Speaker. So the Leader of the House can just go to the Speaker and say, I'm moving this estimate, I'm pushing it back by two weeks, and despite where the Speaker may agree or not agree, the Leader of the House can still determine it. So, Deputy Speaker, the reason we know that this has all come about, as I said, it's the Tokyo. The, 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 Premier, the Premier got in trouble a few weeks ago because uh, she said she had to get the AZ to go, uh, she had to get Pfizer to go. No, I take the interjection, not the AZ. She had to get the Pfizer. Deputy Speaker, point of she order. She had to get the Pfizer, not the AZ. Or, to to or resume your seat. Resume your seat. I'll take the point of order from the Leader of the House. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Point of order relevance. The member should be brought back to the motion before the House. The point of order stands. Uh, I'll bring you back to the. Uh, the uh, the motion. I call the member for Kiwana. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. So we're not going to support this motion, one, because we weren't consulted. Secondly, uh, they're breaking up the estimates process. They're breaking up the estimates process just... Well, here's what I'm not going to get on board Order, with. Order, members. Your comments will come board. through the chair. I'm not going to get on board with trashing this democratic institution. This is Queensland yeah, Parliament yeah, House. Yeah, Order, is, members. Yeah, I take the interjection. We're so close. We're so close. I call the member for Kiwana. Deputy Speaker, the Attorney-General interjects, just get on with it. That's what they do in this place. 
The Attorney General. Just Order, Attorney this General. Is, this is where we've come Order, to Member for Waterford. Now. This Parliament is just a Labor Party political plaything. Mr Deputy Speaker, you know what the question a lot of Queenslanders are asking and why they will say good on you for opposing this? This is what the Queenslanders will be saying, Deputy well, Speaker. They'll be, they'll be saying, they'll be well, why is it OK for the Premier of the State of Queensland to fly internationally when we're stuck at home and still in restrictions? Why is it OK? Why is, why is my local business night quarter Order, members. having live Order. music entertainment and yet the Premier can jet Order, set Minister. We know this Premier... The best advice you can give this Premier or to Queensland is never get in the way of Anastasia Palaszczuk in a 747, Mr Deputy Speaker. The most jet-setting. We know that she's just uh, been waiting yeah, again, Mr Deputy Speaker. Clock. I will bring you back to the, uh, the motion before us, uh, Member for Kwana. If you don't have anything to further to add, you can cease your contribution. Uh, oh, plenty. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. If someone moves an extension of time, we'll go uh, all night, Deputy Speaker, because I don't think there's enough time for the estimates committees in what has been scheduled here. If the estimates committees had the ability to amend their own time, decide their own destiny, their own, you know, we're going to sit another hour, let it be. But this is so stymied and so structural and so procedural, Mr Deputy Speaker, why on earth, it, like we've seen the estimates process now in Queensland just become a bit of a farce, it's just a political plaything, and Mr Deputy Speaker, this just extends that. It's just the government saying, we don't want to hear, we don't want the questions from the opposition, we don't want the questions from the crossbench. We just want to get... Basically, it's just, let's get it done. We just don't want to be here. We know they don't want to be at Parliament. Mr Deputy Speaker, we've seen the chairs run interference. This will only enshrine that interference and protection racket even further, Deputy Speaker. That's why we strongly oppose... The timelines set out. We oppose the protection racket that we've seen over the last three years, particularly with this government and the protection racket that the estimates has become. That's why we oppose this motion. We oppose the motion on the fact that the Premier just gets to amend her estimates day to be done with everyone else so she can jet set off to Tokyo, Mr Deputy Speaker. Have a bit of accountability. When is accountability coming back in Queensland? Only under an LNP government. Yeah. Mr Speaker. Deputy Speaker. Call the Leader of the House. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I, I just have to at least have one contribution in response to that just fascinating uh, debate that we've just heard from the Manager of Opposition Business. Uh, can I say, Manager of Opposition Business, I think the people of Queensland, and certainly this side of the House, trust our Sports Minister over your former Sports Minister, Steve Dixon, any day. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Order, Members. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those out of opinion say aye. aye. Those against no. no. I think the ayes have it. Aye. The division has been called. Ring the bells.
The question is that the motion be agreed to, for which a division has been called. Members are reminded that the total number of votes cast for each party include those present under sessional orders and any proxy votes, but must not include paired members or members asked to withdraw from the chamber and excluded from voting under standing orders. Will the government whip advise what the government votes are for the ayes or noes? 50 ayes, Mr Speaker. Will the opposition whip advise what the opposition votes are for the ayes or noes? 33 noes, Mr Speaker. Will the uh, delegate from the Queensland Greens advise what your votes are for the ayes or noes? Two noes, Speaker. Uh, the result of the division is ayes 50, noes 35. The question is resolved in the affirmative. I call the Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, I move that the House do now adjourn. The question is that the House do now adjourn. Those that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the eyes have it.